Introduction of Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Dedication. To my father, James J. Mapes, this book is dedicated in gratitude and love. Preface This little work aims to combine the instructive features of a book of travels with the interest of a domestic tale. Throughout its pages the descriptions of Dutch localities, customs, and general characteristics have been given with scrupulous care. Many of its incidents are drawn from life and the story of Raff Brinker is founded strictly upon fact. While acknowledging my obligations to many well-known writers on Dutch history, literature, and art, I turn with especial gratitude to those kind Holland friends who, with generous zeal, have taken many a backward glance at their country for my sake, seeing it as it looked twenty years ago, when the Brinker home stood unnoticed in sunlight and shadow. Should this simple narrative serve to give my young readers a just idea of Holland and its resources, or present true pictures of its inhabitants and their everyday life, or free them from certain current prejudices concerning that noble and enterprising people, the leading desire in writing it will have been satisfied. Should it cause even one heart to feel a deeper trust in God's goodness and love, or aid any in weaving a life wherein through knots and entanglements, the golden thread shall never be tarnished or broken. The prayer with which it was begun and ended will have been answered. Signed, M.M.D. A Letter from Holland Amsterdam, July 30, 1873 Dear Boys and Girls at Home, if you all could be here with me today, what fine times we might have walking through this beautiful Dutch city! How we should stare at the crooked houses, standing with their gable ends to the street, at the little slanting mirrors fastened outside of the windows, at the wooden shoes and dog-carts nearby, the windmills in the distance, at the great warehouses, at the canals, doing the double duty of streets and rivers and at the singular mingling of trees and masts to be seen in every direction. Ah, it would be pleasant indeed. But here I sit in a great hotel looking out upon all these things, knowing quite well that not even the spirit of the Dutch, which seems able to accomplish anything, can bring you at this moment across the ocean. There is one comfort, however, in going through these wonderful Holland towns without you, it would be dreadful to have any of the party tumble into the canals, and then these lumbering Dutch wagons, with their heavy wheels, so very far apart. What should I do if a few dozen of you were to fall under them? And perhaps one of the wildest of my boys might harm a stork, and then all Holland would be against us. No, it is better as it is. You will be coming, one by one, as years go on to see the whole thing for yourselves. Holland is as wonderful today as it was when, more than twenty years ago, Hans and Gretel skated on the frozen Y. In fact, more wonderful, for every day increases the marvel of its not being washed away by the sea. Its cities have grown, and some of its peculiarities have been washed away by contact with other nations. But it is Holland still, and always will be full of oddity, courage, and industry, the pluckiest little country on earth. I shall not tell you in this letter of its customs, its cities, its palaces, churches, picture galleries, and museums, for these are described in the story, except to say that they are here still just the same in this good year 1873, for I have seen them nearly all within a week. Today an American boy and I, seeing some children enter an old house in the business part of Amsterdam, followed them in. And what do you think we found? An old woman, here in the middle of summer, selling hot water and fire. She makes her living by it. 
All day long she sits tending her great fires of peat, and keeping the shining copper tanks above them filled with water. The children who come and go carry away in a curious stone pail their kettle of boiling water and their blocks of burning peat. For these they give her a Dutch scent, which is worth less than half of one of ours. In this way persons who cannot afford to keep a fire burning in hot weather may yet have their cup of tea or coffee and bit of boiled fish and potato. After leaving the old firewoman, who nodded a pleasant good-bye to us, and willingly put our stiefers in her great outside pocket, we drove through the streets enjoying the singular sights of a public washing day. Yes, in certain quarters of the city, away from the canals, the streets were lively with washerwomen hard at work, hundreds of them in clumsy wooden shoes, with their tucked-up skirts, bare arms, and close-fitting caps, were bending over tall wooden tubs that reached as high as their waists, gossiping and rubbing, rubbing and gossiping, with perfect unconcern, in the public thoroughfare, and all washing with cold water instead of using hot, as we do. What a grand thing it would be for our old firewoman if boiling water were suddenly to become the fashion on these public washing days! And now, good-bye. Oh, I must tell you one more thing. We found to-day in an Amsterdam bookstore this story of Hans Brinker, told in Dutch. It is a queer-looking volume, beautifully printed, and with colored pictures, but filled with such astounding words that it really made me feel sorry for the little Hollanders who are to read them. Good-bye again, in the touching words of our Dutch translator, with whom I'm sure you'll heartily agree. Talk ben ik er mijn lang genoten dank per voor, die mijn arbeid steed zu verwillend uit wagen on weer genegenheid, ik voortduren hoop te verdienen. Yours affectionately, the author. End of file one. Chapter One of Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter One Hans and Gretel. On a bright December morning long ago, two thinly clad children were kneeling upon the bank of a frozen canal in Holland. The sun had not yet appeared, but the grey sky was parted near the horizon, and its edges shone crimson with the coming day. Most of the good Hollanders were enjoying a placid morning nap. Even Mynheer von Stoppelnose, that worthy old Dutchman, was still slumbering in beautiful repose. Now and then some peasant woman, poising a well-filled basket upon her head, came skimming over the glassy surface of the canal. Or a lusty boy, skating to his day's work in the town, cast a good-natured grimace towards the shivering pair as he flew along. Meanwhile, with many a vigorous puff and pull, the brother and sister, for such they were, seemed to be fastening something to their feet not skates, certainly, but clumsy pieces of wood, narrowed and smoothed at their lower edge, and pierced with holes, through which were threaded strings of rawhide. These queer-looking affairs had been made by the boy Hans. His mother was a poor peasant woman, too poor even to think of such a thing as buying skates for her little ones. Rough as these were, they had afforded the children many a happy hour upon the ice. And now, as with cold, red fingers our young Hollanders tugged at the strings, their solemn faces bending closely over their knees, no vision of impossible iron runners came to dull the satisfaction glowing within. 
In a moment the boy arose, and with a pompous swing of the arms and a careless, "'Come on, Gretel!' glided easily across the canal. "'Ah, Hans!' called his sister plaintively. "'This foot is not well yet. The strings hurt me on last market-day, and now I cannot bear them tied in the same place.' "'Tie them higher up, then,' answered Hans, as without looking at her he performed a wonderful cat's cradle step on the ice. "'How can I? The string is too short.' Giving vent to a good-natured Dutch whistle, the English of which was that girls were troublesome creatures, he steered toward her. "'You are foolish to wear such shoes, Gretel, when you have a stout leather pair. Your clompen, which are wooden shoes, would be better than these. Why, Hans, do you forget? The father threw my beautiful new shoes in the fire. Before I knew what he had done, they were all curled up in the midst of the burning peat. I can skate with these, but not with my wooden ones. Be careful now. Hans had taken a string from his pocket. Humming a tune as he knelt beside her, he proceeded to fasten Gretel's skate with all the force of his strong young arm. "'Oh! oh!' she cried in real pain. With an impatient jerk Hans unwound the string. He would have cast it on the ground in true Big Brother's style had he not just then spied a tear trickling down his sister's cheek. "'I'll fix it, never fear,' he said with sudden tenderness. "'But we must be quick. The mother will need us soon.' Then he glanced inquiringly about him first at the ground, next at some bare willow branches above his head, and finally at the sky, now gorgeous with streaks of blue, crimson, and gold. Finding nothing in any of these localities to meet his need, his eye suddenly brightened as, with the air of a fellow who knew what he was about, he took off his cap, and removing the tattered lining, adjusted it in a smooth pad over the top of Gretel's worn-out shoe. Now he cried triumphantly, at the same time arranging the strings as briskly as his benumbed fingers would allow. "'Can you bear some pulling?' Gretel drew up her lips as if to say, "'Hurt away!' but made no further response. In another moment they were all laughing together, as hand in hand they flew along the canal, never thinking whether the ice would bear them or not, for in Holland ice is generally an all-winter affair." It settles itself upon the water in a determined kind of way, and so far from growing thin and uncertain every time the sun is a little severe upon it, it gathers its forces, day by day, and flashes defiance to every beam. Presently, squeak, squeak, sounded something beneath Hans's feet. Next his strokes grew shorter, ending off times with a jerk and finally he lay sprawling upon the ice, kicking against the air with many a fantastic flourish. "'Ha!' <laughs> laughed Gretel. "'That was a fine tumble!' But a tender heart was beating under her coarse blue jacket, and even as she laughed she came, with a graceful sweep, close to her prostrate brother. "'Are you hurt, Hans? Oh, you are laughing! Catch me now!' And she darted away, shivering no longer, but with cheeks all aglow and eyes sparkling with fun. Hans sprang to his feet and started in brisk pursuit, but it was no easy thing to catch Gretel. Before she had travelled very far, her skates, too, began to squeak. Believing that discretion was the better part of valour, she turned suddenly and skated into her pursuer's arms. "'Ha! ha I've caught you!' cried Hans. "'Ha! ha! I've caught you!' she retorted struggling to free herself. Just then a clear, quick voice was heard calling, "'Hans! Gretel!' "'It's the mother,' said Hans, looking solemn in an instant. By this time the canal was gilded with sunlight. The pure morning air was very delightful, and skaters were gradually increasing in numbers. It was hard to obey the summons. But Gretel and Hans were good children. Without a thought of yielding to the temptation to linger, they pulled off their skates, leaving half the knots still tied. 
Hans, with his great square shoulders and bushy yellow hair, towered high above his blue-eyed little sister as they trudged homeward. He was fifteen years old, and Gretel was only twelve. He was a solid, hearty-looking boy, with honest eyes and a brow that seemed to bear a sign, goodness within, just as the little Dutch Sommerhuis, summer house, wears a motto over its portal. Gretel was lithe and quick. Her eyes had a dancing light in them, and while you looked at her cheek the color paled and deepened, just as it does upon a bed of pink and white blossoms when the wind is blowing. As soon as the children turned from the canal, they could see their parents' cottage. Their mother's tall form, arrayed in jacket and petticoat and close-fitting cap, stood like a picture in the crooked frame of the doorway. Had the cottage been a mile away, it would still have seemed near. In that flat country every object stands out plainly in the distance. The chickens show as distinctly as the windmills. Indeed, were it not for the dikes and the high banks of the canals, one could stand almost anywhere in Middle Holland without seeing a mound or a ridge between the eye and the jumping-off place. None had better cause to know the nature of these same dikes than Dame Brinker and the panting youngsters now running at her call. But before stating why, let me ask you to take a rocking-chair trip with me to that far country where you may see, perhaps for the first time, some curious things that Hans and Gretel saw every day. End of chapter Chapter Two of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Two Holland. Holland is one of the queerest countries under the sun. It should be called Odd Land or Contrary Land, for in nearly everything it is different from the other parts of the world. In the first place, a large portion of the country is lower than the level of the sea. Great dikes or bulwarks have been erected at a heavy cost of money and labor to keep the ocean where it belongs. On certain parts of the coast it sometimes leans with all its weight against the land, and it is as much as the poor country can do to stand the pressure. Sometimes the dikes give way, or spring a leak, and the most disastrous results ensue. They are high and wide, and the tops of some of them are covered with buildings and trees. They have even fine public roads on them, from which horses may look down upon wayside cottages. Often the keels of floating ships are higher than the roofs of the dwellings. The stork clattering to her young on the house peak may feel that her nest is lifted far out of danger, but the croaking frog in neighboring bulrushes is nearer the stars than she. Water bugs dart backward and forward above the heads of the chimney swallows, and willow trees seem drooping with shame because they cannot reach as high as the reeds nearby. Ditches, canals, ponds, rivers, and lakes are everywhere to be seen. High but not dry, they shine in the sunlight, catching nearly all the bustle and the business, quite scorning the tame fields stretching damply beside them. One is tempted to ask, which is Holland, the shores or the water? The very verdure that should be confined to the land has made a mistake and settled upon the fish ponds. In fact, the entire country is a kind of saturated sponge, or as the English poet Butler called it, a land that rides at anchor and is moored, in which they do not live, but go aboard. Persons are born, live, and die, and even have their gardens on canal boats. Farmhouses, with roofs like great slouched hats pulled over their eyes, stand on wooden legs with a tucked-up sort of air, as if to say, we intend to keep dry if we can. 
Even the horses wear a wide stool on each hoof, as if to lift them out of the mire. In short, the landscape everywhere suggests a paradise for ducks. It is a glorious country in summer for barefoot girls and boys. Such wading, such mimic ship sailing, such rowing, fishing, and swimming. Only think of a chain of puddles where one can launch chip boats all day long and never make a return trip. But enough. A full recital would set all young America rushing in a body towards the Zoida Zee. Dutch cities seem at first sight to be a bewildering jungle of houses, bridges, churches, and ships, sprouting into masts, steeples, and trees. In some cities vessels are hitched like horses to their owner's doorpost, and receive their freight from the upper windows. Mothers scream to Lodovic and Cassie not to swing on the garden gate for fear they may be drowned. Water roads are more frequent there than common roads and railways. Water fences in the form of lazy green ditches enclose pleasure ground, farm, and garden. Sometimes fine green hedges are seen, but wooden fences such as we have in America are rarely met with in Holland. As for stone fences, a Dutchman would lift his hands with astonishment at the very idea. There is no stone there, except for those great masses of rock that have been brought from other lands to strengthen and protect the coast. All the small stones or pebbles, if there ever were any, seem to be imprisoned in pavements or quite melted away. Boys with strong, quick arms may grow from pinafores to full beards without a refining one to start the water rings or set the rabbits flying. The water roads are nothing less than canals, intersecting the country in every direction. These are of all sizes, from the great North Holland ship canal, which is the wonder of the world, to those which a boy can leap. Water omnibuses, called trekskoiten, canal boats, some of the first named are over thirty feet long. They look like green houses lodged on barges and are drawn by horses walking along the bank of the canal. The trekskirten are divided into two compartments, first and second class, and when not too crowded the passengers make themselves quite at home in them. The men smoke, the women knit or sew, while children play upon the small outer deck. Many of the canal boats have white, yellow, or chocolate-colored sails. This last color is caused by a tanning preparation which is put on to preserve them. These trekskirten constantly ply up and down the roads for the conveyance of passengers, and water drays, called pakskirten, are used for carrying fuel and merchandise. Instead of green country lanes, green canals stretch from field to barn and from barn to garden, and the farms, or polders as they are termed, are merely great lakes pumped dry. Some of the busiest streets are water, while many of the country roads are paved with brick. The city boats with their rounded sterns, gilded prows, and gaily painted sides are unlike any others under the sun, and a Dutch wagon, with its funny little crooked pole, is a perfect mystery of mysteries. "'One thing is clear,' cries Master Brightside. "'The inhabitants need never be thirsty.' But no. Odd land is true to itself still. Notwithstanding the sea pushing to get in, and the lakes struggling to get out, and the overflowing canals, rivers, and ditches, in many districts there is no water fit to swallow. Our poor Hollanders must go dry, or drink wine and beer, or send far into the inland to Utrecht, and other favoured localities for that precious fluid, older than Adam, yet younger than the morning dew. Sometimes, indeed, the inhabitants can swallow a shower when they are provided with any means of catching it, but generally they are like the albatross-haunted sailors in Coleridge's famous poem, The Ancient Mariner. They see water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Great flapping windmills all over the country make it look as if flocks of huge seabirds were just settling upon it. Everywhere one sees the funniest trees bobbed into fantastical shapes, with their trunks painted a dazzling white, yellow, or red. Horses are often yoked three abreast. Men, women, and children go clattering about in wooden shoes with loose heels. 
peasant girls who cannot get bows for love, hire them for money to escort them to the kermis, which is a fair, and husbands and wives lovingly harness themselves side by side on the bank of the canal, and drag their pockskirts to market. Another peculiar feature of Holland is the dune, or sand hill. They are numerous along certain portions of the coast. Before they were sown with coarse reed grass and other plants, to hold them down, they used to send great storms of sand over the inland. So, to add to the oddities, the farmers sometimes dig down under the surface to find their soil, and on windy days dry showers of sand often fall upon fields that have grown wet under a week of sunshine. In short, almost the only familiar thing we Yankees can meet with in Holland is a harvest song which is quite popular there, though no linguist could translate it. Even then we must shut our eyes and listen only to the tune, which I leave you to guess. Yanker didy doodle down, didy doodle launter, Yankee weaver voover vown, boater milk and taunter. On the other hand, many of the oddities of Holland serve only to prove the thrift and perseverance of the people. There is not a richer or more carefully tilled garden spot in the whole world than this leaky, springy little country. There is not a braver, more heroic race than its quiet, passive-looking inhabitants. Few nations have equaled it in important discoveries and inventions. None has excelled it in commerce, navigation, learning, and science, or set as noble examples in the promotion of education and public charities, and none in proportion to its extent have expended more money or labor upon public works. Holland has its shining annals of noble and illustrious men and women, its grand, historic records of patience, resistance, and victory, its religious freedom, its enlightened enterprise, its art, music, and literature. It has truly been called the battlefield of Europe, as truly may we consider it the asylum of the world, for the oppressed of every nation have there found shelter and encouragement. If we Americans, who after all are homeopathic preparations of Holland stock, can laugh at the Dutch and call them human beavers, and hint that their country may float off any day at high tide, we can also feel proud, and say they have proved themselves heroes, and that their country will not float off while there is a Dutchman left to grapple it. There are said to be at least ninety-nine hundred large windmills in Holland, with sails ranging from eighty to one hundred and twenty feet long. They are employed in sawing timber, beating hemp, grinding, and many other kinds of work, but their principal use is for pumping water from the lowlands into the canals, and for guarding against the inland freshets that so often deluge the country. Their yearly cost is said to be nearly ten million dollars. The large ones are of great power. The huge circular tower, rising sometimes from the midst of factory buildings, is surmounted with a smaller one, tapering into a cap-like roof. This upper tower is encircled at its base with a balcony, high above which juts the axis turned by its four prodigious ladder-back sails. Many of the windmills are primitive affairs, seeming sadly in need of Yankee improvements, but some of the new ones are admirable. They are constructed so that by some ingenious contrivance they present their fans, or wings, to the wind in precisely the right direction to work with the requisite power. In other words, the miller may take a nap and feel quite sure that his mill will study the wind and make the most of it, until he wakens. Should there be but a slight current of air, every sail will spread itself to catch the faintest breath. But if a heavy blow should come, they will shrink at its touch, like great mimosa leaves, and only give it half a chance to move them. One of the old prisons of Amsterdam, called the Rasp House, because the thieves and vagrants who were confined there were employed in rasping logwood, had a cell for the punishment of lazy prisoners. In one corner of the cell was a pump, and in another an opening through which a steady stream of water was admitted. The prisoner could take his choice, either to stand still and be drowned, 
or to work for dear life at the pump and keep the flood down until his jailer chose to relieve him. Now it seems to me that, throughout Holland, nature has introduced this little diversion on a grand scale. The Dutch have always been forced to pump for their very existence, and probably must continue to do so to the end of time. Every year millions of dollars are spent in repairing dikes and regulating water levels. If these important duties are neglected, the country would be uninhabitable. Already dreadful consequences, as I have said, have followed the bursting of these dikes. Hundreds of villages and towns have from time to time been buried beneath the rush of waters, and nearly a million persons have been destroyed. One of the most fearful inundations ever known occurred in the autumn of the year 1570. Twenty-eight terrible floods had before that time overwhelmed portions of Holland, but this was the most terrible of all. The unhappy country had long been suffering under Spanish tyranny. Now, it seemed, the crowning point was given to its troubles. When we read Motley's history of the rise of the Dutch Republic, we learn to revere the brave people who have endured, suffered, and dared so much. Mr. Motley, in his thrilling account of the great inundation, tells us how a long-continued and violent gale had been sweeping the Atlantic waters into the North Sea, piling them against the coast of the Dutch provinces, how the dikes, taxed beyond their strength, burst in all directions, how even the handbos, a bulwark formed of oaken piles braced with iron, moored with heavy anchors, and secured by gravel and granite, was snapped to pieces like thread. How fishing boats and bulky vessels floating up into the country became entangled among the trees, or beat in the roofs and walls of dwellings, and how at last all Friesland was converted into an angry sea. Multitudes of men, women, children, of horses, oxen, sheep, and every domestic animal, were struggling in the waves in every direction. Every boat, and every article which could serve as a boat, was eagerly seized upon. Every house was inundated. Even the graveyards gave up their dead. The living infant in his cradle, and the long-buried corpse in his coffin floated side by side. The ancient flood seemed about to be renewed. Everywhere, upon the tops of trees, upon the steeples of churches, human beings were clustered, praying to God for mercy, and to their fellow men for assistance. As the storm at last was subsiding, boats began to ply in every direction, saving those who were struggling in the water, picking fugitives from roofs and treetops, and collecting the bodies of those already drowned. No less than one hundred thousand human beings had perished in a few hours. Thousands upon thousands of dumb creatures lay dead upon the waters, and the damage to property was beyond calculation. Robles, the Spanish governor, was foremost in noble efforts to save life and lessen the horrors of the catastrophe. He had previously been hated by the Dutch because of his Spanish or Portuguese blood, but by his goodness and activity in their hour of disaster, he won all hearts to gratitude. He soon introduced an improved method of constructing the dikes, and passed a law that they should in future be kept up by the owners of the soil. There were fewer heavy floods from this time, though within less than three hundred years six fearful inundations swept over the land. In the spring there is always great danger of inland freshets especially in times of thaw, because the rivers, choked with blocks of ice, overflow before they can discharge their rapidly rising waters into the ocean. Adding to this that the sea chafes and presses against the dikes, it is no wonder that Holland is often in a state of alarm. The greatest care is taken to prevent accidents. Engineers and workmen are stationed all along in threatened places, and a close watch is kept up night and day. When a general signal of danger is given, the inhabitants all rush to the rescue, eager to combine against their common foe. As everywhere else, straw is supposed to be of all things the most helpless in the water. Of course in Holland it must be rendered the mainstay against a rushing tide. 
huge straw mats are pressed against the embankments, fortified with clay and heavy stone, and once adjusted, the ocean dashes against them in vain. Raff Brinker, the father of Gretel and Hans, had for years been employed upon the dikes. It was at the time of a threatened inundation, when in the midst of a terrible storm, in darkness and sleet, the men were labouring at a weak spot near the Fir Mixlus, that he fell from the scaffolding and became insensible. From that hour he never worked again, though he lived on, mind and memory were gone. Gretel could not remember him otherwise than as the strange, silent man whose eyes followed her vacantly, whichever way she turned. But Hans had recollection of a hearty, cheerful-voiced father, who was never tired of bearing him upon his shoulder, and whose careless song still seemed echoing near, when he lay awake at night and listened. End of chapter Chapter 3 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 3. The Silver Skates. Dame Brinker earned a scant support for her family by raising vegetables, spinning, and knitting. Once she had worked on board the barges plying up and down the canal, and had occasionally been harnessed with other women to the towing rope of a pack skoit plying between Brook and Amsterdam. But when Hans had grown strong and large, he had insisted on doing all such drudgery in her place. Besides, her husband had become so very helpless of late that he required her constant care. Although not having as much intelligence as a little child, he was yet strong of arm and very hearty, and Dame Brinker had sometimes great trouble in controlling him. "'Ah, children, he was so good and steady,' she would sometimes say, "'and as wise as a lawyer. Even the burgomaster would stop to ask him a question, and now, alack, he doesn't know his wife and little ones. You remember the father, Hans, when he was himself a great brave man, don't you? Yes, indeed, mother, he knew everything and could do anything under the sun, and how he would sing. Why, you used to laugh and say it was enough to set the windmills dancing. So I did. Bless me, how the boy remembers. Gretel, child, take that knitting needle from your father quick. He'll get it in his eyes, maybe, and put the shoe on him. His poor feet are like ice half the time, but I can't keep him covered. All I can do. And then, half wailing, half humming, Dame Brinker would sit down and fill the low cottage with the whirr of her spinning wheel. Nearly all the outside work, as well as the household labor, was performed by Hans and Gretel. At certain seasons of the year the children went out day after day to gather peat, which they would stow away in square, brick-like pieces for fuel. At other times, when homework permitted, Hans rode the towing horses on the canals, earning a few stoifas a day. A stoifa is worth about two cents of our money. And Gretel tended geese for the neighboring farmers. Hans was clever at carving in wood, and both he and Gretel were good gardeners. Gretel could sing and sew and run on great high homemade stilts better than any other girl from miles around. She could learn a ballad in five minutes and find, in its season, any weed or flower you could name. But she dreaded books, and often the very sight of the figuring board in the old schoolhouse would set her eyes swimming. Hans, on the contrary, was slow and steady. The harder the task, whether in study or daily labor, the better he liked it. Boys who sneered at him out of school, on account of his patched clothes and scant leather breeches, were forced to yield him the post of honor in nearly every class. 
It was not long before he was the only youngster in the school who had not stood at least once in the corner of horrors, where hung a dreaded whip, and over it this motto, Lair, lair, you lagard, oft it and your toes how you learn, which means, Learn, learn, you idler, or this rope's end shall teach you. It was only in winter that Gretel and Hans could be spared to attend school, and for the past month they had been kept at home because their mother needed their services. Raff Brinker required constant attention, and there was black bread to be made, and the house to be kept clean, and stockings and other things to be knitted and sold in the marketplace. While they were busily assisting their mother on this cold December morning, a merry troop of girls and boys came skimming down the canal. There were fine skaters among them, and as the bright medley of costumes flitted by, it looked from a distance as though the ice had suddenly thawed, and some gay tulip-bed were floating along on the current. There was the rich burgomaster's daughter, Hilda von Gleck, with her costly furs and loose-fitting velvet sack, and, nearby, a pretty peasant girl, Annie Bowman, jauntily attired in a coarse scarlet jacket and a blue skirt just short enough to display the grey homespun hose to advantage. Then there was the proud Richie Korbs, whose father, Mynheer von Korbs, was one of the leading men of Amsterdam, and, flocking closely around her, Karl Schummel, Peter and Ludwig von Holp, Jacob Poot, and a very small boy rejoicing in the tremendous name of Wusten Walbert Schimmelpenink. There were nearly twenty other boys and girls in the party, and one and all seemed full of excitement and frolic. Up and down the canal, within the space of a half-mile, they skated, exerting their racing powers to the utmost. Often the swiftest among them was seen to dodge from under the very nose of some pompous lawgiver or doctor who, with folded arms, was skating leisurely toward the town or a chain of girls would suddenly break at the approach of a fat old burgomaster, who with gold-headed cane poised in air was puffing his way to Amsterdam. Equipped in skates wonderful to behold, with their superb strappings and dazzling runners curving over the instep and topped with gilt balls, he would open his fat eyes a little if one of the maidens chanced to drop him a curtsy, but would not dare to bow in return for fear of losing his balance. Not only pleasure-seekers and stately men of note were upon the canal. There were workpeople, with weary eyes, hastening to their shops and factories, market-women with loads upon their heads, peddlers bending with their packs, barge-men with shaggy hair and bleared faces, jostling roughly on their way, kind-eyed clergymen speeding perhaps to the bedsides of the dying, and after a while groups of children with satchels slung over their shoulders, whizzing past, toward the distant school. One and all wore skates except, indeed, a muffled-up farmer whose queer cart bumped along on the margin of the canal. Before long our merry boys and girls were almost lost in the confusion of bright colours, the ceaseless motion, and the gleaming of skates flashing back the sunlight. We might have known no more of them had not the whole party suddenly come to a standstill, and, grouping themselves out of the way of the passers-by, all talked at once to a pretty little maiden, whom they had drawn from the tide of people flowing toward the town. "'Oh, Katrinka!' they cried in one breath. "'Have you heard of it? The race! We want you to join!' "'What race?' asked Katrinka, laughing. Don't all talk at once, please, I can't understand. Everyone panted and looked at Ritchie Korbes, who was their acknowledged spokeswoman. Why, said Ritchie, we are to have a grand skating match on the twentieth, on Mevrog van Gleck's birthday. It's all Hilda's work. They're going to give a splendid prize to the best skater. Yes, chimed in half a dozen voices, a beautiful pair of silver skates perfectly magnificent, with, oh, such straps and silver bells and buckles. "'Who said they had bells?' put in a small voice of the boy with a big name. "'I say so, Master Voost,' replied Ritchie. "'So they have. No, I'm sure they haven't. Oh, how can you say so? 
it's an arrow. And Mynheer van Korbes told my mother they had bells, came from the excited group, but Mynheer Voostenwalbert Schimmelpenick essayed to settle the matter with a decisive, Well, you don't any of you know a single thing about it. They haven't a sign of a bell on them. They, oh, oh, and the chorus of conflicting opinions broke forth again. The girls' pair is to have bells, interposed Hilda quietly, but there is to be another pair for the boys, with an arrow engraved upon the sides. There, I told you so, cried nearly all the youngsters in one breath. Katrinka looked at them with bewildered eyes. Who is to try? she asked. All of us, answered Ritchie. It will be such fun, and you must too, Katrinka. But it's school time now. We will talk it all over at noon. Oh, you will join, of course. Katrinka, without replying, made a graceful pirouette, and laughed out a coquettish, Don't you hear the last bell? Catch me! Darted off toward the schoolhouse, standing half a mile away on the canal. All started pell-mell at this challenge, but they tried in vain to catch the bright-eyed, laughing creature who, with golden hair streaming in the sunlight, cast back many a sparkling glance of triumph as she floated onward. Beautiful Katrinka, flushed with youth and health, all life and mirth and motion, what wonder thine image, ever floating in advance, sped through one boy's dreams that night! What wonder that it seemed his darkest hour when, years afterward, thy presence floated away from him forever. End of chapter Chapter 4 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or the Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 4. Hans and Gretel Find a Friend. At noon our young friends poured forth from the schoolhouse, intent upon having an hour's practice upon the canal. They had skated but a few moments when Carl Schummel said mockingly to Hilda, "'There's a pretty pair just coming upon the ice. The little rag-pickers! Their skates must have been a present from the king direct.' "'They are patient creatures,' said Hilda gently. "'It must have been hard to learn to skate upon such queer affairs. They are very poor peasants, you see. The boy has probably made the skates himself." Carl was somewhat abashed. Patient they may be, but as for skating, they start off pretty well, only to finish with a jerk. They could move well to your new staccato piece, I think." Hilda laughed pleasantly and left him. After joining a small detachment of the racers and sailing past every one of them, she halted beside Gretel, who, with eager eyes, had been watching the sport. "'What is your name, little girl?' "'Gretel, my lady.' answered the child, somewhat awed by Hilda's rank, though they were nearly of the same age. "'And my brother is called Hans.' "'Hans is a stout fellow,' said Hilda cheerfully, "'and seems to have a warm stove somewhere within him. But you look cold. You should wear more clothing, little one.' Gretel, who had nothing else to wear, tried to laugh as she answered, "'I am not so very little. I am past twelve years old.' Oh, I beg your pardon. You see, I am nearly fourteen, and so large for my age that other girls seem small to me. But that is nothing. Perhaps you will shoot up far above me yet. But not unless you dress more warmly, though. Shivering girls never grow." Hans flushed as he saw tears rising in Gretel's eyes. My sister has not complained of the cold, but this is bitter weather, they all say and he looked sadly upon Gretel. "'It is nothing,' said Gretel. "'I am often warm, too warm when I am skating. You are good, you frau, which means miss. In studied or polite address it would be young frau. To think of it!' 
"'No, no,' answered Hilda, quite angry at herself. "'I am careless, cruel, but I meant no harm. I wanted to ask you, I mean, if—' And here Hilda, coming to the point of her errand, faltered before the poorly clad but noble-looking children she wished to serve. "'What is it, young lady?' exclaimed Hans eagerly. "'If there is any service I can do, any—oh, no, no!' laughed Hilda, shaking off her embarrassment. "'I only wish to speak to you about the grand race. Why do you not join it? You both can skate well, and the ranks are free. Any one may enter for the prize.' Gretel looked wistfully at Hans, who, tugging at his cap, answered respectfully, "'Ah, Jufro, even if we could enter, we could skate only a few strokes with the rest. Our skates are hard wood, you see, holding up the sole of his foot. But they soon become damp, and then they stick and trip us.' Gretel's eyes twinkled with fun as she thought of Hans' mishap in the morning, but she blushed as she faltered out timidly, Oh, no, we can't join. But may we be there, my lady, on the great day, to look on? Certainly, answered Hilda, looking kindly into the two earnest faces, and wishing from her heart that she had not spent so much of her monthly allowance for lace and finery. She had but eight quartjes. A quartje is a small silver coin worth one quarter of a guilder, or ten cents in American currency. Left and they would buy but one pair of skates at the furthest. Looking down with a sigh at the two pairs of feet so very different in size, she asked, "'Which of you is the better skater?' "'Gretel,' replied Hans promptly. "'Hans,' answered Gretel in the same breath. Hilda smiled. "'I cannot buy you each a pair of skates, or even one good pair, but here are eight quartjes. Decide between you which stands the best chance of winning the race, and buy the skates accordingly. I wish I had enough to buy better ones. Good-bye! And with a nod and a smile, Hilda, after handing the money to the electrified Hans, glided swiftly away to rejoin her companions. Euphro! Euphro von Gleck! called Hans in a loud tone, stumbling after her as well as he could, for one of his skate-strings was untied. Hilda turned, and with one hand raised to shield her eyes from the sun, seemed to him to be floating through the air, nearer and nearer. "'We cannot take this money,' panted Hans, "'though we know your goodness in giving it.' "'Why not, indeed?' asked Hilda, flushing. "'Because,' replied Hans, bowing like a clown, but looking with the eye of a prince at the queenly girl, "'we have not earned it. Hilda was quick-witted. She had noticed a pretty wooden chain upon Gretel's neck. "'Carve me a chain, Hans, like the one your sister wears.' "'That I will, lady, with all my heart. We have white wood in the house, fine as ivory. You shall have one to-morrow.' And Hans hastily tried to return the money. "'No, no,' said Hilda decidedly. "'That sum will be but a poor price for the chain.' And off she darted outstripping the fleetest among the skaters. Hans sent a long, bewildered gaze after her. It was useless, he felt, to make any further resistance. "'It is right,' he muttered, half to himself, half to his faithful shadow, Gretel. "'I must work hard every minute, and sit up half the night if the mother will let me burn a candle. But the chain shall be finished. We may keep the money, Gretel.' "'What a good little lady!' cried Gretel, clapping her hands with delight. "'Oh! Hans, was it for nothing the stork settled on our roof last summer? Do you remember how the mother said it would bring us luck, and how she cried when Jansum Kolp shot him? And she said it would bring him trouble. But the luck has come to us at last. Now, Hans, if the mother sends us to town to-morrow, you can buy the skates in the marketplace.' Hans shook his head. The young lady would have given us the money to buy skates, but if I earn it, Gretel, it shall be spent for wool. You must have a warm jacket. Oh! cried Gretel in real dismay. Not buy the skates! Why, I am not often cold. 
Mother says the blood runs up and down in poor children's veins, humming, I must keep em warm, I must keep em warm. Oh, Hans, she continued with something like a sob, don't say you won't buy the skates. It makes me feel just like crying. Besides, I want to be cold. I, I mean, I'm real awful warm. So now. Hans looked up hurriedly. He had a true Dutch horror of tears, or emotion of any kind, and most of all, he dreaded to see his sister's blue eyes overflowing. "'Now mind,' cried Gretel, seeing her advantage, "'I'll feel awful if you give up the skates. I don't want them. I'm not so stingy as that. But I want you to have them, and then when I get bigger, they'll do for me. Oh, count the pieces, Hans. Did you ever see so many?' Hans turned the money thoughtfully in his palm. Never in all his life had he longed so intensely for a pair of skates, for he had known of the race and had fairly ached for a chance to test his powers with the other children. He felt confident that with a good pair of steel runners he could readily outdistance most of the boys on the canal. Then, too, Gretel's argument was plausible. On the other hand, he knew that she, with her strong but lithe little frame, needed but a week's practice on good runners to make her a better skater than Richie Corbs or even Katrinka Flack. As soon as this last thought flashed upon him, his resolve was made. If Gretel would not have the jacket, she should have the skates. "'No, Gretel,' he answered at last. "'I can wait. Some day I may have money enough saved to buy a fine pair. You shall have these.' Gretel's eyes sparkled but in another instant she insisted, rather faintly, "'The young lady gave the money to you, Hans. I'd be real bad to take it.' Hans shook his head resolutely as he trudged on, causing his sister to half-skip and half-walk in her effort to keep beside him. By this time they had taken off their wooden rockers, and were hastening home to tell their mother the good news. "'Oh, I know!' cried Gretel in a sprightly tone. You can do this. You can get a pair a little too small for you, and too big for me, and we can take turns and use them. Won't that be fine?" Gretel clapped her hands again. Poor Hans! This was a strong temptation, but he pushed it away from him, brave-hearted fellow that he was. Nonsense, Gretel! You could never get on with a big pair. You stumbled about on these like a blind chicken, before I curved off the ends. No, you must have a pair to fit exactly, and you must practice every chance you can get until the twentieth comes. My little Gretel shall win the silver skates. Gretel could not help laughing with delight at the very idea. Hans! Gretel! called out a familiar voice. Coming, mother! They hastened towards the cottage, Hans still shaking the pieces of silver in his hand. On the following day there was not a prouder nor a happier boy in all Holland than Hans Brinker as he watched his sister, with many a dexterous sweep, flying in and out among the skaters who at sundown thronged the canal. A warm jacket had been given her by the kind-hearted Hilda, and the burst-out shoes had been cobbled into decency by Dame Brinker. As the little creature darted backward and forward, flushed with enjoyment, and quite unconscious of the many wandering glances bent upon her, she felt that the shining runners beneath her feet had suddenly turned earth into fairyland, while Hans, dear good Hans, echoed itself over and over again in her grateful heart. "'By den donder!' exclaimed Peter von Holp to Karl Schummel. But that little one in the red jacket and patched petticoat skates well. Gunst! She has toes on her heels and eyes in the back of her head. See her! It will be a joke if she gets in the race and beats Katrinka Flack after all. Hush! Not so loud! returned Karl rather sneeringly. That little lady in rags is the special pet of Hilda von Gleck. Those shining skates are her gift, if I make no mistake. So, so, exclaimed Peter with a radiant smile, for Hilda was his best friend. She has been at her good work there, too. And Mynheer von Holp, after cutting a double figure eight on the ice, 
to say nothing of a huge P, then a jump and an H, glided onward until he found himself beside Hilda. Hand in hand they skated together, laughingly at first, then steadily talking in a low tone. Strange to say, Peter van Holp soon arrived at a sudden conviction that his little sister needed a wooden chain, just like Hilda's. Two days afterwards, on St. Nicholas's Eve, Hans, having burned three candle-ends and cut his thumb into the bargain, stood in the market-place at Amsterdam, buying another pair of skates. End of chapter Chapter 5 of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 5 Shadows in the Home. Good Dame Brinker, as soon as the scanty dinner had been cleared away that noon, she had arrayed herself in her holiday attire in honour of St. Nicholas. It will brighten the children, she thought to herself, and she was not mistaken. This festival dress had been worn very seldom during the past ten years. Before that time it had done good service, and had flourished at many a dance and kermis, when she was known far and wide as the pretty Maitje Klenk. The children had sometimes been granted rare glimpses of it as it lay in state in the old oaken chest. Faded and threadbare as it was, it was gorgeous in their eyes, with its white linen tucker, now gathered to her plump throat and vanishing beneath the trim bodice of blue homespun, and its reddish-brown skirt bordered with black. The knitted woolen mitts and the dainty cap showing her hair which generally was hidden, made her seem almost like a princess to Gretel, while Master Hans grew staid and well-behaved as he gazed. Soon the little maid, while braiding her own golden tresses, fairly danced around her mother in an ecstasy of admiration. "'Oh, mother, 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 how pretty you are! Look, Hans, isn't it just like a picture?' "'Just like a picture,' assented Hans cheerfully just like a picture, only I don't like those stocking things on the hands. Not like the mitts, Brother Hans? Why, they're very important. See, they cover up all the red. Oh, Mother, how white your arm is where the mitt leaves off! Whiter than mine! Oh, ever so much whiter! I declare, Mother, the bodice is tight for you. You're growing. You're surely growing. Dame Brinker laughed. This was made long ago, lovey, when I wasn't much thicker about the waist than a churn-dasher. And how do you like the cap? she asked, turning her head from side to side. Oh, ever so much, mother, it's beautiful. See, the father is looking. Was the father looking? Alas, only with a dull stare. His frow turned toward him with a start, something like a blush rising to her cheeks a questioning sparkle in her eye. The bright look died away in an instant. No, no, she sighed. He sees nothing. Come, Hans. And the smile crept faintly back again. Don't stand gaping at me all day, and the new skate's waiting for you at Amsterdam. Ah, mother, he answered, you need so many things. Why should I buy skates? Nonsense, child. The money was given to you on purpose, or the work was. It's all the same thing. Go while the sun is high. Yes, and hurry back, Hans, laughed Gretel. We'll race on the canal tonight, if the mother lets us. At the very threshold he turned to say, Your spinning wheel wants a new treadle, mother. You can make it, Hans. So I can. That will take no money. But you need feathers and wool and meal and— There, there, that will do. Your silver cannot buy everything. Ah, 
Hans, if our stolen money would but come back on this bright St. Nicholas's Eve, how glad we would be! Only last night I prayed to the good saint— Mother! interrupted Hans in dismay. Why not, Hans? Shame on you to reproach me for that. I'm as true a Protestant, in sooth, as any fine lady that walks into church. But it's no wrong to turn sometimes to the good St. Nicholas. Tut! It's a likely story if one can't do that, without one's children flaring up at it. Had he the boy's and girl's own saint? Hoot! Mayhap the colt is a steadier horse than the mare? Hans knew his mother too well to offer a word in opposition when her voice quickened and sharpened as it did now. It was often sharp and quick when she spoke of the missing money. So he said gently, "'And what did you ask of good St. Nicholas, mother?' "'Why, never to give the thieves a wink of sleep till they brought it back, to be sure, if he has the power to do such things, or else to brighten our wits that we might find it ourselves. Not a sight have I had of it since the day before the dear father was hurt, as you well know, Hans.' "'That I do, mother,' he answered sadly though you have almost pulled down the cottage in searching. "'Ay, but it was of no use,' moaned the dame. "'Hiders make best finders.' Hans started. "'Do you think the father could tell aught?' "'Ay, indeed,' said Dame Brinker, nodding her head. "'I think so, but that is no sign. I never hold the same belief in the matter two days.' Mayhap the father paid it off for the great silver watch we have been guarding since that day. But no, I'll never believe it. The watch was not worth a quarter of the money, mother. No, indeed, and your father was a shrewd man up to the last moment. He was too steady and thrifty for silly doings. Where did the watch come from, I wonder? muttered Hans half to himself. Dame Brinker shook her head, and looked sadly toward her husband, who sat staring blankly at the floor. Gretel stood near him, knitting. "'That we shall never know, Hans. I have shown it to the father many a time, but he does not know it from a potato. When he came in that dreadful night to supper, he handed the watch to me, and told me to take good care of it until he asked for it again. Just as he opened his lips to say more, Broom Clatterboos came flying in with word that the dyke was in danger. Ah! The waters were terrible that pinkster week. My man, alack, caught up his tools and ran out. That was the last I ever saw of him in his right mind. He was brought in again by midnight, nearly dead, with his poor head all bruised and cut. The fever passed off in time, but never the dullness. That grew worse every day we shall never know. Hans had heard all this before. More than once he had seen his mother, in hours of sore need, take the watch from its hiding place, half resolved to sell it, but she had always conquered the temptation. No, Hans, she would say, we must be nearer starvation than this before we turn faithless to the father. A memory of some such scene crossed her son's mind now, for, after giving a heavy sigh, and flipping a crumb of wax at Gretel across the table, he said, "'Ay, mother, you have done bravely to keep it. Many a one would have tossed it off for gold long ago.' "'And more shame for them!' exclaimed the dame indignantly. "'I would not do it. Besides, the gentry are so hard on us poor folks that if they saw such a thing in our hands, even if we told all, they might suspect the father of—' Hans flushed angrily. "'They would not dare to say such a thing, mother. If they did, I'd—I'd—' I'd. He clenched his fist, and seemed to think that the rest of his sentence was too terrible to utter in her presence. Dame Bricker smiled proudly through her tears at this interruption. "'Ah, Hans, thou art a true brave lad. We will never part company with the watch.' In his dying hour the dear father might wake and ask for it. "'Might wake, mother!' echoed Hans. "'Wake, and know us?' "'Aye, child,' almost whispered his mother. 
such things have been. By this time Hans had nearly forgotten his proposed errand to Amsterdam. His mother had seldom spoke so familiarly to him. He felt himself now to be not only her son, but her friend, her adviser. "'You are right, mother. We must never give up the watch. For the father's sake we will guard it always. The money, though, may come to light when we least expect it.' "'Never!' cried Dame Brinker, taking the last stitch from her needle with a jerk, and laying the unfinished knitting heavily upon her lap. "'There is no chance. One thousand guilders, and all gone in a day. One thousand guilders! Oh, whatever did become of them! If they went in an evil way, the thief would have confessed it on his dying bed. He would not dare to die with such guilt on his soul. "'He may not be dead yet,' said Hans soothingly. "'Any day we may hear of him.' "'Ah, child!' she said in a changed tone. "'What thief would ever have come here? It was always neat and clean, thank God, but not fine, for the father and I saved and saved that we might have something laid by. Little and often soon fills the pouch. We found it so, in truth. Besides, the father had a goodly sum already, for service done to the Herrenacht lands, at the time of the great inundation. Every week we had a gilder left over, sometimes more, for the father worked extra hours and could get high pay for his labor. Every Saturday night we put something by, except the time when you had the fever, Hans, and when Gretel came. At last the pouch grew so full that I mended an old stocking, and commenced again. Now that I look back it seems that the money was up to the heel in a few sunny weeks. There was great pay in those days, if a man was quick at engineer work. The stocking went on filling with copper and silver, ay, and gold. You may well open your eyes, Gretel. I used to laugh and tell the father it was not for poverty I wore my old gown. And the stocking went on filling, so full that sometimes when I woke at night I'd get up, soft and quiet, and go feel it in the moonlight. Then on my knees I would thank our Lord that my little ones could in time get good learning and that the father might rest from labor in his old age. Sometimes at supper the father and I would talk about a new chimney and a good winter room for the cow, but my man had finer plans even than that. A big sail, says he, catches the wind. We can do what we will soon. And then we would sing together as I wash my dishes. Ah, a smooth wind makes an easy rudder. Not a thing vexed me from morning till night. Every week the father would take out the stocking, and drop in the money, and laugh and kiss me as we tied it up together. "'Up with you, Hans. There you sit gaping, and the day a-wasting,' added Dame Brinker tartly, blushing to find that she had been speaking too freely to her boy. "'It's high time you were on your way.' Hans had seated himself, and was looking earnestly into her face. He arose, and in almost a whisper asked, "'Have you ever tried, mother?' She understood him. "'Yes, child, often. But the father only laughs, or he stares at me so strange that I am glad to ask no more. When you and Gretel had the fever last winter, and our bread was nearly gone, and I could earn nothing, for fear you would die while my face was turned, oh, I tried then!' I smoothed his hair, and whispered to him soft as a kitten about the money. Where it was, who had it? Alack! He would pick at my sleeve and whisper gibberish till my blood ran cold. At last, while Gretel lay whiter than snow, and you were raving on the bed, I screamed to him. It seemed as if he must hear me. Raff, where is our money? Do you know aught of the money, Raff? the money in the pouch, and the stocking, in the big chest. But I might as well have talked to a stone. I might as—' The mother's voice sounded so strange, and her eye was so bright, that Hans, with a new anxiety, laid his hand upon her shoulder. "'Come, mother,' he said, "'let us try to forget this money. I am big and strong. Gretel, too, is very quick and willing. 
soon all will be prosperous with us again. Why, mother, Gretel and I would rather see thee bright and happy than to have all the silver in the world, wouldn't we, Gretel? The mother knows it, said Gretel, sobbing. End of chapter Chapter Six of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Six, Sunbeams. Dame Brinker was startled at her children's emotion, glad, too, for it proved how loving and true they were. Beautiful ladies in princely homes often smile suddenly and sweetly, gladdening the very air around them, but I doubt if their smile would be more welcome in God's sight than that which sprang forth to cheer the roughly clad boy and girl in the humble cottage. Dame Brinker felt that she had been selfish, blushing and brightening, she hastily wiped her eyes, and looked upon them as only a mother can. Hoity-toity! Pretty talk we're having, and St. Nicholas's Eve almost here! What wonder the yarn pricks my fingers! Come, Gretel, take this scent. The Dutch scent is worth less than half of an American scent. And while Hans is trading for the skates, you can buy a waffle in the marketplace. Let me stay home with you, mother said Gretel, looking up with eyes that sparkled through their tears. Hans will buy me the cake. As you will, child. And Hans, wait a moment. Three turns of this needle will finish this toe, and then you may have as good a pair of hose as ever were knitted, owning the yarn as a grain too sharp, to sell to the hosier on the Herrengracht, a street in Amsterdam. That will give us three-quarter guilders if you make good trade and as it's right hungry weather, you may buy four waffles. We'll keep the feast of St. Nicholas after all." Gretel clapped her hands. "'That will be fine! Any bowman told me what grand times they will have in the big houses to-night. But we will be merry, too. Hans will have beautiful new skates, and then there'll be the waffles. Oh, don't break them, brother Hans. Wrap them well, and button them under your jacket very carefully. Certainly, replied Hans, quite gruff with pleasure and importance. Oh, mother, cried Gretel in high glee, soon you will be busied with the father, and now you are only knitting. Do tell us all about St. Nicholas. Dame Brinker laughed to see Hans hang up his hat and prepare to listen. Nonsense, children, she said. I have told it to you often. Tell us again, oh, do tell us again cried Gretel, throwing herself upon the wonderful wooden bench that her brother had made on the mother's last birthday. Hans, not wishing to appear childish, and yet quite willing to hear the story, stood carelessly swinging his skates against the fireplace. "'Well, children, you shall hear it, but we must never waste the daylight again in this way. Pick up your ball, Gretel, and let your sock grow as I talk. Opening your ears needn't shut your fingers.' St. Nicholas, you must know, is a wonderful saint. He keeps his eye open for the good of sailors, but he cares most of all for boys and girls. Well, once upon a time, when he was living on the earth, a merchant of Asia sent his three sons to a great city, called Athens, to get learning. "'Is Athens in Holland, mother?' asked Gretel. "'I don't know, child. Probably it is.' "'Oh, no, mother,' said Hans respectfully. "'I had that in my geography lessons long ago. Athens is in Greece.' "'Well,' resumed the mother, "'what matter? Greece may belong to the king for aught we know. Anyhow, this rich merchant sent his sons to Athens. While they were on their way, they stopped one night at a shabby inn, meaning to take up their journey in the morning. Well, they had very fine clothes, velvet and silk it may be, 
such as rich folks' children all over the world think nothing of wearing, and their belts likewise were full of money. What did the wicked landlord do but contrive a plan to kill the children and take their money and all their beautiful clothes himself? So that night, when all the world was asleep, he got up and killed the three young gentlemen. Gretel clasped her hands and shuddered, but Hans tried to look as if killing and murder were everyday matters to him. "'That was not the worst of it,' continued Dame Brinker, knitting slowly and trying to keep count of her stitches as she talked. "'That was not near the worst of it. The dreadful landlord went and cut up the young gentlemen's bodies into little pieces, and threw them into a great tub of brine, intending to sell them for pickled pork. "'Oh!' cried Gretel, horror-stricken, though she had often heard the story before. Hans was still unmoved, and seemed to think that pickling was the best that could be done under the circumstances. Yes, he pickled them, and one might think that would have been the last of the young gentlemen. But no, that night St. Nicholas had a wonderful vision, and in it he saw the landlord cutting up the merchant's children. There was no need of his hurrying, you know, for he was a saint, but in the morning he went to the inn and charged the landlord with murder. Then the wicked landlord confessed it from beginning to end, and fell down on his knees begging forgiveness. He felt so sorry for what he had done that he asked the saint to bring the young masters to life. "'And did the saint do it?' asked Gretel, delighted, well knowing what the answer would be. "'Of course he did.' the pickled pieces flew together in an instant, and out jumped the young gentleman from the brine tub. They cast themselves at the feet of St. Nicholas, and he gave them his blessing, and, oh, oh, mercy on us, Hans, it will be dark before you get back if you don't start this minute. By this time Dame Brinker was almost out of breath and quite out of commas. She could not remember when she had seen the children idle away an hour of daylight in this manner and the thought of such luxury quite appalled her. By way of compensation she now flew about the room in extreme haste, tossing a block of peat upon the fire, blowing invisible dust from the table, and handing the finished hose to Hans all in an instant. "'Come, Hans,' she said as her boy lingered by the door, "'what keeps thee?' Hans kissed his mother's plump cheek, rosy and fresh yet, in spite of all her troubles. My mother is the best in the world, and I would be right glad to have a pair of skates, but, and as he buttoned his jacket he looked, in a troubled way, toward a strange figure crouching by the hearthstone. If my money would bring a maester, a doctor in Dutch, called maester by the lower class, from Amsterdam to see the father, something might yet be done. A maester would not come, Hans, for twice that money, and it would do no good if he did. Ah, how many guilders I once spent for that, but the dear good father would not waken. It is God's will. Go, Hans, and buy the skates. Hans started with a heavy heart, but since the heart was young, and in a boy's bosom, it set him whistling in less than five minutes. His mother had said thee to him, and that was quite enough to make even a dark day sunny. Hollanders do not address each other, in affectionate intercourse, as the French and Germans do. But Dame Brinker had embroidered for a Heidelberg family in her girlhood, and she had carried its thee and thou into her rude home, to be used in moments of extreme love and tenderness. Therefore, what keeps thee, Hans? sang an echo-song beneath the boy's whistling, and made him feel that his errand was blessed. End of chapter Chapter 7 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 7. Hans Has His Way. Brook, with its quiet spotless streets, its frozen rivulets, its yellow brick pavements and bright wooden houses, was nearby. It was a village where neatness and show were in full blossom, but the inhabitants seemed to be either asleep or dead. Not a footprint marred the sanded paths where pebbles and seashells lay in fanciful designs. Every window shutter was tightly closed as though air and sunshine were poison, and the massive front doors were never opened except on the occasion of a wedding, a christening, or a funeral. Serene clouds of tobacco smoke were floating through hidden corners, and children, who otherwise might have awakened the place, were studying in out-of-the-way corners or skating upon the neighboring canal. A few peacocks and wolves stood in the gardens, but they had never enjoyed the luxury of flesh and blood. They were made out of boxwood hedges, and seemed to be guarding the grounds with a sort of green ferocity. Certain lively automata, ducks, women, and sportsmen, were stowed away in summer houses, waiting for the springtime when they could be wound up and rival their owners in animation, and the shining tiled roofs, mosaic courtyards, and polished house trimmings flashed up a silent homage to the sky, where never a speck of dust could dwell. Hans glanced toward the village, as he shook his silver quartzes, and wondered whether it was really true as he had often heard, that some of the people of Brook were so rich that they used kitchen utensils of solid gold. He had seen Mevrouw van Stoop's sweet cheeses in market, and he knew that the lofty dame earned many a bright silver gilder in selling them. But did she set the cream to rise in golden pans? Did she use a golden skimmer? When her cows were in winter quarters, were their tails really tied up with ribbons? These thoughts ran through his mind as he turned his face toward Amsterdam, not five miles away, on the other side of the frozen eye, which is an arm of the Zuider Zee. The ice upon the canal was perfect, but his wooden runners, so soon to be cast aside, squeaked a dismal farewell as he scraped and skimmed along. When crossing the eye, whom should he see skating toward him but the great Dr. Bookman, the most famous physician and surgeon in Holland? Hans had never met him before, but he had seen his engraved likeness in many of the shop windows in Amsterdam. It was a face that one could never forget. Thin and lank, though a born Dutchman, with stern blue eyes, and queer compressed lips that seemed to say, No smiling permitted. He certainly was not a very jolly or sociable-looking personage, nor one that a well-trained boy would care to accost unbidden. But Hans was bidden, and that too, by a voice he seldom disregarded, his own conscience. "'Here comes the greatest doctor in the world,' whispered the voice. "'God has sent him. You have no right to buy skates when you might, with the same money, purchase such aid for your father.' The wooden runners gave an exultant squeak. Hundreds of beautiful skates were gleaming and vanishing in the air above him. He felt the money tingle in his fingers. The old doctor looked fearfully grim and forbidding. Hans's heart was in his throat, but he found voice enough to cry out, just as he was passing, "'My near bookman!' The great man halted, and, sticking out his thin underlip, looked scowling about him. Hans was in for it now. "'My dear,' he panted, drawing close to the fierce-looking doctor, "'I knew you could be none other than the famous bookman. I have to ask a great favor. "'Huh!' muttered the doctor, preparing to skate past the intruder. "'Get out of the way. I've no money. Never give to beggars.' "'I am no beggar, my dear.' retorted Hans proudly, at the same time producing his mite of silver with a grand air. I wish to consult you about my father. He is a living man, but sits like one dead. He cannot think. 
His words mean nothing, but he is not sick. He fell on the dikes. Hey, what? cried the doctor, beginning to listen. Hans told the whole story in an incoherent way, dashing off a tear once or twice as he talked, and finally ending with an earnest, Oh, do see him, my dear. His body is well. It is only his mind. I know that this money is not enough, but take it, my dear. I will earn more, I know I will. Oh, I will toil for you all my life, if you will but cure my father. What was the matter with the old doctor? A brightness like sunlight beamed from his face. His eyes were kind and moist. The hand that had lately clutched his cane, as if preparing to strike, was laid gently upon Hans's shoulder. "'Put up your money, boy. I do not want it. We will see your father. It's hopeless, I fear. How long did you say?' Ten years, my dear,' sobbed Hans, radiant with sudden hope. "'Ah, a bad case. But I shall see him. Let me think. Today I start for Leyden, to return in a week. Then you may expect me.' Where is it? A mile south of Brook, my near, near the canal. It is only a poor, broken-down hut. Any of the children thereabout can point it out to your honour, added Hans with a heavy sigh. They are all half afraid of the place. They call it the Idiot's Cottage. That will do, said the doctor, hurrying on with a bright backward nod at Hans. I shall be there. A hopeless case he muttered to himself, but the boy pleases me. His eye is like my poor Lawrence's. Confound it! Shall I never forget that young scoundrel? And scowling more darkly than ever, the doctor pursued his silent way. Again Hans was skating toward Amsterdam on the squeaking wooden runners. Again his fingers tingled against the money in his pocket. Again the boyish whistle rose unconsciously to his lips. Shall I hurry home? he was thinking, to tell the good news, or shall I get the waffles and the new skates first? Whew! I think I'll go on. And so Hans bought the skates. End of chapter Chapter 8 of Hans Brinker this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 8. Introducing Jacob Poot and His Cousin. Hans and Gretel had a fine frolic early on that St. Nicholas's Eve. There was a bright moon, and their mother, though she believed herself to be without any hope of her husband's improvement, had been made so happy at the prospect of the Maestas' visit that she yielded to the children's entreaties for an hour's skating before bedtime. Hans was delighted with his new skates, and, in his eagerness to show Gretel how perfectly they worked, did many things upon the ice that caused the little maid to clasp her hands in solemn admiration. They were not alone, though they seemed quite unheeded by the various groups assembled upon the canal. The two Van Holps and Carl Schummel were there, testing their fleetness to the utmost. Out of four trials Peter Van Holp had won three times. Consequently Carl, never very amiable, was in anything but a good humour. He had relieved himself by taunting young Schimmelpenick, who, being smaller than the others, kept meekly near them without feeling exactly like one of the party. But now a new thought seized Carl, or rather he seized the new thought and made an onset upon his friends. "'I say, boys, let's put a stop to those young ragpickers from the idiot's cottage joining the race. Hilda must be crazy to think of it. Katrinka Flack and Richie Corbs are furious at the very idea of racing with a girl and for my part, I don't blame them. As for the boy, if we've a spark of manhood in us, we will scorn the very idea of— "'Certainly we will,' interposed Peter van Holp, purposely mistaking Carl's meaning. "'Who doubts it? 
no fellow with a spark of manhood in him would refuse to let in two good skaters just because they were poor. Carl wheeled around savagely. Not so fast, master, and I'd thank you not to put words in other people's mouths. You'd best not try it again. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed little Wustenwalbert Schimmelpenick, delighted at the prospect of a fight, and sure that, if it should come to blows, his favorite Peter could beat a dozen excitable fellows like Carl. Something in Peter's eye made Carl glad to turn to a weaker offender. He wheeled furiously upon Voost. "'What are you shrieking about, you little weasel? You skinny herring you, you little monkey with a long name for a tail?' Half a dozen bystanders and by-skaters set up an applauding shout at this brave witticism, and Carl, feeling that he had fairly vanquished his foes, was restored to partial good humor. He, however, prudently resolved to defer plotting against Hans and Gretel until some time when Peter should not be present. Just then his friend Jacob Poot was seen approaching. They could not distinguish his features at first but as he was the stoutest boy in the neighborhood, there could be no mistaking his form. "'Hello! Here comes Fatty!' exclaimed Carl. "'And there's someone with him, a slender fellow, a stranger.' "'Ha, ha! That's like good bacon!' cried Ludwig. "'A streak of lean and a streak of fat!' "'That's Jacob's English cousin,' put in Master Voost, delighted at being able to give the information. "'That's his English cousin!' And, oh, he's got such a funny little name, Ben Dobbs. He's going to stay with him until after the grand race. All this time the boys had been spinning, turning, rolling, and doing other feats upon their skates, in a quiet way, as they talked. But now they stood still, bracing themselves against the frosty air as Jacob Poot and his friend drew near. "'This is my cousin, boys,' said Jacob, rather out of breath. Benjamin Dobbs. He's a John Bull, and he's going to be in the race. All crowded, boy fashion, about the newcomers. Benjamin soon made up his mind that the Hollanders, notwithstanding their queer gibberish, were a fine set of fellows. If the truth must be told, Jacob had announced his cousin as Benjamin Dobbs, and called him a Sean Pull. But as I translate every word of the conversation of our young friends, it is no more than fair to mend their little attempts at English. Master Dobbs felt at first decidedly awkward among his cousin's friends. Though most of them had studied English and French, they were shy about attempting to speak either, and he made very funny blunders when he tried to converse in Dutch. He had learned that fro meant wife, and ja, yes, and spoorweg, railway, canals, canals, Stoomboot, steamboat, Opfarbruggen, drawbridges, Burtenplaetsen, country seats, Meinier, mister, Twiegewicht, duel or two fights, Kopa, copper, Zadel, saddle. But he could not make a sentence out of these, nor use the long list of phrases he had learned in his Dutch dialogues. The topics of the latter were fine, but were never alluded to by the boys. Like the poor fellow who had learned in Ollendorf to ask in faultless German, Have you seen my grandmother's red cow? And, when he reached Germany, discovered that he had no occasion to inquire after that interesting animal. Ben found that his book Dutch did not avail him as much as he had hoped. He acquired a hearty contempt for Jan van Gorp a Hollander who wrote a book in Latin to prove that Adam and Eve spoke Dutch, and he smiled a knowing smile when his uncle Poot assured him that Dutch had great likeness mid English, but it was much better language, much better. However, the fun of skating glides over all barriers of speech. Through this, Ben soon felt that he knew the boys well, and when Jacob, with a sprinkling of French and English for Ben's benefit, told of a grand project they had planned, his cousin could now and then put in a ya ja or a nod in quite a familiar way. The project was a grand one, and there was to be a fine opportunity for carrying it out, for, besides the allotted holiday of the festival of St. Nicholas, four extra days were to be allowed for a general cleaning of the schoolhouse. 
Jacob and Ben had obtained permission to go on a long skating journey, no less a one than from Bruck to The Hague, the capital of Holland, a distance of nearly fifty miles. Throughout this narrative distances are given according to our standard, the English statute mile of 5,280 feet. The Dutch mile is more than four times as long as ours. "'And now, boys,' added Jacob, who had told the plan, "'who will go with us?' "'I will, I will,' cried the boys eagerly. "'And so will I,' ventured little Wustenwalbert. "'Ha, ha, ha,' laughed Jacob, holding his fat sides and shaking his puffy cheeks. "'You go, such a little fellow as you. Why, youngster, you haven't left off your pads yet.' Now in Holland very young children wear a thin padded cushion around their heads, surmounted with a framework of whalebone and ribbon, to protect them in case of a fall, and it is the dividing line between babyhood and childhood when they leave it off. Voost had arrived at this dignity several years before. Consequently, Jacob's insult was rather too great for endurance. "'Look out what you say!' he squeaked. Lucky for you when you can leave off your pads, you're padded all over. Ha 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 roared all the boys, except Master Dobbs, who could not understand. Ha 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 and the good natured Jacob laughed more than any. It ish my fat, yaw, he say I bees pad mit fat, he explained to Ben. So a vote was passed unanimously in favor of allowing the now popular Voost to join the party, if his parents would consent. "'Good night!' sang out the happy youngster, skating homeward with all his might. "'Good night!' "'We can stop at Haarlem, Jacob, and show your cousin the big organ,' said Peter van Holp eagerly. "'And at Leiden, too, where there's no end to the sights, and spend a day and night at The Hague, for my married sister, who lives there, will be delighted to see us, and the next morning we can start for home.' "'All right,' responded Jacob, who was not much of a talker. Ludwig had been regarding his brother with enthusiastic admiration. "'Hurrah for you, Pete! It takes you to make plans. Mother'll be as full of it as we are when we tell her we can take her love direct to Sister van Gend. My, but it's cold,' he added. "'Cold enough to take a fellow's head off his shoulders. We'd better go home.' "'What if it is cold, old tender-skin?' cried Carl, who was busily practising a step he called the double edge. "'Great skating we should have by this time, if it was as warm as it was last December. Don't you know that if it was an extra-cold winter, and an early one into the bargain, we couldn't go?' "'I know that it's an extra-cold night, anyhow,' said Ludwig. "'Phew! I'm going home.' Peter van Holp took out a bulgy gold watch, and, holding it toward the moonlight, as well as his benumbed fingers would permit, cried out, "'Halloo! It's nearly eight o'clock. St. Nicholas is about by this time, and I, for one, want to see the little one stare. Good night!' "'Good night!' cried one and all, and off they started, shouting, singing, and laughing as they flew along. Where were Gretel and Hans?' Ah, how suddenly joy sometimes comes to an end! They had skated about an hour, keeping aloof from the others, quite contented with each other, and Gretel had exclaimed, "'Ah, Hans, how beautiful! How fine! To think that we both have skates! I tell you the stork brought us good luck!' When they heard something, it was a scream, a very faint scream. No one else upon the canal observed it, but Hans knew its meaning too well. Gretel saw him turn white in the moonlight as he busily tore off his skates. "'The father!' he cried. "'He has frightened our mother!' And Gretel ran after him toward the house as rapidly as she could. End of chapter Chapter 9 of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 9. The Festival of St. Nicholas. We all know how, before the Christmas tree began to flourish in the home life of our country, a certain right jolly old elf with eight tiny reindeer used to drive his sleigh-load of toys up to our housetops, and then bounded down the chimney to fill the stockings so hopefully hung by the fireplace. His friends called him Santa Claus, and those who were most intimate ventured to say, Old Nick. It was said that he originally came from Holland. Doubtless he did, but, if so, he certainly, like many other foreigners, changed his ways very much after landing upon our shores. In Holland, St. Nicholas is a veritable saint, and often appears in full costume, with his embroidered robes, glittering with gems and gold, his mitre, his crozier, and his jeweled gloves. Here Santa Claus comes rollicking along, on the 25th of December, our holy Christmas morn. But in Holland, St. Nicholas visits earth on the 5th, a time especially appropriated to him. Early on the morning of the 6th, he distributes his candies, toys, and treasures, then vanishes for a year. Christmas Day is devoted by the Hollanders to church rites and pleasant family visiting. It is on St. Nicholas's Eve that their young people become half wild with joy and expectation. To some of them it is a sorry time, for the saint is very candid, and if any of them have been bad during the past year, he is quite sure to tell them so. Sometimes he gives a birch rod under his arm, and advises the parents to give them scoldings in place of confections, and floggings instead of toys. It was well that the boys hastened to their abodes on that bright winter evening, for in less than an hour afterward the saint made his appearance in half the homes of Holland. He visited the king's palace, and in the self-same moment appeared in Annie Bowman's comfortable home. Probably one of our half-dollars would have purchased all that his saintship left at the peasant bowman's, but a half-dollar's worth will sometimes do for the poor what hundreds of dollars may fail to do for the rich. It makes them happy and grateful, fills them with new peace and love. Hilda von Gleck's little brothers and sisters were in a high state of excitement that night. They had been admitted into the grand parlour. They were dressed in their best, and had been given two cakes apiece at supper. Hilda was as joyous as any. Why not? St. Nicholas would never cross a girl of fourteen from his list, just because she was tall and looked almost like a woman. On the contrary, he would probably exert himself to do honour to such an august-looking damsel. Who could tell? So she sported and laughed and danced as gaily as the youngest, and was the soul of all their merry games. Her father, mother, and grandmother looked on approvingly. So did her grandfather, before he spread his large red handkerchief over his face, leaving only the top of his skull-cap visible. This kerchief was his ensign of sleep. Earlier in the evening all had joined in the fun. In the general hilarity there had seemed to be a difference only in bulk between grandfather and the baby. Indeed, a shade of solemn expectation, now and then flitting across the faces of the younger members, had made them seem rather more thoughtful than their elders. Now the spirit of fun reigned supreme. The very flames danced and capered in the polished grate. A pair of prim candles that had been staring at the astral lamp began to wink at other candles far away in the mirrors. There was a long bell-rope suspended from the ceiling in the corner, made of glass beads netted over a cord nearly as thick as your wrist. It is generally hung in the shadow, and made no sign, but to-night it twinkled from end to end. Its handle of crimson glass sent reckless dashes of red at the papered wall, turning its dainty blue stripes into purple. Passers-by halted to catch the merry laughter floating, through curtain and sash, into the street, then skipped on their way with a startled consciousness that the village was wide awake. At last matters grew so uproarious that the grandsire's red kerchief came down from his face with a jerk. What decent old gentleman could sleep in such a racket? Mynheer van Gleck regarded his children with astonishment. 
The baby even showed symptoms of hysterics. It was high time to attend to business. Madame suggested that if they wished to see the good St. Nicholas, they should sing the same loving invitation that had brought him the year before. The baby stared and thrust his fist into his mouth as Mynheer put him down upon the floor. Soon he sat erect and looked with a sweet scowl at the company. With his lace and embroideries and his crown of blue ribbons and whalebone, for he was not quite past the tumbling age, he looked like the king of the babies. The other children, each holding a pretty willow basket, formed a ring at once, and moved slowly around the little fellow, lifting their eyes, for the saint to whom they were about to address themselves was yet in mysterious quarters. Madame commenced playing softly upon the piano. Soon the voices rose, gentle, youthful voices, rendered all the sweeter for their tremor. "'Welcome, friend, St. Nicholas, welcome. Bring no rod for us to-night. While our voices bid thee welcome, every heart with joy is light. Tell us every fault and failing, we will bear thy keenest railing. So we sing, so we sing, thou shalt tell us everything. Welcome, friend, St. Nicholas, welcome, welcome to this merry band. Happy children greet thee, welcome, thou art gladdening all the land. Fill each empty hand and basket, tis thy little ones who ask it. So we sing, so we sing, thou wilt bring us everything. During the chorus sundry glances, half in eagerness, half in dread, had been cast toward the polished folding doors. Now a loud knocking was heard. The circle was broken in an instant. Some of the little ones, with a strange mixture of fear and delight, pressed against their mother's knee. Grandfather bent forward with his chin resting upon his hand. Grandmother lifted her spectacles. Mynheer van Gleck, seated by the fireplace, slowly drew his meerschaum from his mouth while Hilda and the other children settled themselves beside him in an expectant group. The knocking was heard again. "'Come in,' said Madame softly. The door slowly opened and St. Nicholas, in full array, stood before them. You could have heard a pin drop. Soon he spoke. What a mysterious majesty in his voice! What kindliness in his tones! Karl von Gleck, I am pleased to greet thee, and thy honoured Frau Catherine, and thy son and his good Frau Annie. Children, I greet ye all. Hendrik, Hilda, Broom, Katie, Hudgens, and Lucretia, and thy cousins, Wolfert, Diedrich, Macon, Voost, and Katrina. Good children ye have been, in the main, since I last accosted ye. Diedrich was rude at the Harlem Fair last fall, but he has tried to atone for it since. Macon has failed of late in her lessons, and too many sweets and trifles have gone to her lips and too few stifers to her charity-box. Dietrich, I trust, will be a polite, manly boy for the future, and Macon will endeavour to shine as a student. Let her remember, too, that economy and thrift are needed in the foundation of a worthy and generous life. Little Katie has been cruel to the cat more than once. St. Nicholas can hear the cat cry when his tail is pulled. I will forgive her if she will remember from this hour that the smallest dumb creatures have feelings and must not be abused. As Katie burst into a frightened cry, the saint graciously remained silent until she was soothed. Master Broom, he resumed, I warn thee that the boys who are in the habit of putting snuff upon the footstove of the schoolmistress may one day be discovered and receive a flogging. Master Broom coloured, and stared in great astonishment. But thou art such an excellent scholar, I shall make thee no further reproof. Thou, Hendrick, didst distinguish thyself in the archery match last spring, and hit the duel, bull's-eye, though the bird was swung before it to unsteady thine eye. I give thee credit for excelling in manly sport and exercise, though I must not unduly 
countenance thy boat-racing, since it leaves thee little time for thy proper studies. Lucretia and Hilda shall have a blessed sleep to-night. The consciousness of kindness to the poor, devotion in their souls, and cheerful, hearty obedience to household rule will render them happy. With one and all I avow myself well content. Goodness, industry, benevolence, and thrift have prevailed in your midst. Therefore, my blessing upon you, and may the new year find all treading the paths of obedience, wisdom, and love. Tomorrow you shall find more substantial proofs that I have been in your midst. Farewell. With these words came a great shower of sugar-plums upon a linen sheet spread out in front of the doors. A general scramble followed. The children fairly tumbled over each other in their eagerness to fill their baskets. Madame cautiously held the baby down in their midst, till the chubby little fists were filled. Then the bravest of the youngsters sprang up and burst open the closed doors. In vain they peered into the mysterious apartment. St. Nicholas was nowhere to be seen. Soon there was a general rush to another room, where stood a table, covered with the finest and whitest of linen damask. Each child, in a flutter of excitement, laid a shoe upon it. The door was then carefully locked, and its key hidden in the mother's bedroom. Next followed good-night kisses, a grand family procession to the upper floor, merry farewells at bedroom doors, and silence at last reigned in the Von Gleck mansion. Early the next morning the door was solemnly unlocked, and opened in the presence of the assembled household, when, lo, a sight appeared, proving St. Nicholas to be a saint of his word. Every shoe was filled to overflowing, and beside each stood many a colored pile. The table was heavy with its load of presents, candies, toys, trinkets, books, and other articles. Everyone had gifts, from the grandfather down to the baby. Little Katie clapped her hands with glee, and vowed inwardly that the cat should never know another moment's grief. Hendrick capered about the room, flourishing a superb bow and arrows over his head. Hilda laughed with delight as she opened a crimson box and drew forth its glittering contents. The rest chuckled and said, "'Oh!' and "'Ah!' over their treasures, very much as we did here in America on last Christmas Day." With her glittering necklace in her hands, and a pile of books in her arms, Hilda stole toward her parents and held up her beaming face for a kiss. There was such an earnest, tender look in her bright eyes that her mother breathed a blessing as she leaned over her. "'I am delighted with this book. Thank you, father,' she said, touching the top one with her chin. "'I shall read it all day long.' "'Aye, sweetheart.' said mynheer. You cannot do better. There is no one like Father Katz. If my daughter learns his moral emblems by heart, the mother and I may keep silent. The work you have there is the emblems, his best work. You will find it enriched with rare engravings from Van de Ven. Considering that the back of the book was turned away, mynheer certainly showed a surprising familiarity with an unopened volume, presented by St. Nicholas. It was strange, too, that the saint should have found certain things made by the elder children, and had actually placed them upon the table, labelled with parents' and grandparents' names. But all were too much absorbed in happiness to notice slight inconsistencies. Hilda saw, on her father's face, the rapt expression he always wore when he spoke of Jacob Katz. So she put her arm full of books upon the table, and resigned herself to listen. Old Father Katz, my child, was a great poet, not a writer of plays like the Englishman, Shakespeare, who lived in his time. I have read them in the German, and very good they are, very, very good, but not like Father Katz. Katz sees no daggers in the air. He has no white women falling in love with dusky moors. No young fools sighing to be a lady's glove. No crazy princes mistaking respectable old gentlemen for rats. No, no, he writes only sense. It is great wisdom in little bundles, a bundle for every day of your life. You can guide a state with Cat's poems, 
and you can put a little baby to sleep with his pretty songs. He was one of the greatest men of Holland. When I take you to The Hague I will show you the Klusterkerk where he lies buried. There was a man for you to study, my sons. He was good through and through. What did he say? O oh Lord, let me obtain this from thee, to live with patience, and to die with pleasure. O Hera, lat me dat von uwen hant verwerven, te leven mat schidolt, and mat vermacht te sterven. Did patience mean folding his hands? No, he was a lawyer, statesman, ambassador, farmer, philosopher, historian, and poet. He was keeper of the great seal of Holland. He was a... Bah! There is too much noise here. I cannot talk. And Mynheer, looking with great astonishment into the bowl of his meerschaum, for it had gone out, nodded to his frau and left the apartment in great haste. The fact is, his discourse had been accompanied throughout with a subdued chorus of barking dogs, squeaking cats, and bleeding lambs, to say nothing of a noisy ivory cricket that the baby was whirling with infinite delight. At the last, little Hudgens, taking advantage of the increasing loudness of Mynheer's tones, had ventured a blast on his new trumpet, and Wolfert had hastily attempted an accompaniment on the drum. This had brought matters to a crisis, and it was good for the little creatures that it had. The saint had left no ticket for them to attend a lecture on Jacob Katz. It was not an appointed part of the ceremonies. Therefore, when the youngsters saw that the mother looked neither frightened nor offended, they gathered new courage. The grand chorus rose triumphant, and frolic and joy reigned supreme. Good St. Nicholas! For the sake of the young Hollanders, I, for one, am willing to acknowledge him and defend his reality against all unbelievers. Karl Schummel was quite busy during that day, assuring little children, confidentially, that not St. Nicholas but their own fathers and mothers had produced the oracle and loaded the tables. But we know better than that. And yet if this were a saint, why did he not visit the Brinker cottage that night? Why was that one home, so dark and sorrowful, passed by? End of chapter Chapter 10 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 10. What the Boys Saw and Did in Amsterdam. "'Are we all here?' cried Peter, in high glee, as the party assembled upon the canal early the next morning, equipped for their skating journey. Let me see. As Jacob has made me captain, I must call the roll. Carl Schummel, you here? Ya. Ja. Jacob Boot? Ya. Ja. Benjamin Dobbs? Ya. Ja. Lambert von Monen? Ya. Ja. That's lucky. Couldn't get on without you, as you're the only one who can speak English. Ludwig von Hope. Ja. Wusten Walbert Schimmelpenink. No answer. Ah, the little rogue has been kept at home. Now, boys, it's just eight o'clock, glorious weather, and the eye is as firm as a rock. We'll be at Amsterdam in thirty minutes. One, two, three, start! True enough, in less than half an hour they had crossed a dike of solid masonry, and were in the very heart of the great metropolis of the Netherlands, a walled city of ninety-five islands and nearly two hundred bridges. Although Ben had been there twice since his arrival in Holland, he saw much to excite wonder. But his Dutch comrades, having lived nearby all their lives, considered it the most matter-of-course place in the world. 
everything interested Ben, the tall houses with their forked chimneys and gable ends facing the street, the merchants' ware rooms perched high up under the roofs of their dwellings, with long arm-like cranes hoisting and lowering goods past the household windows, the grand public buildings erected upon wooden piles driven deep into the marshy ground, the narrow streets, the canals crossing the city everywhere, the bridges, the locks, the various costumes, and, strangest of all, shops and dwellings crouching close to the fronts of the churches, sending their long, disproportionate chimneys far upward along the sacred walls. If he looked up, he saw tall, leaning houses, seeming to pierce the sky with their shining roofs. If he looked down, there was the queer street, without crossing or curb, nothing to separate the cobblestone pavement from the footpath of brick. And if he rested his eyes halfway, he saw complicated little mirrors, spiuanen, fastened upon the outside of nearly every window, arranged that the inmates of the houses could observe all that was going on in the street, or inspect whoever might be knocking at the door, without being seen themselves. Sometimes a dog-cart, heaped with wooden ware, passed him, then a donkey bearing a pair of panniers filled with crockery or glass, then a sled driven over the bare cobblestones, the runners kept greased with the dripping oil rag so that it might run easily, and then, perhaps, a showy but clumsy family carriage, drawn by the brownest of Flanders horses, swinging the whitest of snowy tails. The city was in full festival array. Every shop was gorgeous in honor of St. Nicholas. Captain Peter was forced, more than once, to order his men away from the tempting show-windows, where everything that is, has been, or can be, thought of in the way of toys, was displayed. Holland is famous for this branch of manufacture. Every possible thing is copied in miniature for the benefit of the little ones, the intricate mechanical toys that a Dutch youngster tumbles about in stolid unconcern would create a stir in our patent office. Ben laughed outright at some of the mimic fishing boats. They were so heavy and stumpy, so like the queer craft that he had seen about Rotterdam. The tiny Trekskoyten, however, only a foot or two long, and fitted out complete, made his heart ache. He so longed to buy one at once for his little brother in England. He had no money to spare, for with true Dutch prudence the party had agreed to take with them merely the sum required for each boy's expenses, and to consign the purse to Peter for safekeeping. Consequently Master Ben concluded to devote all his energies to sightseeing, and to think as seldom as possible of little Robbie. He made a hasty call at the marine school, and envied the sailor students their full-rigged brig, and their sleeping berths swung over their trunks or lockers. He peeped into the Jews' quarter of the city, where the rich diamond-cutters and squalid old clothesmen dwell, and wisely resolved to keep away from it. He also enjoyed hasty glimpses of the four principal avenues of Amsterdam, the Prinzengracht. Kaiser's Kracht, Herring Kracht, and Single. These are semicircular in form, and the first three average more than two miles in length. A canal runs through the center of each, with a well-paved road on either side, lined with stately buildings. Rows of naked elms, bordering the canal, cast a network of shadows over its frozen surface, and everything was so clean and bright that Ben told Lambert, it seemed to him like petrified neatness. Fortunately the weather was cold enough to put a stop to the usual street flooding and window washing, or our young excursionists might have been drenched more than once. Sweeping, mopping, and scrubbing form a passion with Dutch housewives, and to soil their spotless mansions is considered scarcely less than a crime. Everywhere a hearty contempt is felt for those who neglect to rub the soles of their shoes to a polish before crossing the door-sill, 
and in certain places visitors are expected to remove their heavy shoes before entering. Sir William Temple, in his memoirs of What Passed in Christendom from 1672 to 1679, tells a story of a pompous magistrate going to visit a lady of Amsterdam. A stout Holland lass opened the door and told him in a breath that the lady was at home and that his shoes were not very clean. Without another word she took the astonished man up by both arms, threw him across her back, carried him through two rooms, set him down at the bottom of the stairs, seized a pair of slippers that stood there and put them upon his feet. Then and not until then she spoke, telling him that his mistress was on the floor above and that he might go up. While Ben was skating with his friends upon the crowded canals of the city, he found it difficult to believe that the sleepy Dutchman he saw around him, smoking their pipes so leisurely and looking as though their hats might be knocked off their heads without their making any resistance, were capable of those outbreaks that had taken place in Holland, that they were really fellow-countrymen of the brave, devoted heroes of whom he had read in Dutch history. As his party skimmed lightly along, he told Van Mernen of a burial riot which in 1696 had occurred in that very city, where the women and children turned out, as well as the men, and formed mock funeral processions through the town, to show the burgomasters that certain new regulations, with regard to burying the dead, would not be acceded to. How at last they grew so unmanageable and threatened so much damage to the city that the burgomasters were glad to recall the offensive law. "'There's the corner,' said Jacob, pointing to some large buildings, where, about fifteen years ago, the great corn-houses sank down in the mud. They were strong affairs and set up on good piles, but they had over seven million pounds of corn in them, and that was too much.' It was a long story for Jacob to tell, and he stopped to rest. "'How do you know that there were seven million pounds in them?' asked Carl sharply. "'You were in your swaddling clothes then.' "'My father knows all about it,' was Jacob's suggestive reply. Rousing himself with an effort, he continued, "'Ben likes pictures. Show him some.' "'All right,' said the captain." "'If we had time, Benjamin,' said Lambert von Monen, in English, "'I should like to take you to the city hall, or Stadthurst. "'There are building piles for you. "'It is built on nearly fourteen thousand of them, "'driven seventy feet into the ground. "'But what I wish you to see there is the big picture of von Speyk "'blowing up his ship. Great picture!' "'Von who?' asked Ben." Van Speyk. Don't you remember? He was in the height of an engagement with the Belgians, and when he found that they had the better of him and would capture his ship, he blew it up, and himself, too, rather than yield to the enemy. Wasn't that Van Tromf? Oh, no. Van Tromf was another brave fellow. They've a monument to him down at Dallashaven, the place where the pilgrims took ship for America. "'Well, what about Van Tromf? "'He was a great Dutch admiral, wasn't he?' "'Yes, he was in more than thirty sea fights. "'He beat the Spanish fleet and an English one, "'and then fastened a broom to his masthead "'to show that he had swept the English from the sea. "'Takes the Dutch to beat, my boy.' "'Hold up!' cried Ben. "'Broom or no broom, the English conquered him at last. "'I remember all about it now.' He was killed somewhere on the Dutch coast, in an engagement in which the English fleet was victorious. Too bad, he added maliciously, wasn't it? Ahem! Where are we? exclaimed Lambert, changing the subject. Halloo! The others are way ahead of us, all but Jacob. Phew! How fat he is! He'll break down before we're halfway. Ben, of course, enjoyed skating beside Lambert who, though a staunch Hollander, had been educated near London and could speak English as fluently as Dutch, 
but he was not sorry when Captain von Holp called out, Skates off! There's the museum! It was open, and there was no charge on that day for admission. In they went, shuffling, as boys will when they have a chance just to hear the sound of their shoes on the polished floor. This museum is in fact a picture gallery where some of the finest works of the Dutch masters are to be seen, besides nearly two hundred portfolios of rare engravings. Ben noticed at once that some of the pictures were hung on panels fastened to the wall with hinges. These could be swung forward like a window shutter, thus enabling the subject to be seen in the best light. The plan served them well in viewing a small group by Gérard Do, called the Evening School, enabling them to observe its exquisite finish and the wonderful way in which the picture seemed to be lit through its own windows. Peter pointed out the beauties of another picture by Do, called The Hermit, and he also told them some interesting anecdotes of the artist, who was born in Leyden in 1613. Three days painting a broom-handle, echoed Carl in astonishment, while the captain was giving some instances of Doe's extreme slowness of execution. Yes, sir, three days, and it is said that he spent five in finishing one hand in a lady's portrait. You see how very bright and minute everything is in this picture. His unfinished works were kept carefully covered and his painting materials were put away in airtight boxes as soon as he had finished using them for the day. According to all accounts, the studio itself must have been as close as a bandbox. The artist always entered it on tiptoe, besides sitting still, before he commenced work, until the slight dust caused by his entrance had settled. I have read somewhere that his paintings are improved by being viewed through a magnifying glass. He strained his eyes so badly with the extra finishing that he was forced to wear spectacles before he was thirty. At forty he could scarcely see to paint, and he couldn't find a pair of glasses anywhere that would help his sight. At last a poor old German woman asked him to try hers. They suited him exactly, and enabled him to go on painting as well as ever. Humph! <laughs> exclaimed Ludwig indignantly. That was high. What did she do without them, I wonder? Oh, said Peter, laughing, likely she had another pair. At any rate she insisted upon his taking them. He was so grateful that he painted a picture of the spectacles for her, case and all, and she sold it to a burgomaster for a yearly allowance that made her comfortable for the rest of her days. Boys! called Lambert in a loud whisper. Come look at this bear hunt! It was a fine painting by Paul Putter, a Dutch artist of the seventeenth century, who produced excellent works before he was sixteen years old. The boys admired it because the subject pleased them. They passed carelessly by the masterpieces of Rembrandt and van der Helst, and went into raptures over an ugly picture by van der Venne, representing a sea-fight between the Dutch and English. They also stood spellbound before a painting of two little urchins, one of whom was taking soup and the other eating an egg. The principal merit in this work was that the young egg-eater had kindly slobbered his face with the yolk for their entertainment. An excellent representation of the Feast of St. Nicholas next had the honor of attracting them. Look, Van Monen, said Ben de Lambert. Could anything be better than this youngster's face? He looks as if he knows he deserves a whipping, but hopes St. Nicholas may not have found him out. That's the kind of painting I like, something that tells a story. Come, boys, cried the captain. Ten o'clock, time we were off. They hastened to the canal. Skates on. Are you ready? One, two... Hallo, where's Poot? Sure enough, where was Poot? A square opening had just been cut in the ice not ten yards off. Peter observed it, and without a word skated rapidly towards it. All the others followed, of course. Peter looked in. They all looked in. 
then stared anxiously at each other. Poot! peering into the hole again. All was still. The black water gave no sign. It was already glazing on top. Van Monen turned mysteriously to Ben. Didn't he have a fit once? My goodness, yes, answered Ben in a great fright. Then depend upon it, he's been taken with one in the museum. The boys caught his meaning. Every skate was off in a twinkling. Peter had the presence of mind to scoop up a capful of water from the hole, and off they scampered to the rescue. Alas! They did indeed find poor Jacob in a fit, but it was a fit of sleepiness. There he lay in a recess of the gallery, snoring like a trooper. The chorus of laughter that followed this discovery brought an angry official to the spot. "'What now? None of this racket! Here, you beer-barrel, wake up!' and Master Jacob received a very unceremonious shaking. As soon as Peter saw that Jacob's condition was not serious, he hastened to the street to empty his unfortunate cap. While he was stuffing in his handkerchief to prevent the already frozen crown from touching his head, the rest of the boys came down, dragging the bewildered and indignant Jacob in their midst. The order to start was again given. Master Poot was wide awake at last. The ice was a little rough and broken just there, but every boy was in high spirits. "'Shall we go on by the canal, or the river?' asked Peter. "'Oh, the river, by all means,' said Carl. "'It will be such fun. They say it is perfect skating all the way, but it's much farther.' Jacob Poot instantly became interested. "'I vote for the canal!' he cried. "'Well, the canal it shall be,' responded the captain, "'if all are agreed.' "'Agreed,' they echoed, in rather a disappointed tone, and Captain Peter led the way. "'All right, come on. We can reach Harlem in an hour.' End of chapter Chapter Eleven of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Eleven. Big Manias and Little Oddities While skating along at full speed, they heard the cars from Amsterdam coming close behind them. "'Halloo!' cried Ludwig, glancing toward the rail-track. "'Who can't beat a locomotive? Let's give it a race!' The whistles screamed at the very idea. So did the boys, and at it they went. For an instant the boys were ahead, hurrahing with all their might. Only for an instant, but even that was something. Their excitement over, they began to travel more leisurely and indulge in conversation and frolic. Sometimes they stopped to exchange a word with the guards who were stationed at certain distances along the canal. These men, in winter, attend to keeping the surface free from obstruction and garbage. After a snowstorm they are expected to sweep the feathery coating away before it hardens into a marble, pretty to look at, but very unwelcome to skaters. Now and then the boys so far forgot their dignity as to clamber among the ice-bound canal boats crowded together in a widened harbor off the canal, but the watchful guards would soon spy them out and order them down with a growl. Nothing could be straighter than the canal upon which our party were skating, and nothing straighter than the long rows of willow trees that stood, bare and wispy, along the bank. On the opposite side, lifted high above the surrounding country, lay the carriage road on top of the great dike built to keep the Harlem Lake within bounds, stretching out far in the distance until it became lost in a point was the glassy canal with its many skaters, its brown-winged ice-boats, its push-chairs, and its queer little sleds light as cork, 
flying over the ice by means of iron-pronged sticks in the hands of the riders. Ben was in ecstasy with the scene. Ludwig van Holp had been thinking how strange it was that the English boy should know so much of Holland. According to Lambert's account, he knew more about it than the Dutch did. This did not quite please our young Hollander. Suddenly he thought of something that he believed would make the Sean Poul open his eyes. He drew near Lambert with a triumphant, "'Tell him about the tulips!' Ben caught the word tulpin. "'Oh, yes,' said he eagerly in English. "'The tulip mania. Are you speaking of that? I have often heard it mentioned, but know very little about it. It reached its height in Amsterdam, didn't it?' Ludwig moaned. The words were hard to understand, but there was no mistaking the enlightened expression on Ben's face. Lambert, happily, was quite unconscious of his young countryman's distress as he replied, "'Yes, here and in Haarlem, principally. But the excitement ran high all over Holland, and in England too, for that matter.' "'Hardly in England. Although the tulip mania did not prevail in England as in Holland, the flower soon became an object of speculation and brought very large prices.' In 1636 tulips were publicly sold on the Exchange of London. Even as late as 1800 a common price was fifteen guineas for one bulb. Ben did not know that in his own day a single tulip plant, called the Fanny Kemble, had been sold in London for more than seventy guineas. Mr. Mackay, in his Memoirs of Popular Delusions, tells a funny story of an English botanist who happened to see a tulip bulb lying in the conservatory of a wealthy Dutchman. Ignorant of its value, he took out his penknife and, cutting the bulb in two, became very much interested in his investigations. Suddenly the owner appeared, and pouncing furiously upon him, asked if he knew what he was doing. "'Peeling a most extraordinary onion!' replied the philosopher. "'Hundred thousand duivel!' shouted the Dutchman. "'It's an Admiral van der Eyck!' "'Thank you,' replied the traveller, immediately writing the name in his notebook. "'Pray, are these very common in your country?' "'Death and the duivel!' screamed the Dutchman. "'Come before the syndic, and you shall see!' In spite of his struggles, the poor investigator, followed by an indignant mob, was taken through the streets to a magistrate. Soon he learned to his dismay that he had destroyed a bulb worth four thousand florins, or sixteen hundred dollars. He was lodged in prison until securities could be procured for the payment of the sum. "'I think,' said Ben, "'but I am not sure, as I was not there at the time.' "'Ha! <laughs> ha! That's true! unless you are over two hundred years old. Well, I tell you, sir, there never was anything like it before nor since. Why, persons were so crazy after tulip bulbs in those days that they paid their weight in gold for them. What? The weight of a man? cried Ben, showing such astonishment in his eyes that Ludwig fairly capered. No, no, the weight of a bulb! The first tulip was sent here from Constantinople about the year 1560. It was so much admired that the rich people of Amsterdam sent to Turkey for more. From that time they grew to be the rage, and it lasted for years. Single roots brought from one to four thousand florins, and one bulb, the Semper Augustus, brought fifty-five hundred. "'That's more than four hundred guineas of our money,' interposed Ben. "'Yes, and I know I'm right, for I read it in a translation from Beckman only day before yesterday. Well, sir, it was great. Everyone speculated in tulips, even bargemen and ragwomen and chimney sweeps. The richest merchants were not ashamed to share the excitement.' People bought bulbs and sold them again at a tremendous profit without ever seeing them. It grew into a kind of gambling. Some became rich by it in a few days, and some lost everything they had. Land, houses, cattle, 
and even clothing went for tulips when people had no ready money. Ladies sold their jewels and finery to enable them to join in the fun. Nothing else was thought of. At last the States General interfered. People began to see what dunces they were making of themselves, and down went the price of tulips. Old tulip debts couldn't be collected. Creditors went to law, and the law turned its back upon them. Debts made in gambling were not binding, it said. Then there was a time. Thousands of rich speculators were reduced to beggary in an hour. As old Beckman says, the bubble was burst at last. "'Yes, and a big bubble it was,' said Ben, who had listened with great interest. "'By the way, did you know that the name Tulip came from a Turkish word signifying turban?' "'I had forgotten that,' answered Lombard. "'But it's a capital idea. Just fancy a party of Turks in full headgear squatted upon a lawn. Perfect tulip bed. Ha, 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 ha! Capital idea!' There, groaned Ludwig to himself, he's been telling Lambert something wonderful about tulips. I knew it. The fact is, continued Lambert, you can conjure up quite a human picture of a tulip bed in bloom, especially when it is nodding and bobbing in the wind. Did you ever notice it? Not I. It strikes me, von Monen, that you Hollanders are prodigiously fond of the flower to this day. "'Certainly. You can't have a garden without them. Prettiest flower that grows, I think. My uncle has a magnificent bed of the finest varieties at his summer-house on the other side of Amsterdam.' "'I thought your uncle lived in the city?' "'So he does. But his summer-house, or pavilion, is a few miles off. He has another one built out over the river. We passed near it when we entered the city.' Everybody in Amsterdam has a pavilion somewhere, if he can. "'Do they ever live there?' asked Ben. "'Bless you, no. They are small affairs, suitable only to spend a few hours in on summer afternoons. There are some beautiful ones on the southern end of the Harlem Lake. Now that they've commenced to drain it into polders, it will spoil that fun. By the way, we've passed some red-roofed ones since we left home.' You noticed them, I suppose, with their little bridges and ponds and gardens, and their mottoes over the doorway?" Ben nodded. "'They make but little show now,' continued Lombard. "'But in warm weather they are delightful. After the willows sprout, Uncle goes to a summer-house every afternoon. He dozes and smokes. Aunt knits, with her feet perched upon a foot-stove, never mind how hot the day. My cousin Rika and the other girls fish in the lake from the windows, or chat with their friends rowing by, and the youngsters tumble about or hang upon the little bridges over the ditch. Then they have coffee and cakes, beside a great bunch of water lilies on the table. It's very fine, I can tell you. Only, between ourselves, though I was born here, I shall never fancy the odor of stagnant water that hangs about most of the summer-houses. Nearly every one you see is built over a ditch. Probably I feel it more, from having lived so long in England. "'Perhaps I shall notice it, too,' said Ben, "'if a thaw comes. The early winter has covered up the fragrant waters for my benefit. Much obliged to it. Holland without this glorious skating wouldn't be the same thing at all.' "'How very different you are from the poots!' exclaimed Lumbert who had been listening in a sort of brown study. "'And yet you are cousins. I cannot understand it.' "'We are cousins, or rather we have always considered ourselves such, but the relationship is not very close. Our grandmothers were half-sisters. My side of the family is entirely English, while he is entirely Dutch. Old great-grandfather Poot married twice, you see, and I am a descendant of his English wife. I like Jacob, though, better than half of my English cousins put together. He is the truest-hearted, best-natured boy I ever knew. Strange as you may think it, my father became accidentally acquainted with Jacob's father while on a business visit to Rotterdam. They soon talked over their relationship. 
in French, by the way, and they have corresponded in the language ever since. Queer things come about in this world. My sister Jenny would open her eyes at some of Aunt Poot's ways. Aunt is a thorough lady, but no different from mother, and the house, too, and furniture and way of living, everything is different. "'Of course,' assented Lambert, complacently, as if to say you could scarcely expect such general perfection anywhere else than in Holland. "'But you will have all the more to tell Jenny when you go back.' "'Yes, indeed. I can say one thing. If cleanliness is, as they claim, next to godliness, Brook is safe. It is the cleanest place I ever saw in my life. Why, my Aunt Poot, rich as she is, scrubs half the time, and her house looks as if it were varnished all over. I wrote to mother yesterday that I could see my double always with me, feet to feet, in the polished floor of the dining-room. Your double! That word puzzles me. What do you mean? Oh, my reflection, my apparition. Ben Dobbs, number two. Ah, I see, exclaimed Van Moenen. Have you ever been in your Aunt Poot's grand parlor? Ben laughed. Only once, and that was on the day of my arrival. Jacob says I shall have no chance of entering it again until the time of his sister Canaw's wedding, the week after Christmas. Father has consented that I shall remain to witness the great event. Every Saturday Aunt Poot and her fat Kate go into that parlor and sweep and polish and scrub. Then it is darkened and closed until Saturday comes again. Not a soul enters it in the meantime. But the schoonmachen, as she calls it, must be done just the same. That is nothing. Every parlor in Brook meets with the same treatment, said Lombard. What do you think of those moving figures in her neighbor's garden? Oh, they're well enough. The swans must seem really alive gliding about the pond in summer but that nodding mandarin in the corner, under the chestnut trees, is ridiculous, only fit for children to laugh at. And then the stiff garden patches, and the trees all trimmed and painted. Excuse me, Van Monen, but I shall never learn to admire Dutch taste. It will take time, answered Lumbert condescendingly, but you are sure to agree with it at last. I saw much to admire in England and I hope I shall be sent back with you to study at Oxford. But, take everything together, I like Holland best. "'Of course you do,' said Ben, in a tone of hearty approval. "'You wouldn't be a good Hollander if you didn't. Nothing like loving one's country. It is strange, though, to have such a warm feeling for such a cold place. If we were not exercising all the time, we should freeze outright.' Lumbert laughed. That's your English blood, Benjamin. I'm not cold. And look at the skaters here on the canal. They're red as roses and happy as lords. Halloo, good Captain Van Holp, called out Lumbert in Dutch. What say you to stopping at yonder farmhouse and warming our toes? Who's cold? asked Peter, turning around. Benjamin Dobbs. Benjamin Dobbs shall be warmed and the party was brought to a halt. End of chapter Chapter 12 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simsville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 12. On the Way to Harlem. On approaching the door of the farmhouse, the boys suddenly found themselves in the midst of a lively domestic scene. A burly Dutchman came rushing out, closely followed by his dear Frau, and she was beating him smartly with her long-handled warming-pan. The expression on her face gave our boys so little promise of a kind reception that they prudently resolved to carry their toes elsewhere to be warmed. 
The next cottage proved to be more inviting. Its low roof of bright red tiles extended over the cow stable that, clean as could be, nestled close to the main building. A neat, peaceful-looking old woman sat at one window, knitting. At the other could be discerned part of the profile of a fat figure that, pipe in mouth, sat behind the shining little panes and snowy curtain. In answer to Peter's subdued knock, a fair-haired, rosy-cheeked lass in holiday attire opened the upper half of the green door, which was divided across the middle, and inquired their errand. "'May we enter and warm ourselves, Euphro? asked the captain respectfully. "'Yes, and welcome,' was the reply, as the lower half of the door swung softly towards its mate. Every boy, before entering, rubbed long and faithfully upon the rough mat, and each made his best bow to the old lady and gentleman at the window. Ben was half inclined to think that these personages were automata, like the moving figures in the garden at Brook, for they both nodded their heads slowly, in precisely the same way, and both went on with their employment as steadily and stiffly as though they worked by machinery. The old man puffed, puffed, and his frau clicked her knitting needles as if regulated by internal cogwheels. Even the real smoke issuing from the motionless pipe gave no convincing proof that they were human. But the rosy-cheeked maiden, ah, how she bustled about! How she gave the boys polished high-backed chairs to sit upon! How she made the fire blaze as if it were inspired! how she made Jacob Poot almost weep for joy by bringing forth a great square of gingerbread and a stone jug of sour wine, how she laughed and nodded as the boys ate like wild animals on good behavior, and how blank she looked when Ben politely but firmly refused to take any black bread and sauerkraut, how she pulled off Jacob's mitten, which was torn at the thumb, and mended it before his eyes, biting off the thread with her white teeth, and saying, Now it will be warmer, as she bit, and finally how she shook hands with every boy in turn, and, throwing a deprecating glance at the female automaton, insisted upon filling their pockets with gingerbread. All this time the knitting needles clicked on, and the pipe never missed a puff. When the boys were fairly on their way again, they came in sight of the Zwanenburg Castle with its massive stone front, and its gateway towers, each surmounted with a sculptured swan. Hafweg! Halfway. Boys, said Peter, off with your skates. You see, explained Lambert to his companions, the eye and the Harlem Lake meeting here make it rather troublesome. The river is five feet higher than the land, so we must have everything strong in the way of dikes and sluice gates, or there would be wet work at once. The sluice arrangements are supposed to be something extra. We will walk over them, and you shall see enough to make you open your eyes. The spring water of the lake, they say, has the most wonderful bleaching powers of any in the world. All the great Harlem bleacheries use it. I can't say much upon that subject, but I can tell you one thing from personal experience. What is that? Why, the lake is full of the biggest eels you ever saw. I've caught them here, often, perfectly prodigious. I tell you, they're sometimes a match for a fellow. They'd almost wriggle your arm from the socket if you were not on your guard. But you're not interested in eels, I perceive. The castle's a big affair, isn't it? Yes. What do those swans mean? Anything? asked Ben, looking up at the stone gate towers. The swan is held almost in reverence by us Hollanders. These give the building its name. Swanenburg. Swan Castle. That is all I know. This is a very important spot, for it is here that the wise ones hold counsel with regard to dyke matters. The castle was once the residence of the celebrated Christian Brunings. "'What about him?' asked Ben. "'Peter could answer you better than I,' said Lambert, "'if you could only understand each other, or were not such cowards about leaving your mother tongues. But I have often heard my grandfather speak of Brunings. 
He is never tired of telling us of the great engineer, how good he was, and how learned, and how, when he died, the whole country seemed to mourn as for a friend. He belonged to a great many learned societies, and was at the head of the State Department, entrusted with the care of the dikes and other defences against the sea. There is no counting the improvements he made in dikes and sluices and water-mills and all that kind of thing. We Hollanders, you know, consider our great engineers as the highest of public benefactors. Brunings died years ago. They have a monument to his memory in the Cathedral of Haarlem. I have seen his portrait, and I tell you, Ben, he was right noble-looking. No wonder the castle looks so stiff and proud. It is something to have given shelter to such a man." "'Yes, indeed,' said Ben. "'I wonder, Van Monen, whether you or I will ever give any old building a right to feel so proud. Hi-ho! There is a great deal to be done yet in this world, and some of us, who are boys now, will have to do it. Look to your shoe latchet, Van. It's unfastened. End of chapter. Chapter thirteen of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter thirteen A Catastrophe. It was nearly one o'clock when Captain von Holp and his command entered the grand old city of Haarlem. They had skated nearly seventeen miles since morning, and were still as fresh as young eagles. From the youngest, Ludwig von Holp, who was just fourteen, to the eldest, no less a personage than the captain himself, a veteran of seventeen, there was but one opinion, that this was the greatest frolic of their lives. To be sure, Jacob Poot had become rather short of breath during the last mile or two, and perhaps he felt ready for another nap, but there was enough jollity in him yet for a dozen. Even Karl Schummel, who had become very intimate with Ludwig during the excursion, forgot to be ill-natured. As for Peter, he was the happiest of the happy, and had sung and whistled so joyously while skating that the statist passers-by had smiled as they listened. "'Come, boys, it's nearly tiffin' hour,' he said as they neared a coffee-house on the main street. "'We must have something more solid than the pretty maiden's gingerbread.' And the captain plunged his hands into his pockets as if to say, "'There's money enough here to feed an army.' "'Halloo!' cried Lumbert. "'What ails the man?' Peter, pale and staring, was clapping his hands upon his breast and sides. He looked like one suddenly becoming deranged. "'He's sick!' cried Ben. "'No, he's lost something,' said Carl. Peter could only gasp. "'The pocket-book with all our money in it! it it's, it's gone!' For an instant all were too much startled to speak. Carl at last came out with a gruff, "'No sense in letting one fellow have all the money. I said so from the first. Look in your other pocket. I did. It isn't there. Open your under jacket. Peter obeyed mechanically. He even took off his hat and looked into it, then thrust his hand desperately into every pocket. It's gone, boys, he said at last in a hopeless tone. No tiffin for us, nor dinner either. What is to be done? We can't get on without money. If we were in Amsterdam I could get as much as we want, but there is not a man in Haarlem from whom I can borrow a stiver. Doesn't one of you know any one here who would lend us a few guilders?" Each boy looked into five blank faces. Then something like a smile passed around the circle, but it got sadly knotted up when it reached Carl. "'That wouldn't do,' he said crossly. "'I know some people here—rich ones, too.' 
but father would flog me soundly if I borrowed a cent from any one. He has, An honest man need not borrow, written over the gateway of his summer house. Huh, responded Peter, not particularly admiring the sentiment just at that moment. The boys grew desperately hungry at once. It was my fault, said Jacob, in a penitent tone to Ben. I say first, Petter all de boys put zer push into van hope's monish. Nonsense, Jacob, you did it all for the best. Ben said this in such a sprightly tone that the two van hopes and Karl felt sure that he had proposed a plan that would relieve the party at once. What? What? Tell us, van Monen, they cried. He says it is not Jacob's fault that the money is lost, that he did it for the best when he proposed that Van Holp should put all of our money into his purse. Is that all? said Ludwig dismally. He need not have made such a fuss in just saying that. How much money have we lost? Don't you remember? said Peter. We each put in exactly ten guilders. The purse had sixty guilders in it. I am the stupidest fellow in the world. Little Schimmelpenick would have made you a better captain. I could pommel myself for bringing such a disappointment upon you." "'Do it, then,' growled Carl. "'Pooh!' he added. "'We all know that it was an accident, but that doesn't help matters. We must have money, Van Hope, even if you have to sell your wonderful watch.' "'Sell my mother's birthday present? Never! I will sell my coat, my hat, anything but my watch.' "'Come, come,' said Jacob pleasantly. "'We are making too much of this affair. We can go home and start again in a day or two. "'You may be able to get another ten-guilder piece,' said Carl. "'But the rest of us will not find it so easy. If we go home, we stay home, you may depend.' Our captain, whose good nature had not yet forsaken him for a moment, grew indignant. "'Do you think that I will let you suffer for my carelessness?' he exclaimed. "'I have three times sixty guilders in my strong-box at home.' "'Oh, I beg your pardon,' said Carl hastily, adding in a surlier tone, "'Well, I see no better way than to go back hungry.' "'I see a better plan than that,' said the captain. "'What is it?' cried all the boys. "'Why, to make the best of a bad business and go back pleasantly and like men,' said Peter, looking so gallant and handsome as he turned his frank face and clear blue eyes upon them that they caught his spirit. "'Ho for the captain!' they shouted. "'Now, boys, we may as well make up our minds. There is no place like Brook, after all, and that we mean to be there in two hours. Is that agreed to?' "'Agreed!' cried all as they ran to the canal. "'On with your skates! Are you ready? Here, Jacob, let me help you. Now, one, two, three, start!' And the boyish faces that left Harlem at that signal were nearly as bright as those that had entered it with Captain Peter half an hour before. End of chapter Chapter 14 of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or The Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 14 Hans. "'Dunder and Blixen!' cried Carl angrily, before the party had skated twenty yards from the city gates. "'If here isn't that wooden skate ragamuffin in the patched leather breeches! That fellow is everywhere, confound him! We'll be lucky,' he added, in as sneering a tone as he dared to assume, "'if our captain doesn't order us to halt and shake hands with him!' "'Your captain is a terrible fellow,' said Peter pleasantly. But this is a false alarm, Carl. 
I cannot spy your bugbear anywhere among the skaters. Ah, there he is. Why, what is the matter with the lad? Poor Hans. His face was pale, his lips compressed. He skated like one under the effects of a fearful dream. Just as he was passing, Peter hailed him. Good day, Hans Brinker. Hans's countenance brightened at once. Ah, mynheer, is that you? It is well we meet. Just like his impertinence, hissed Karl Schummel, darting scornfully past his companions, who seemed inclined to linger with their captain. I am glad to see you, Hans, responded Peter cheerfully. But you look troubled. Can I serve you? I have a trouble, mynheer, answered Hans, casting down his eyes. Then, lifting them again with almost a happy expression, he added, But it is Hans who can help mynheer van Holp this time. How? asked Peter, making in his blunt Dutch way no attempt to conceal his surprise. By giving you this, mynheer. And Hans held forth the missing purse. Hurrah! shouted the boys, taking their cold hands from their pockets to wave them joyfully in the air. But Peter said, Thank you, Hans Brinker, in a tone that made Hans feel as if the king had knelt to him. The shout of the delighted boys had reached the muffled ears of the fine young gentleman who, under a full pressure of pent-up wrath, was skating toward Amsterdam. A Yankee boy would have wheeled about at once and hastened to satisfy his curiosity, but Carl only halted, and with his back toward his party, wondered what on earth had happened. There he stood, immovable, until, feeling sure that nothing but the prospect of something to eat could have made them hurrah so heartily, he turned and skated slowly towards his excited comrades. In the meantime Peter had drawn Hans aside from the rest. "'How did you know it was my purse?' he asked. "'You paid me three guilders yesterday, mynheer, for making the white wood chain, telling me that I must buy skates.' "'Yes, I remember.' I saw your purse, then. It was of yellow leather. And where did you find it to-day? I left my home this morning, mynheer, in great trouble, and as I skated, I took no heed until I stumbled against some lumber, and while I was rubbing my knee I saw your purse nearly hidden under a log. That place! Ah! I remember now. Just as we were passing it, I pulled my tippet from my pocket, and probably flipped out the purse at the same time. It would have been gone but for you, Hans. Here, pouring out the contents, you must give us the pleasure of dividing the money with you. No, mynheer, answered Hans. He spoke quietly, without pretense or any grace of manner, but Peter, somehow, felt rebuked, and put the silver back without a word. I like that boy, rich or poor, he thought to himself then added aloud, "'May I ask about this trouble of yours, Hans?' "'Ah, mynheer, it is a sad case, but I have waited here too long. I am going to Leyden to see the great Dr. Bokman.' "'Dr. Bokman!' exclaimed Peter in astonishment. "'Yes, mynheer, and I have not a moment to lose. Good day.' "'Stay, I am going that way. Come, my lads, shall we return to Harlem?' Yes, cried the boys eagerly, and off they started. Now, said Peter, drawing near Hans, both skimming the ice so easily and lightly as they skated on together that they seemed scarcely conscious of moving, we are going to stop at Leyden, and if you are going there only with the message to Dr. Bokman, cannot I do the errand for you? The boys may be too tired to skate so far today but I will promise to see him early to-morrow if he is to be found in the city. Ah, my dear, that would be serving me indeed. It is not the distance I dread, but leaving my mother so long. Is she ill? No, my dear, it is the father. You may have heard it, how he has been without wit for many a year, ever since the great Schlossen mill was built, but his body has been well and strong. Last night the mother knelt upon the hearth to blow the peat. It is his only delight to sit and watch the live embers, and she will blow them into a blaze every hour of the day to please him. Before she could stir, he sprang upon her like a giant and held her close to the fire, 
all the time laughing and shaking his head. I was on the canal, but I heard the mother scream and ran to her. The father had never loosened his hold, and her gown was smoking. I tried to deaden the fire, but with one hand he pushed me off. There was no water in the cottage, or I could have done better, and all that time he laughed. Such a terrible laugh, my near, hardly a sound, but all in his face. I tried to pull her away, but that only made it worse. Then it was dreadful, but could I see the mother burn? I beat him, beat him with a stool. He tossed me away. The gown was on fire. I would put it out. I can't remember well after that. I found myself upon the floor, and the mother was praying. It seemed to me that she was in a blaze, and all the while I could hear that laugh. Gretel flew to the closet, and filled a porringer with the food he liked, and put it upon the floor. Then, my dear, he left the mother and crawled to it like a little child. She was not burned, only a part of her clothing. Ah, how kind she was to him all night, watching and tending him. He slept in a high fever, with his hands pressed to his head. The mother says he has done that so much of late, as though he felt pain there. Ah, my near, I did not mean to tell you. If the father was himself, he would not harm even a kitten. For a moment the two boys moved on in silence. It is terrible, said Peter at last. How is he to-day? Very sick, my near. Why go for Dr. Bokman, Hans? There are others in Amsterdam who could help him, perhaps. Bokman is a famous man, sought only by the wealthiest, and they often wait upon him in vain. He promised, my dear, he promised me yesterday to come to the father in a week. But now that the change has come, we cannot wait. We think the poor father is dying. Oh, my dear, you can plead with him to come quick. He will not wait a whole week, and our father dying. The good maester is so kind. So kind! echoed Peter in astonishment. Why, he is known as the crossest man in Holland. He looks so because he has no fat, and his head is busy, but his heart is kind, I know. Tell the maester what I have told you, mynheer, and he will come. I hope so, Hans, with all my heart. You are in haste to turn homeward, I see. Promise me that, should you need a friend, you will go to my mother in Brook. Tell her I bade you see her. And, Hans Brinker, not as a reward, but as a gift, take a few of these guilders." Hans shook his head resolutely. No, no, mynheer, I cannot take it. If I could find work in Brook or at the South Mill, I would be glad, but it is the same story everywhere. Wait until spring. It is well you speak of it, said Peter eagerly, for my father needs help at once. Your pretty chain pleased him much. He said, That boy has a clean cut. He would be good at carving. There is to be a carved portal to our new summer-house, and father will pay well for the job. God is good! cried Hans in sudden delight. Oh, mine ear, that would be too much joy! I have never tried big work, but I can do it. I know I can. Well, tell my father you are the Hans Brinker of whom I spoke. He will be glad to serve you." Hans stared in honest surprise. "'Thank you, mynheer." "'Now, Captain,' shouted Carl, anxious to appear as good-humoured as possible, by way of atonement, "'here we are in the midst of Harlem, and no word from you yet. We await your orders, and we're as hungry as wolves.' Peter made a cheerful answer and turned hurriedly to Hans. "'Come, get something to eat, and I will detain you no longer.' What a quick, wistful look Hans threw upon him! Peter wondered that he had not noticed before that the poor boy was hungry. "'Ah, my dear, even now the mother may need me. The father may be worse. I must not wait. May God care for you!' And nodding hastily, Hans turned his face homeward, and was gone. "'Come, boys,' sighed Peter. "'Now for our tiffin!' End of chapter
Chapter Fifteen of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Fifteen Holmes. It must not be supposed that our young Dutchman had already forgotten the great skating race which was to take place on the twentieth. On the contrary, they had thought and spoken of it very often during the day. Even Ben, though he had felt more like a traveller than the rest, had never once, through all the sightseeing, lost a certain vision of silver skates which, for a week past, had haunted him night and day. Like a true John Bull, as Jacob had called him, he never doubted that his English fleetness, English strength, English everything, could at any time enable him, on the ice, to put all Holland to shame, and the rest of the world too, for that matter. Ben certainly was a superb skater. He had enjoyed not half the opportunities for practicing that had fallen to his new comrades, but he had improved his share to the utmost, and was, besides, so strong of frame, so supple of limb, in short, such a tight, trim, quick, graceful fellow in every way, that he had taken to skating as naturally as a chamois to leaping, or an eagle to soaring. Only to the heavy heart of poor Hans had the vision of the silver skates failed to appear, during that starry winter night and the brighter sunlit day. Even Gretel had seen them flitting before her as she sat beside her mother, through those hours of weary watching not as prizes to be won, but as treasures passing hopelessly beyond her reach. Ritchie, Hilda, and Katrinka, why, they had scarcely known any other thought than, The race, the race, it will come off on the twentieth. These three girls were friends. Though of nearly the same age, talent, and station, they were as different as girls could be. Hilda von Gleck, as you already know, was a warm-hearted, noble girl of fourteen. Richie Korbes was beautiful to look upon, far more sparkling and pretty than Hilda, but not half so bright and sunny within. Clouds of pride, of discontent, and envy had already gathered in her heart and were growing bigger and darker every day. Of course these often relieved themselves very much after the manner of other clouds. But who saw the storms and the weeping? only her maid or her father, mother, and little brother, those who loved her better than all. Like other clouds, too, hers often took queer shapes, and what was really but mist and vapory fancy assumed the appearance of monster wrongs and mountains of difficulty. To her mind the poor peasant girl Gretel was not a human being, a God-created creature like herself. She was only something that meant poverty, rags, and dirt such as Gretel had no right to feel, to hope. Above all, they should never cross the paths of their betters, that is, not in a disagreeable way. They could toil and labour for them at a respectful distance, even admire them if they would do it humbly, but nothing more. If they rebel, put them down. If they suffer, don't trouble me about it, was Ritchie's secret motto. And yet how witty she was, how tastefully she dressed, how charmingly she sang, how much feeling she displayed for pet kittens and rabbits, and how completely she could bewitch sensible, honest-minded lads like Lambert von Monen and Ludwig von Hope. Karl was too much like her within to be an earnest admirer, and perhaps he suspected the clouds. He, being deep and surly and always uncomfortably in earnest, of course preferred the lively Katrinka, whose nature was made of a hundred tinkling bells. She was a coquette in her infancy, a coquette in her childhood, and now a coquette in her school days. Without a thought of harm she coquetted with her studies, her duties, even her little troubles. She coquetted with her mother, her pet lamb, her baby brother, even with her own golden curls, tossing them back as if she despised them. Everyone liked her, but who could love her? She was never in earnest. 
a pleasant face, a pleasant heart, a pleasant manner, these satisfy for an hour. Poor happy Katrinka! She tinkled, tinkled so merrily through their early days, but life is so apt to coquette with them in turn, to put all their sweet bells out of tune, or to silence them one by one. How different were the homes of these three girls from the tumbling old cottage where Gretel dwelt! Ritchie lived in a beautiful house near Amsterdam, where the carved sideboards were laden with services of silver and gold, and where silken tapestries hung in folds from ceiling to floor. Hilda's father owned the largest mansion in Brook. Its glittering roof of polished tiles and its boarded front, painted in half a dozen various colors, were the admiration of the neighborhood. Katrinka's home, not a mile distant, was the finest of Dutch country seats. The garden was so stiffly laid out in little paths and patches that the birds might have mistaken it for a great Chinese puzzle, with all the pieces spread out ready for use. But in summer it was beautiful. The flowers made the best of their stiff quarters, and when the gardener was not watching, glowed and bent about each other in the prettiest way imaginable. Such a tulip-bed! Why, the queen of the fairies would never care for a grander city in which to hold her court! But Katrinka preferred the bed of pink and white hyacinths. She loved their freshness and fragrance, and the light-hearted way in which their bell-shaped blossoms swung in the breeze. Carl was both right and wrong when he said that Katrinka and Ritchie were furious at the very idea of the peasant Gretel joining in the race. He had heard Ritchie declare that it was disgraceful, shameful, too bad, which in Dutch, as in English, is generally the strongest expression an indignant girl can use, and he had seen Katrinka nod her pretty head and heard her sweetly echo, shameful, too bad as nearly like Ritchie as tinkling bells can be like the voice of real anger. This had satisfied him. He had never suspected that had Hilda, not Ritchie, first talked with Katrinka upon the subject, the bells would have jingled as willing an echo. She would have said, Certainly, let her join us, and would have skipped off thinking no more about it. But now Katrinka, with sweet emphasis, pronounced it a shame that a goose-girl, a forlorn little creature like Gretel, should be allowed to spoil the race. Richie Corbs, being rich and powerful, in a schoolgirl way, had other followers besides Katrinka who were induced to share her opinions because they were either too careless or too cowardly to think for themselves. Poor little Gretel! Her home was sad and dark enough now. Raff Brinker lay moaning upon his rough bed, and his frau, forgetting and forgiving everything, bathed his forehead, his lips, weeping and praying that he might not die. Hans, as we know, had started in desperation for Leyden to search for Dr. Bookman, and induce him, if possible, to come to their father at once. Gretel, filled with a strange dread, had done the work as well as she could, wiped the rough brick floor, brought Pete to build up the slow fire and melted ice for her mother's use. This accomplished, she seated herself upon a low stool near the bed, and begged her mother to try to sleep a while. "'You are so tired,' she whispered. "'Not once have you closed your eyes since that dreadful hour last night. See, I have straightened the willow bed in the corner, and spread everything soft upon it I could find, so that the mother might lie in comfort.' Here is your jacket. Take off that pretty dress. I'll fold it away very carefully, and put it in the big chest before you go to sleep." Dame Brinker shook her head without turning her eyes from her husband's face. "'I can watch, mother,' urged Gretel, "'and I'll wake you every time the father stirs. You are so pale, and your eyes are so red. Oh, mother, do!' The child pleaded in vain. Dame Brinker would not leave her post. Gretel looked at her in troubled silence, wondering whether it was very wicked to care more for one parent than for the other, and sure, yes, quite sure, that she dreaded her father while she clung to her mother with a love that was 
almost idolatry. Hans loves the father so well, she thought. Why cannot I? Yet I could not help crying when I saw his hand bleed that day, last month when he snatched the knife. And now, when he moans, how I ache, ache all over. Perhaps I love him after all, and God will see that I am not such a bad, wicked girl as I thought. Yes, I love the poor father, almost as Hans does. Not quite, for Hans is stronger and does not fear him. Oh, will that moaning go on for ever and ever? Poor mother, how patient she is! She never pouts, as I do, about the money that went away so strangely. If he only could for one instant open his eyes and look at us, as Hans does, and tell us where mother's guilders went, I would not care for the rest. Uh, yes, I would care. I don't want the poor father to die, to be all blue and cold like Annie Bowman's little sister. I know I don't. Dear God, I don't want father to die. Her thoughts merged into a prayer. When it ended the poor child scarcely knew. Soon she found herself watching a little pulse of light at the side of the fire, beating faintly but steadily, showing that somewhere in the dark pile there was warmth and light that would overspread it at last. A large earthen cup filled with burning peat stood near the bedside. Gretel had placed it there to stop the father's shivering, she said. She watched it as it sent a glow around the mother's form, tipping her faded skirt with light and shedding a sort of newness over the threadbare bodice. It was a relief to Gretel to see the lines in that weary face soften as the firelight flickered gently across it. Next she counted the window panes, broken and patched as they were, and finally, after tracing every crack and seam in the walls, fixed her gaze upon a carved shelf made by Hans. The shelf hung as high as Gretel could reach. It held a large leather-covered Bible with brass clasps, a wedding present to Dame Brinker from the family at Heidelberg. Ah, how handy Hans is! If he were here he could turn the father some way so the moans would stop. Dear, dear, if this sickness lasts we shall never skate any more. I must send my new skates back to the beautiful lady. Hans and I will not see the race, and Gretel's eyes, that had been dry before, grew full of tears. "'Never cry, child,' said her mother soothingly. "'This sickness may not be as bad as we think. The father has lain this way before.' Gretel sobbed now. "'Oh, mother, it is not that alone. You do not know all. I am very, very bad and wicked.' "'You, Gretel, you so patient and good!' And a bright, puzzled look beamed for an instant upon the child. "'Hush, lovey, you'll wake him!' Gretel hid her face in her mother's lap and tried not to cry. Her little hand, so thin and brown, lay in the coarse palm of her mother's, creased with many a hard day's work. Ritchie would have shuddered to touch either, yet they pressed warmly upon each other. Soon Gretel looked up with that dull, homely look which, they say, poor children in shanties are apt to have, and said in a trembling voice, "'The father tried to burn you. He did. I saw him, and he was laughing.' "'Hush, child.' The mother's words came so suddenly and sharply that Raff Brinker, dead as he was to all that was passing around him, twitched slightly upon the bed. Gretel said no more, but plucked drearily at the jagged edge of a hole in her mother's holiday gown. It had been burned there. Well for Dame Breaker that the gown was woolen. End of chapter Chapter 16 of Hans Brinker this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 16. Harlem, the Boys Hear Voices. Refreshed and rested, our boys came forth from the coffee-house, just as the big clock in the square, after the manner of certain Holland timekeepers, was striking two with its half-hour bell for half-past two. The captain was absorbed in thought. At first, for Hans Brinker's sad story still echoed in his ears. Not until Ludwig rebuked him with a laughing, "'Wake up, grandfather!' did he reassume his position as gallant boy-leader of his band. "'Ahem! <clears throat> this way, young gentlemen!' They were walking through the city, not on a curb sidewalk, for such a thing is rarely to be found in Holland, but on the brick pavement that lay on the borders of the cobblestone carriageway without breaking its level expanse. Haarlem, like Amsterdam, was gayer than usual, in honour of St. Nicholas. A strange figure was approaching them. It was a small man dressed in black, with a short cloak. He wore a wig and a cocked hat from which a long crepe streamer was flying. "'Who comes here?' cried Ben. "'What a queer-looking object!' "'That's the Ansbrinker,' said Lambert. "'Someone is dead.' "'Is that the way men dress in mourning in this country?' "'Oh, no. The Ansbrinker attends funerals, and it is his business, when any one dies, to notify all the friends and relatives. "'What a strange custom!' "'Well,' said Lambert, we needn't feel very badly about this particular death, for I see another man has lately been born to the world to fill up the vacant place. Ben stared. How do you know that? Don't you see that pretty red pincushion hanging on yonder door? asked Lombard in return. Yes. Well, that's a boy. A boy? What do you mean? I mean that here in Harlem, Whenever a boy is born, the parents have a red pincushion put out at the door. If our young friend had been a girl instead of a boy, the cushion would have been white. In some places they have much more fanciful affairs, all trimmed with lace, and even among the very poorest houses you will see a bit of ribbon or even a string tied on the door-latch. "'Look!' screamed Ben. "'There is a white cushion at the door of that double-joined house with the funny roof.' I don't see any house with a funny roof. Oh, of course not, said Ben. I forgot you're a native, but all the roofs are queer to me, for that matter. I mean the house next to that green building. True enough, there's a girl. I tell you what, Captain, called out Lumbert, slipping easily into Dutch. We must get out of this street as soon as possible. It's full of babies. They'll set up a squall in a moment. The captain laughed. "'I shall take you to hear better music than that,' he said. "'We are just in time to hear the organ of St. Bavon. The church is open to-day.' "'What? The great Harlem organ?' asked Ben. "'That will be a treat indeed. I have often read of it, with its tremendous pipes and its vox humana, which is an organ stop which produces an effect resembling the human voice. "'That sounds like a giant singing.' "'The same,' answered Lambert van Monen. Peter was right. The church was open, though not for religious services. Someone was playing upon the organ. As the boys entered, a swell of sound rushed forth to meet them. It seemed to bear them, one by one, into the shadows of the building. Louder and louder it grew, until it became like the din and roar of some mighty tempest, or like the ocean surging upon the shore. In the midst of the tumult a tinkling bell was heard. Another answered, then another, and the storm paused as if to listen. The bells grew bolder. They rang out loud and clear. Other deep-toned bells joined in. They were tolling in solemn concert. Ding-dong! Ding-dong! The storm broke forth with redoubled fury, gathering its distant thunder. The boys looked at each other, but did not speak. It was growing serious. What was that? Who screamed? What screamed? That terrible musical scream! 
Was it man or demon? Or was it some monster shut up behind that carved brass frame, behind those great silver columns? Some despairing monster begging, screaming for freedom. It was the Vox Humana. At last an answer came, soft, tender, loving, like a mother's song. The storm grew silent. Hidden birds sprang forth filling the air with glad, ecstatic music, rising higher and higher until the last faint note was lost in the distance. The Vox Humana was stilled, but in the glorious hymn of thanksgiving that now arose one could almost hear the throbbing of a human heart. What did it mean? That man's imploring cry should in time be met with a deep content? That gratitude would give us freedom? To Peter and Ben it seemed that the angels were singing. Their eyes grew dim, and their souls dizzy with a strange joy. At last, as if borne upwards by invisible hands, they were floating away on the music, all fatigue forgotten, and with no wish but to hear forever those beautiful sounds. When suddenly Van Holp's sleeve was pulled impatiently, and a gruff voice beside him asked, "'How long are you going to stay here, Captain, blinking at the ceiling like a sick rabbit? It's high time we started.' "'Hush!' whispered Peter, only half aroused. "'Come, man, let's go,' said Carl, giving the sleeve a second pull. Peter turned reluctantly. He would not detain the boys against their will. All but Ben were casting rather reproachful glances upon him. "'Well, boys,' he whispered, "'we will go, softly now.' "'That's the greatest thing I've seen or heard since I've been in Holland,' cried Ben enthusiastically, as soon as they reached the open air. "'It's glorious!' Ludwig and Karl laughed slyly at the English boy's vartal, or gibberish. Jacob yawned, and Peter gave Ben a look that made him instantly feel that he and Peter were not so very different, after all, though one hailed from Holland and the other from England. And Lambert, the interpreter, responded with a brisk, "'You may well say so. I believe there are one or two organs nowadays that are said to be as fine, but for years and years this organ of St. Bavon was the grandest in the world.' "'Do you know how large it is?' asked Ben. I noticed that the church itself was prodigiously high, and that the organ filled the end of the great aisle almost from floor to roof. That's true, said Lambert. And how superb the pipes looked, just like grand columns of silver. They're only for show, you know. The real pipes are behind them, some big enough for a man to crawl through, and some smaller than a baby's whistle. Well, sir, for size, the church is higher than Westminster Abbey, to begin with, and, as you say, the organ makes a tremendous show even then. Father told me last night that it is one hundred and eight feet high, fifty feet wide, and has over five thousand pipes. It has sixty-four stops, if you know what they are, I don't, and three keyboards. "'Good for you,' said Ben. "'You have a fine memory. My head is a perfect colander for figures.' They slip through as fast as they're poured in. But other facts and historical events stay behind. That's some consolation. There we differ, returned Van Monen. I'm great on names and figures, but history? Take it all together. Seems to me to be the most hopeless kind of jumble. Meantime, Carl and Ludwig were having a discussion concerning some square wooden monuments they had observed in the interior of the church. Ludwig declared that each bore the name of the person buried beneath, and Karl insisted that they had no names but only the heraldic arms of the deceased painted on a black ground, with the date of the death in gilt letters. "'I ought to know,' said Karl, "'for I walked across to the east side, to look for the cannonball Mother told me was embedded there. It was fired into the church, in the year fifteen hundred and something, by those rascally Spaniards, while the services were going on. There it was in the wall, sure enough, and while I was walking back I noticed the monuments. I tell you, they haven't the sign of a name on them. "'Ask Peter,' said Ludwig, only half convinced. 
Carl is right, replied Peter, who, though conversing with Jacob, had overheard their dispute. Well, Jacob, as I was saying, Handel, the great composer, chanced to visit Harlem, and, of course, he at once hunted up this famous organ. He gained admittance, and was playing upon it with all his might, when the regular organist chanced to enter the building. The man stood awestruck. He was a good player himself, but he had never heard such music before. "'Who is there?' he cried. "'If it is not an angel or the devil, it must be Handel!' When he discovered that it was the great musician, he was still more mystified. "'But how is this?' he said. "'You have done impossible things. No ten fingers on earth can play the passages you have given. Human fingers couldn't control all the keys and stops.' "'I know it,' said Handel coolly, "'and for that reason I was forced to strike some notes with the end of my nose.' Donder. Just think how the old organist must have stared. "'Hey, what?' exclaimed Jacob, startled when Peter's animated voice suddenly became silent. "'Haven't you heard me, you rascal?' was the indignant rejoinder. "'Oh, yes, no, no. The fact is, I heard you at first. I'm awake now, but I do believe I've been walking beside you half asleep.' stammered Jacob, with such a doleful, bewildered look on his face that Peter could not help laughing. End of chapter Chapter 17 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 17. The Man with Four Heads. After leaving the church, the boys stopped nearby in the open marketplace to look at the bronze statue of Lawrence Jansoon Koster, who is believed by the Dutch to have been the inventor of printing. This is disputed by those who award the same honor to Johannes Gutenberg of Mayence, whence many maintain that Faustus, a servant of Coster, stole his master's wooden types on a Christmas Eve, when the latter was at church, and fled with his booty and his secret to Mayence. Coster was a native of Haarlem, and the Hollanders are naturally anxious to secure the credit of the invention for their illustrious townsmen. Certain it is that the first book he printed is kept by the city in a silver case, wrapped in silk, and is shown with great caution as a precious relic. It is said that he first conceived the idea of printing from cutting his name upon the bark of a tree, and afterward pressing a piece of paper upon the characters. Of course, Lombard and his English friend fully discussed this subject. They also had a rather warm argument concerning another invention. Lombard declared that the honor of giving both the telescope and the microscope to the world lay between Metius and Janssen, both Hollanders, while Ben as stoutly insisted that Roger Bacon, an English monk of the thirteenth century, wrote out the whole thing, sir, perfect descriptions of microscopes and telescopes, too long before either of those other fellows was born. On one subject, however, they both agreed, that the art of curing and pickling herrings was discovered by William Burkles of Holland, and that the country did perfectly right in honouring him as a national benefactor, for its wealth and importance had been in a great measure due to its herring trade. "'It is astonishing,' said Ben, in what prodigious quantities those fish are found. I don't know how it is here, but on the coast of England, off Yarmouth, the herring shoals have been known to be six and seven feet deep with fish. That is prodigious indeed, said Lombard. But you know your herring is derived from the German Herr, an army, on account of a way the fish have of coming in large numbers. Soon afterward, while passing a cobbler's shop, Ben exclaimed, "'Halloo! Lombard, here is the name of one of your greatest men over a cobbler's stall. Boerhaver!' 
If it were only Hermann Borheva instead of Hendrik, it would be complete. Lambert knit his brows reflectively as he replied, Borheva, Borheva. The name is perfectly familiar. I remember, too, that he was born in 1668, but the rest is all gone as usual. There have been so many famous Hollanders, you see, that it is impossible for a fellow to know them all. What was he? Did he have two heads? Or was he one of your great natural swimmers like Marco Polo? <laughs> he had four heads, answered Ben, laughing, for he was a great physician, naturalist, botanist, and chemist. I am full of him just now, for I read his life a few weeks ago. Pour out a little, then, said Lumbert. Only walk faster, or we shall lose sight of the other boys. Well, resumed Ben, quickening his pace, and looking with great interest at everything going on in the crowded street, this Dr. Boraheva was a great unspooker. A great what? roared Lumbert. Oh, I beg pardon. I was thinking of that man over there with a cocked hat. He's an unspooker, isn't he? Yes, he's an unspreaker, if that's what you mean to say. But what about your friend with the four heads? Well, as I was going to say, the doctor was left a penniless orphan at sixteen, without education or friends. Jolly beginning, interposed Lumbert. Now, don't interrupt. He was a poor, friendless orphan at sixteen. But he was so persevering and industrious, so determined to gain knowledge, that he made his way, and in time became one of the most learned men of Europe. All the— What is that? Where? What do you mean? Why, that paper on the door opposite. Don't you see? Two or three persons are reading it. I have noticed several of these papers since I've been here. Oh, that's only a health bulletin. Somebody in the house is ill, and to prevent a steady knocking at the door, the family write an account of the patient's condition on a placard, and hang it outside the door, for the benefit of inquiring friends. A very sensible custom, I'm sure. Nothing strange about it that I can see. Go on, please. You said all the— And there you left me hanging. I was going to say, resumed Ben, that all the— All the— How comically persons do dress here, to be sure. Just look at those men and women with their sugar-loaf hats. And see this woman ahead of us with a straw bonnet like a scoop-shovel tapering to a point in the back. Did you ever see anything so funny? And those tremendous wooden shoes, too. I declare, she's a beauty. Oh, they are only back-country folk, said Lambert rather impatiently. You might as well let old Borheva drop, or else shut your eyes. <laughs> well, I was going to say all the big men of his day sought out this great professor. Even Peter the Great, when he came over to Holland from Russia to learn shipbuilding, attended his lectures regularly. By that time Borhaver was professor of medicine and chemistry and botany in the university at Leyden. He had grown to be very wealthy as a practicing physician, but he used to say that the poor were his best patients because God would be their paymaster. All Europe learned to love and honor him. In short, he became so famous that a certain Mandarin of China addressed a letter to the illustrious Borheva, physician in Europe, and the letter found its way to him without any difficulty. My goodness, that is what I call being a public character. The boys have stopped. How now, Captain Van Holp, where next? We propose to move on, said Van Holp. There is nothing to see at this season in the Bosch. The Bosch is a noble wood, Benjamin, a grand park where they have most magnificent trees protected by law. Do you understand? Ya, yeah, nodded Ben as the captain proceeded. Unless you all desire to visit the Museum of Natural History, we may go on the Grand Canal again. If we had more time, it would be pleasant to take Benjamin up the Blue Stairs. What are the Blue Stairs, Lombard? asked Ben. They are the highest point of the dunes, 
you have a grand view of the ocean from there, besides a fine chance to see how wonderful these dunes are. One can hardly believe that the wind could ever heap up sand in so remarkable a way. But we have to go through Blomendal to get there, not a very pretty village, and some distance from here. What do you say? Oh, I am ready for anything. For my part, I would rather steer direct for Leyden, but we'll do as the captain says. Hey, Jacob? Ja, dat is gut, said Jacob, who felt decidedly more like taking a nap than ascending the blue stairs. The captain was in favour of going to Leyden. It's four long miles from here, full sixteen of your English miles, Benjamin. We have no time to lose if you wish to reach there before midnight. Decide quickly, boys, blue stairs or Leyden? Leyden, they answered, and were out of Harlem in a twinkling admiring the lofty, tower-like windmills and pretty country seats as they left the city behind them. "'If you really wish to see Harlem,' said Lumbert to Ben, after they had skated a while in silence, "'you should visit it in summer. It is the greatest place in the world for beautiful flowers. The walks around the city are superb, and the wood, with its miles of noble elms all in full feather, is something to remember.' You need not smile, old fellow, at my saying, full feather. I was thinking of waving plumes and got my words mixed up a little. But a Dutch elm beats everything. It is the noblest tree on earth, Ben, if you accept the English oak. Aye, said Ben solemnly, if you accept the English oak. And for some moments he could scarcely see the canal because Robbie and Jenny kept bobbing in the air before his eyes. End of chapter. Chapter 18 of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 18. Friends in Need In the meantime, the other boys were listening to Peter's account of an incident which had occurred long ago, Sir Thomas Carr's tour through Holland. In a part of the city where stood an ancient castle, whose lord had tyrannized over the burghers of the town to such an extent that they surrounded his castle and laid siege to it. Just at the last extremity, when the haughty lord felt that he could hold out no longer, and was prepared to sell his life as dearly as possible, his lady appeared on the ramparts and offered to surrender everything, provided she was permitted to bring out, and retain, as much of her most precious household goods as she could carry upon her back. The promise was given, and the lady came forth from the gateway, bearing her husband upon her shoulders. The burghers pledge preserved him from the fury of the troops, but left them free to wreak their vengeance upon the castle. "'Do you believe that story, Captain Peter?' asked Carl in an incredulous tone. "'Of course I do. It is historical. Why should I doubt it?' "'Simply because no woman could do it, and if she could, she wouldn't. That is my opinion.' and I believe that there are many who would, that is, to save those they really cared for," said Ludwig. Jacob, who in spite of his fat and sleepiness was of rather a sentimental turn, had listened with deep interest. "'That is right, little fellow,' he said, nodding his head approvingly. "'I believe every word of it. I shall never marry a woman who would not be glad to do as much for me.' "'Heaven help her!' cried Carl, turning to gaze at the speaker. "'Why, Poot, three men couldn't do it!' "'Perhaps not,' said Jacob quietly, feeling that he had asked rather too much of the future Mrs. Poot. "'But she must be willing, that is all.' "'Aye,' responded Peter's cheery voice, "'willing heart makes nimble foot, and who knows, but it may make strong arms also.' "'Pete?' asked Ludwig, changing the subject. 
Did you tell me last night that the painter Wowerman was born in Harlem? Yes, and Jacob Rostal and Berchem too. I like Berchem as he was always good-natured. They say he always sang while he painted, and though he died nearly two hundred years ago, there are traditions still afloat concerning his pleasant laugh. He was a great painter, and he had a wife as cross as Xantippe. They balanced each other finely, said Ludwig. He was kind, and she was cross. But, Peter, before I forget it, wasn't that picture of St. Hubert and the horse painted by Wowerman? You remember? Father showed us an engraving from it last night. Yes, indeed. There is a story connected with that picture. Tell us, cried two or three, drawing closer to Peter as they skated on. Wowerman, began the captain oratorically, was born in 1620, just four years before Berchem. He was a master of his art, and especially excelled in painting horses. Strange as it may seem, people were so long finding out his merits that, even after he had arrived at the height of his excellence, he was obliged to sell his pictures for very paltry prices. The poor artist became completely discouraged, and worst of all, was over head and ears in debt. One day he was talking over his troubles with his father confessor, who was one of the few who recognized his genius. The priest determined to assist him, and accordingly lent him six hundred guilders, advising him at the same time to demand a better price for his pictures. Wowamon did so, and in the meantime paid his debts. Matters brightened with him at once. Everybody appreciated the great artist who painted such costly pictures. He grew rich. The six hundred guilders were returned, and in gratitude Wowerman sent also a work which he had painted, representing his benefactor as St. Hubert kneeling before his horse, the very picture, Ludwig, of which we were speaking last night. "'So, so!' exclaimed Ludwig with deep interest. "'I must take another look at the engraving as soon as we get home.' At that same hour, while Ben was skating with his companions beside the Holland Dyke, Robbie and Jenny stood in their pretty English schoolhouse, ready to join in the duties of their reading class. "'Commence! Master Robert Dobbs,' said the teacher. "'Page 242. Now, sir, mind every stop.' And Robbie, in a quick childish voice, roared forth at schoolroom pitch, "'Lesson 62. The Hero of Harlem.' Many years ago there lived in Harlem, one of the principal cities of Holland, a sunny-haired boy of gentle disposition. His father was a sluicer, that is, a man whose business it was to open and close the sluices, or large oaken gates, that are placed at regular distances across the entrances of the canals, to regulate the amount of water that shall flow into them. The sluicer raises the gates more or less according to the quantity of water required, and closes them carefully at night, in order to avoid all possible danger of an oversupply running into the canal, or the water would soon overflow it and inundate the surrounding country. As a great portion of Holland is lower than the level of the sea, the waters are kept from flooding the land only by means of strong dikes or barriers, and by means of these sluices, which are often strained to the utmost by the pressure of the rising tides. Even the little children in Holland know that constant watchfulness is required to keep the rivers and ocean from overwhelming the country, and that a moment's neglect of the sluicer's duty may bring ruin and death to all. "'Very good,' said the teacher. "'Now, Susan!' One lovely autumn afternoon, when the boy was about eight years old, he obtained his parents' consent to carry some cakes to a blind man who lived out in the country, on the other side of the dyke. The little fellow started on his errand with a light heart, and having spent an hour with his grateful old friend, he bade him farewell, and started on his homeward walk. Trudging stoutly along the canal, he noticed how the autumn rains had swollen the waters. Even while humming his careless, childish song, he thought of his father's brave old gates, and felt glad of their strength. For, thought he, if they gave way, where would father and mother be? 
these pretty fields would all be covered with the angry waters. Father always calls them the angry waters. I suppose he thinks they are mad at him for keeping them out so long. And with these thoughts just flitting across his brain, the little fellow stooped to pick the pretty flowers that grew along his way. Sometimes he stopped to throw some feathery seed-ball in the air, and watch it as it floated away. Sometimes he listened to the stealthy rustling of a rabbit, speeding through the grass. But oftener he smiled as he recalled the happy light he had seen arise on the weary, listening face of his blind old friend. "'Now, Henry,' said the teacher, nodding to the next little reader. Suddenly the boy looked around him in dismay. He had not noticed that the sun was setting. Now he saw that his long shadow on the grass had vanished. It was growing dark. He was still some distance from home, and in a lonely ravine, where even the blue flowers had turned to grey. He quickened his footsteps, and, with a beating heart, recalled many a nursery tale of children's belated and dreary forest. Just as he was bracing himself for a run, he was startled by the sound of trickling water. Whence did it come? He looked up, and saw a small hole in the dike, through which a tiny stream was flowing. Any child in Holland will shudder at the thought of a leak in the dike. The boy understood the danger at a glance. That little hole, if the water were allowed to trickle through, would soon be a large one and a terrible inundation would be the result. Quick as a flash he saw his duty. Throwing away his flowers, the boy clambered up the heights until he reached the hole. His chubby little finger was thrust in almost before he knew it. The flowing was stopped. Ah! he thought, with a chuckle of boyish delight, the angry waters must stay back now. Harlem shall not be drowned while I am here. This was all very well at first, but the night was falling rapidly. Chill vapours filled the air. Our little hero began to tremble with cold and dread. He shouted loudly. He screamed, Come here! Come here! But no one came. The cold grew more intense. A numbness, commencing in the tired little finger, crept over his hand and arm, and soon his whole body was filled with pain. He shouted again, "'Will no one come? Mother! Mother!' Alas, his mother, good practical soul, had already locked the doors and had fully resolved to scold him on the morrow for spending the night with blind Jensen without her permission. He tried to whistle. Perhaps some straggling boy might heed the signal, but his teeth chattered so it was impossible. Then he called on God for help and the answer came, through a holy resolution, I will stay here till morning. Now, Jenny Dobbs, said the teacher. Jenny's eyes were glistening, but she took a long breath and commenced. The midnight moon looked down upon that small, solitary form, sitting upon a stone, halfway up the dike. His head was bent, but he was not asleep for every now and then one restless hand rubbed feebly the outstretched arm that seemed fastened to the dike, and often the pale, tearful face turned quickly at some real or fancied sounds. How can we know the sufferings of that long and fearful watch? What falterings of purpose? What childish terrors came over the boy as he thought of the warm little bed at home, of his parents? his brothers and sisters, then looked into the cold, dreary night. If he drew away that tiny finger, the angry waters, grown angrier still, would rush forth, and never stop until they had swept over the town. No, he would hold it there till daylight, if he lived. He was not very sure of living. What did this strange buzzing mean? and then the knives that seemed pricking and piercing him from head to foot, he was not certain now that he could draw his finger away, even if he wished to. At daybreak a clergyman, returning from the bedside of a sick parishioner, thought he heard groans as he walked along on the top of the dike. Bending, 
he saw, far down on the side, a child apparently writhing with pain. "'In the name of wonder, boy!' he exclaimed. "'What are you doing there?' "'I am keeping the water from running out,' was the simple answer of the little hero. "'Tell them to come quick!' It is needless to add that they did come quickly, and that— Jenny Dobbs, said the teacher, rather impatiently, if you cannot control your feelings so as to read distinctly, we will wait until you recover yourself. Yes, sir, said Jenny, quite startled. It was strange, but at that very moment Ben, far over the sea, was saying to Lumbert, The noble little fellow! I have frequently met with an account of the incident— but I never knew till now that it was really true. True, of course it is, said Lumbert. I have given you the story just as mother told it to me years ago. Why, there is not a child in Holland who does not know it. And Ben, you may not think so, but that little boy represents the spirit of the whole country. Not a leak can show itself anywhere, either in its politics, honor, or public safety that a million fingers are not ready to stop it at any cost. Whew! cried Master Ben. Big talk in that. It's true talk anyway, rejoined Lumbert, so very quietly that Ben wisely resolved to make no further comment. End of chapter Chapter 19 of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 19 On the Canal. The skating season had commenced unusually early. Our boys were by no means alone upon the ice. The afternoon was so fine that men, women, and children, bent upon enjoying the holiday, had flocked to the Grand Canal from far and near. St. Nicholas had evidently remembered the favorite pastime. Shining new skates were everywhere to be seen. Whole families were skimming their way to Harlem or Leyden or the neighboring villages. The ice seemed fairly alive. Men noticed the erect, easy carriage of women, and their picturesque variety of costume. There were the latest fashions, fresh from Paris, floating past dingy, moth-eaten garments that had seen service through two generations. Coal-scuttle bonnets perched over freckled faces bright with holiday smiles. Stiff muslin capes with wings at the sides, flapping beside cheeks rosy with health and contentment. Furs, too encircling the whitest of throats, and scanty garments fluttering below faces ruddy with exercise. In short, every quaint and comical mixture of dry goods and flesh that Holland could furnish seemed sent to enliven the scene. There were bells from Leiden, and fishwives from the border villages, cheese women from Gouda, and prim matrons from beautiful country seats on the Harlemer Meer. Gray-headed skaters were constantly to be seen, wrinkled old women with baskets upon their heads, and plump little toddlers on skates, clutching at their mother's gowns. Some women carried their babies upon their backs, firmly secured with a bright shawl. The effect was pretty and graceful as they darted by, or sailed slowly past, now nodding to an acquaintance, now chirruping and throwing soft baby talk to the muffled little ones they carried. Boys and girls were chasing each other, and hiding behind the one-horse sleds that, loaded high with peat or timber, pursued their cautious way along the track marked out as safe. Beautiful, queenly women were there, enjoyment sparkling in their quiet eyes. Sometimes a long file of young men, each grasping the coat of the one before him, flew by with electric speed, and sometimes the ice squeaked under the chair of some gorgeous old dowager or rich burgomaster's lady, who, very red in the nose and sharp in the eyes, 
looked like a scare-thaw invented by old Father Winter for the protection of his skating-grounds. The chair would be heavy with foot-stoves and cushions, to say nothing of the old lady. Mounted upon shining runners, it slid along, pushed by the sleepiest of servants, who, looking neither to the right nor the left, bent himself to his task, while she cast direful glances upon the screaming little rowdies who invariably acted as bodyguard. As for the men, they were pictures of placid enjoyment. Some were attired in ordinary citizen's dress, but many looked odd enough with their short woolen coats, wide breeches, and big silver buckles. These seemed to bend like little boys who had, by a miracle, sprung suddenly into manhood and were forced to wear garments that their astonished mothers had altered in a hurry. He noticed, too, that nearly all the men had pipes as they passed him, whizzing and smoking like so many locomotives. There was every variety of pipes, from those of common clay to the most expensive meerschaums mounted in silver and gold. Some were carved into extraordinary and fantastic shapes, representing birds, flowers, heads, bugs, and dozens of other things. Some resembled the Dutchman's pipe that grows in our American woods. Some were red, and many were of a pure snowy white for the most respectable were those which were ripening into a shaded brown. The deeper and richer the brown, of course, the more honoured the pipe, for it was proved that the owner, if honestly shading it, was deliberately devoting his manhood to the effort. What pipe would not be proud to be the object of such a sacrifice? For a while Ben skated on in silence. There was so much to engage his attention that he almost forgot his companions. Part of the time he had been watching the ice-boats as they flew over the great Harlemer Mere, or lake, the frozen surface of which was now plainly visible from the canal. These boats had very large sails, much larger in proportion than those of ordinary vessels, and were set upon a triangular frame furnished with an iron runner at each corner, the widest part of the triangle crossing the bow, and its point stretching beyond the stem. They had rudders for guiding, and brakes for arresting their progress, and were of all sizes and kinds, from small, rough affairs managed by a boy, to large and beautiful ones filled with gay pleasure parties, and manned by competent sailors, who, smoking their stumpy pipes, reefed and tacked and steered with great solemnity and precision. Some of the boats were painted and gilded in gaudy style, and flaunted grey pennons from their mastheads. Others, white as snow, with every spotless sail, rounded by the wind, looked like swans borne onward by a resistless current. It seemed to Ben, as, following his fancy, he watched one of these in the distance, that he could almost hear its helpless, terrified cry. But he soon found that the sound arose from a nearer and less romantic cause from an ice-boat not fifty yards from him, using its brakes to avoid a collision with a peat sled. It was a rare thing for these boats to be upon the canal, and their appearance generally caused no little excitement among skaters, especially among the timid. But to-day every ice-boat in the country seemed to float, or rather a slide, and the canal had its full share. Ben, though delighted at the sight, was often startled at the swift approach of the resistless, high-winged things threatening to dart in any and every possible direction. It required all his energies to keep out of the way of the passers-by, and to prevent these screaming little urchins from upsetting him with their sleds. Once he halted to watch some boys who were making a hole in the ice preparatory to using their fishing spears. Just as he concluded to start again, he found himself suddenly bumped into an old lady's lap. Her pushchair had come upon him from the rear. The old lady screamed. The servant who was propelling her gave a warning hiss. In another instant Ben found himself apologizing to empty air. The indignant old lady was far ahead. This was a slight mishap compared with one that now threatened him. A huge ice-boat under full sail came tearing down the canal, almost paralyzing Ben with the thought of instant destruction. It was close upon him. He saw its gilded prow, heard the skipper, 
skipper, a master of a small trading vessel, a pleasure boat or ice boat. Shout, felt the great boom fairly whiz over his head, was blind, deaf, and dumb all in an instant, then opened his eyes to find himself spinning some yards behind its great skate-like rudder. It had passed within an inch of his shoulder, but he was safe. Safe to see England again, safe to kiss the dear faces that for an instant had flashed before him one by one, father, mother, Robbie, and Jenny. That great boom had dashed their images into his very soul. He knew now how much he loved them. Perhaps this knowledge made him face complacently the scowls of those on the canal, who seemed to feel that a boy in danger was necessarily a bad boy, needing instant reprimand. Lumber chided him roundly. "'I thought it was all over with you, you careless fellow. Why don't you look where you're going? Not content with sitting on all the old ladies' laps, you must make a juggernaut of every ice-boat that comes along. We shall have to hand you over to the Anspreakers yet, if you don't look out.' "'Please don't,' said Ben, with mock humility. Then, seeing how pale Lumbert's lips were, he added in a low tone, I do believe I thought more in that one moment, Van Monen, than in all the rest of my past life." There was no reply, and, for a while, the two boys skated on in silence. Soon a faint sound of distant bells reached their ears. "'Hark!' said Ben. "'What is that?' "'The Carillons,' replied Lumbert. "'They are trying the bells in the chapel of yonder village. Ah. Ben, you should hear the chimes of the new church at Delft. They are superb. Nearly five hundred sweet-toned bells, and one of the best Koreaners of Holland to play upon them. Hard work, though. They say the fellow often has to go to bed from positive exhaustion after his performances. You see, the bells are attached to a kind of keyboard, something like they have on piano forts. There is also a set of pedals for the feet. When a brisk tune is going on, the player looks like a kicking frog, fastened to his seat with a skewer. "'For shame!' said Ben indignantly. Peter had, for the present, exhausted his stock of Harlem anecdotes, and now, having nothing to do but skate, he and his three companions were hastening to catch up with Lumbert and Ben. "'That English lad is fleet enough,' said Peter. "'If he were a born Hollander, he could do no better.' Generally these John Bulls make but a sorry figure on skates. Halloo! Here you are, Van Monen. Why, we hardly hope for the honour of meeting you again. Whom were you flying from in such haste? Snails, retorted Lumbert. What kept you? We have been talking, and besides we halted once to give Poot a chance to rest. He begins to look rather worn out, said Lumbert in a low voice. Just then a beautiful ice-boat with reef sail and flying streamers swept leisurely by. Its deck was filled with children muffled up to their chins. Looking at them from the ice you could see only smiling little faces embedded in bright-colored woolen wrappings. They were singing a chorus in honor of St. Nicholas. The music, starting in the discord of a hundred childish voices, floated, as it rose, into exquisite harmony. Friends of sailors and of children, double claim have we, as in youthful joy we're sailing o'er a frozen sea. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, let us sing to thee. While through wintry air we're rushing, as our voices blend, are you near us? Do you hear us, Nicholas, our friend? Nicholas, St. Nicholas, love can never end. Sunny sparkles, bright before us, chase away the cold. Hearts where sunny thoughts are welcome never can grow old. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, never can grow old. Pretty gift and loving lesson, festival and glee, Bid us thank thee as we're sailing o'er the frozen sea. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, so we sing to thee. End of chapter Chapter Twenty of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 20 Jacob Poot Changes the Plan. The last note died away in the distance. Our boys, who in their vain efforts to keep up with the boat had felt that they were skating backward, turned to look at one another. "'How beautiful that was!' exclaimed Van Monen. "'Just like a dream!' Jacob drew close to Ben, giving his usual approving nod as he spoke. "'Dat ish goot! Dat ish de best fay! I shay better to take de lady mit a boat!' "'Take a boat!' exclaimed Ben in dismay. "'Why, man, our plan was to skate, not to be carried like little children.' "'Teufels!' retorted Jacob. "'Dat ish no little, no babies to go for boat.' The boys laughed, but exchanged uneasy glances. It would be great fun to jump on an ice-boat, if they had a chance. But to abandon so shamefully their grand undertaking, who could think of such a thing?' An animated discussion arose at once. Captain Peter brought his party to a halt. "'Boys,' said he, "'it strikes me that we should consult Jacob's wishes in this matter. He started the excursion, you know.' "'Pooh!' sneered Carl, throwing a contemptuous glance at Jacob. "'Who's tired? We can rest all night in Leyden.' Ludwig and Lambert looked anxious and disappointed. It was no slight thing to lose the credit of having skated all the way from Brook to the Hague and back again, but both agreed that Jacob should decide the question. Good-natured, tired Jacob. He read the popular sentiment at a glance. "'Oh, no,' he said in Dutch. "'I was joking. We will skate, of course.' The boys gave a delighted shout and started on again with renewed vigour. All but Jacob. He tried his best not to seem fatigued, and by not saying a word saved his breath and energy for the great business of skating. But in vain. Before long the stout body grew heavier and heavier, the tottering limbs weaker and weaker. Worse than all, the blood, anxious to get as far as possible from the ice, mounted to the puffy, good-natured cheeks, and made the roots of his thin yellow hair glow into a fiery red. This kind of work is apt to summon vertigo, of whom good Hans Andersen writes, the same who hurls daring young hunters from the mountains, or spins them from the sharpest heights of the glaciers, or catches them as they tread the stepping-stones of the mountain torrent. Vertigo came, unseen, to Jacob. After tormenting him a while, with one touch sending a chill from head to foot, with the next scorching every vein with fever, she made the canal rock and tremble beneath him, the white sails bow and spin as they passed, then cast him heavily upon the ice. "'Halloo!' cried Van Monen. "'There goes Poot!' Ben sprang hastily forward. "'Jacob! Jacob, are you hurt?' Peter and Carl were lifting him. The face was white enough now. It seemed like a dead face. Even the good-natured look was gone. A crowd collected. Peter unbuttoned the poor boy's jacket, loosened his red tippet, and blew between the parted lips. "'Stand off, good people!' he cried. "'Give him air!' "'Lay him down!' called out a woman from the crowd. "'Stand him upon his feet!' shouted another. "'Give him wine!' growled a stout fellow who was driving a loaded sled. "'Yes, yes, give him wine!' echoed everybody. Ludwig and Lambert shouted in concert, "'Wine! Wine! Who has wine?' A sleepy-headed Dutchman began to fumble mysteriously under the heaviest of blue jackets, saying as he did so, "'Not so much noise, young masters, uh, not so much noise. The boy was a fool to faint like a girl.' "'Wine! Quick!' cried Peter, who, with Ben's help, was rubbing Jacob from head to foot. Ludwig stretched forth his hand imploringly toward the Dutchman, who, with an air of great importance, was still fumbling beneath the jacket. 
Do hurry! He will die! Has anyone else any wine?' "'He is dead,' said an awful voice from among the bystanders. This startled the Dutchman. "'Have a care,' he said, reluctantly drawing forth a small blue flask. "'This is schnapps. A little is enough.' A little was enough. The paleness gave way to a faint flush. Jacob opened his eyes, and, half bewildered, half ashamed, feebly tried to free himself from those who were supporting him. There was no alternative now for our party but to have their exhausted comrade carried, in some way, to Leyden. As for expecting him to skate any more that day, the thing was impossible. In truth, by this time each boy began to entertain secret yearnings toward ice-boats, and to avow a Spartan resolve not to desert Jacob. Fortunately, a gentle, steady breeze was setting southward. If some accommodating skipper would but come along, matters would not be quite so bad, after all. Peter hailed the first sail that appeared. The men in the stern would not even look at him. Three drays on runners came along, but they were already loaded to the utmost. Then an ice-boat, a beautiful, tempting little one, whizzed past like an arrow. The boys had just time to stare eagerly at it when it was gone. In despair they resolved to prop up Jacob with their strong arms, as well as they could, and take him to the nearest village. At that moment a very shabby ice-boat came in sight. With but little hope of success Peter hailed at it, at the same time taking off his hat and flourishing it in the air. The sail was lowered, then came the scraping sound of the brake and a pleasant voice called from the deck, "'What now?' "'Will you take us on?' cried Peter, hurrying with his companions as fast as he could, for the boat was bringing to some distance ahead. "'Will you take us on?' "'We'll pay for the ride!' shouted Carl. The man on board scarcely noticed him except to mutter something about its not being a trekskoit. Still looking toward Peter, he asked, "'How many?' Six. Well, it's Nicholas's day. Up with you. Young gentleman sick? He nodded toward Jacob. Yes, broken down, skated all the way from Brook, answered Peter. Do you go to Leyden? That's as the wind says. It's blowing that way now. Scramble up. Poor Jacob. If that willing Mrs. Poot had only appeared just then, her services would have been invaluable. It was as much as the boys could do to hoist him into the boat. All were in at last. The skipper, puffing away at his pipe, let out the sail, lifted the brake, and sat in the stern with folded arms. "'Whew! How fast we go!' cried Ben. "'This is something like. Feel better, Jacob?' "'Much better. I thanks you.' "'Oh, you'll be as good as new in ten minutes. This makes a fellow feel like a bird.' Jacob nodded and blinked his eyes. "'Don't go to sleep, Jacob. It's too cold. You might never wake up, you know. Persons often freeze to death in that way.' "'I no sleep,' said Jacob confidently, and in two minutes he was snoring. Carl and Ludwig laughed. "'We must wake him,' cried Ben. "'It is dangerous, I tell you. Jacob! Jake!' Captain Peter interfered for three of the boys were helping Ben for the fun of the thing. "'Nonsense! Don't shake him. Let him alone, boys. One never snores like that when one's freezing. Cover him up with something. Here, this cloak will do. Hey, skipper!' And he looked towards the stern for permission to use it. The man nodded. "'There,' said Peter, tenderly adjusting the garment. "'Let him sleep. He will be as frisky as a lamb when he wakes.' How far are we from Leyden, Skipper? Not more'n a couple of pipes, replied a voice, rising from smoke like the genii of fairy tales. Puff, puff. Likely not more'n one and a half. Puff, puff. If this wind holds. Puff, puff, puff. What is the man saying, Lumbert? asked Ben, who was holding his mittened hands against his cheeks to ward off the cutting air. He says we're about two pipes from Leyden. 
Half the boors here on the canal measure distance by the time it takes them to finish a pipe. How ridiculous! See here, Benjamin Dobbs, retorted Lambert, growing unaccountably indignant at Ben's quiet smile. See here! You've a way of calling every other thing you see on this side of the German Ocean ridiculous. It may suit you, this word, but it doesn't suit me. When you want anything ridiculous, just remember your English custom of making the Lord Mayor of London, at his installation, count the nails in a horseshoe to prove his learning. "'Who told you we had any such custom as that?' cried Ben, looking grave in an instant. "'Why, I know it. No use of anyone telling me. It's in all the books, and it's true. It strikes me,' continued Lambert, laughing in spite of himself, that you have been kept in happy ignorance of a good many ridiculous things on your side of the map. Huh! exclaimed Ben, trying not to smile. I'll inquire to this Lord Mayor business when I get home. There must be some mistake. Brrrr! How fast we're going! This is glorious! It was a grand sail, or ride, I scarcely know what to call it. Perhaps fly would be the best word for the boys felt very much as Sinbad did when, tied to the rock's leg, he darted through the clouds, or as Bellerophon felt when he shot through the air on the back of his winged horse Pegasus. Sailing, riding, or flying, whichever it was, everything was rushing past, backward, and before they had time to draw a deep breath, laid in itself, with its high, peaked roofs, flew halfway to meet them. When the city came in sight, it was high time to waken the sleeper. That feat accomplished, Peter's prophecy came to pass. Master Jacob was quite restored, and in excellent spirits. The skipper made a feeble remonstrance when Peter, with hearty thanks, endeavoured to slip some silver pieces into his tough brown palm. "'You see, young master,' said he, drawing away his hand, "'the regular line of trade's one thing, and a favour's another.' "'I know it,' said Peter. "'But those boys and girls of yours will want sweets when you get home. Buy them some in the name of St. Nicholas.' The man grinned. "'Aye, true enough. I've young'uns in plenty. A clean boatload of them. You are a sharp young master at guessing.' This time the naughty hand hitched forward again, quite carelessly, it seemed, but its palm was upward. Peter hastily dropped in the money and moved away. The sail came tumbling down. Scrape, scrape went the break, scattering an ice shower round the boat. "'Good-bye, skipper!' shouted the boys, seizing their skates and leaping from the deck one by one. "'Many thanks to you!' "'Good-bye! Good oh, hold! Here! Stop! I want my coat!' Ben was carefully assisting his cousin over the side of the boat. "'What is the man shouting about?' Oh, I know, you have his wrapper round your shoulders. That is true, answered Jacob, half jumping, half tumbling down upon the framework. That is what make him so heavy. Made you so heavy, you mean, Poot? Ya, yeah, made you so heavy, that is true, said Jacob, innocently, as he worked himself free of the big wrapper. There, now you hand admit him, straightway, and tells him I was much thanks for that. "'Ho for an inn!' cried Peter, as they stepped into the city. "'Be brisk, my fine fellows!' End of chapter Chapter 21 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or the Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge, Chapter 21, Mynheer Cleef and His Bill of Fare. The boys soon found an unpretending establishment near the Breedstraat, with a funnily painted lion over the door. This was the Rude Liu, or Red Lion, kept by one Hergens Cleef, a stout Dutchman with short legs and a very long pipe. 
By this time they were in a ravenous condition. The tiffin, taken at Harlem, had served only to give them an appetite, and this had been heightened by their exercise and swift sail upon the canal. "'Come, mine host, give us what you can,' cried Peter, rather pompously. "'I can give you anything, everything,' answered Mynheer Cleef, performing a difficult bow. "'Well, give us sausage and pudding.' "'Ah, mynheer, the sausage is all gone, and there is no pudding.' "'Salmogundi, then, and plenty of it.' "'That is out also, young master.' "'Eggs, and be quick.' "'Winter eggs are very poor eating,' answered the innkeeper, puckering his lips and lifting his eyebrows. "'No eggs? Well, caviar!' The Dutchman raised his fat hands. "'Caviar! That is made of gold! Who is caviar to sell?' Peter had sometimes eaten it at home. He knew that it was made of the rose of the sturgeon and certain other large fish, but he had no idea of its cost. "'Well, mine host, what have you?' "'What have I? Everything. I have rye bread, sauerkraut, potato salad, and the fattest herring in Leyden.' "'What do you say, boys?' asked the captain. "'Will that do?' "'Yes!' cried the famished youths if you'll only be quick mynheer moved off like one walking in his sleep but soon opened his eyes wide at the miraculous manner in which his herring were made to disappear next came or rather went potato salad rye bread and coffee then utrecht water flavored with orange and finally slices of dried gingerbread this last delicacy was not on the regular bill of fare but mynheer cleef driven to extremes, solemnly produced it from his own private stores, and gave only a placid blink when his voracious young travellers started up, declaring they had eaten enough. "'I should think so,' he exclaimed internally, but his smooth face gave no sign. Softly rubbing his hands, he asked, "'Will your worships have beds?' <laughs> "'Will your worships have beds?' mocked Carl. What do you mean? Do we look sleepy? Not at all, master, but I would cause them to be warmed and aired. None sleep under damp sheets at the Red Lion. Ah, I understand. Shall we come back here to sleep, captain? Peter was accustomed to finer lodgings, but this was a frolic. Why not? he replied. We can fare excellently here. Your worship speaks only the truth said mynheer with great deference how fine to be called your worship laughed ludwig aside to lambert while peter replied well mine host you may get the rooms ready by nine i have one beautiful chamber with three beds that will hold all of your worships said mynheer cleef coaxingly that will do Whew, whistled karl when they reached the street ludwig startled what now? Nothing. Only my near Cleef of the Red Lion little thinks how we shall make things spin in that same room tonight. We'll set the bolsters flying. Order! cried the captain. Now, boys, I must seek this great Dr. Bookman before I sleep. If he is in Leyden, it will be no great task to find him, for he always puts up at the Golden Eagle when he comes here. I wonder that you did not all go to bed at once. Still, as you are awake, what say you to walking with Ben up by the museum, or the Stadhus? Agreed, said Ludwig and Lambert, but Jacob preferred to go with Peter. In vain Ben tried to persuade him to remain at the inn and rest. He declared that he had never felt petter, and wished of all things to take a look at the city, for it was his first stop mit Leyden. Oh, it will not harm him said Lambert. How long the day has been, and what glorious sport we have had! It hardly seems possible that we left Brook only this morning." Jacob yawned. "'I have enjoyed it well,' he said, but it seems to me at least a week since we started." Carl laughed and muttered something about twenty naps. "'Here we are at the corner. Remember, we all meet at the Red Lion at eight said the captain, as he and Jacob walked away. End of chapter
Chapter Twenty Two of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Two. The Red Lion Becomes Dangerous. The boys were glad to find a blazing fire awaiting them upon their return to the Red Lion. Carl and his party were there first. Soon afterward Peter and Jacob came in. They had inquired in vain concerning Dr. Boekman. All they could ascertain was that he had been seen in Harlem that morning. "'As for his being in Leiden,' the landlord of the Golden Eagle had said to Peter, "'the thing is impossible. He always lodges here when in town.' By this time there would be a crowd at my door waiting to consult him. Bah! People make such fools of themselves. He is called a great surgeon, said Peter. Yes, the greatest in Holland. But what of that? What of being the greatest pill-choker and knife-slasher in the world? The man is a bear. Only last month on this very spot he called me a pig before three customers. No! exclaimed Peter, trying to look surprised and indignant. "'Yes, master, a pig,' repeated the landlord, puffing at his pipe with an injured air. "'Bah! If he did not pay fine prices and bring customers to my house, I would sooner see him in the Vleit Canal than give him lodging.' Perhaps mine host felt that he was speaking too openly to a stranger, or it may be that he saw a smile lurking in Peter's face for he added sharply, "'Come now, what more do you wish? Supper? Beds?' "'No, mynheer. I am but searching for Dr. Boekman. "'Go find him. He is not in Leyden.' Peter was not to be put off so easily. He succeeded in obtaining permission to leave a note for the famous surgeon, or rather he bought from his amiable landlord the privilege of writing it there and a promise that it should be promptly delivered when Dr. Boekman arrived. This accomplished, Peter and Jacob returned to the Red Lion. This inn had once been a fine house, the home of a rich burgher, but having grown old and shabby, it had passed through many hands, until finally it had fallen into the possession of Mynheer Cleef. He was fond of saying, as he looked up at its dingy, broken walls, "'Mend it and paint it, and there's not a prettier house in Leyden.' It stood six stories high from the street. The first three were of equal breadth, but of various heights. The last three were in the great, high roof, and grew smaller and smaller like a set of double steps until the top one was lost in a point. The roof was built of short, shining tiles, and the windows, with their little panes, seemed to be scattered irregularly over the face of the building, without the slightest attention to outward effect but the public room on the ground floor was the landlord's joy and pride. He never said, mend it and paint it, there, for everything was in the highest condition of Dutch neatness and order. If you will but open your mind's eye, you may look into the apartment. Imagine a large, bare room, with a floor that seemed to be made of squares cut out of glazed earthen pie-dishes, first a yellow piece, then a red, until the whole looked like a vast checkerboard. Fancy a dozen high-backed wooden chairs standing around. Then a great hollow chimney-place all aglow with its blazing fire, reflected a hundred times in the polished steel fire-dogs. A tiled hearth, tiled sides, tiled top, with a Dutch sentence upon it, and over all, high above one's head, a narrow mantel-shelf, filled with shining brass candlesticks, pipe-lighters, and tinder-boxes. Then see, in one end of the room, three pine-tables, in the other, a closet and a deal dresser. The latter is filled with mugs, dishes, pipes, tankards, earthen and glass bottles, and is guarded at one end by a brass-hooped keg standing upon long legs. Everything is dim with tobacco-smoke, but otherwise as clean as soap and sand can make it. Next, picture two sleepy, shabby-looking men, in wooden shoes, 
seated near the glowing fireplace, hugging their knees and smoking short stumpy pipes. My near Cleef walking softly and heavily about, clad in leather knee-breeches, felt shoes, and a green jacket wider than it is long. Then throw a heap of skates in the corner, and put six tired, well-dressed boys, in various attitudes, upon the wooden chairs, and you will see the coffee-room of the Red Lion just as it appeared at nine o'clock upon the evening of December 6. For supper, gingerbread again, slices of Dutch sausage, rye bread sprinkled with anise seed, pickles, a bottle of Utrecht water, and a pot of very mysterious coffee. The boys were ravenous enough to take all they could get and pronounce it excellent. Ben made wry faces, but Jacob declared he had never eaten a better meal. After they had laughed and talked a while, and counted their money by way of settling a discussion that arose concerning their expenses, the captain marched his company off to bed, led on by a greasy pioneer boy who carried skates and a candlestick instead of an axe. One of the ill-favoured men by the fire had shuffled toward the dresser, and was ordering a mug of beer, just as Ludwig, who brought up the rear, was stepping from the apartment. "'I don't like that fellow's eye,' he whispered to Carl. "'He looks like a pirate or something of that kind.' "'Looks like a granny,' answered Carl in sleepy disdain. Ludwig laughed uneasily. "'Granny or no granny,' he whispered. "'I tell you, he looks just like one of those men in the Wutzpullen.' "'Pooh!' sneered Carl. "'I knew it. That picture was too much for you. Look sharp now, and see if yon fellow with the candle doesn't look like the other villain.' "'No, indeed. His face is as honest as a Gouda cheese. But I say, Carl, that really was a horrid picture.' "'Huh! What did you stare at it so long for?' "'I couldn't help it.' By this time the boys had reached the beautiful room with three beds in it. A dumpy little maiden with long earrings met them at the doorway, dropped them a curtsy, and passed out. She carried a long-handled thing that resembled a frying-pan with a cover. "'I am glad to see that,' said Van Monen to Ben. "'What?' "'Why, the warming-pan. It's full of hot ashes. She's been heating our beds.' "'Oh, a warming-pan, eh? Much obliged to her, I'm sure.' said Ben, too sleepy to make any further comment. Meantime, Ludwig still talked of the picture that had made such a strong impression upon him. He had seen it in a shop window during their walk. It was a poorly painted thing, representing two men tied back to back, standing on shipboard, surrounded by a group of seamen who were preparing to cast them together into the sea. This mode of putting prisoners to death was called Wutzbullen, or feet-washing, and was practiced by the Dutch upon the pirates of Dunkirk in 1605, and again by the Spaniards against the Dutch, in the horrible massacre that followed the siege of Harlem. Bad as the painting was, the expression upon the pirates' faces was well given. Sullen and despairing as they seemed, they wore such a cruel, malignant aspect that Ludwig had felt a secret satisfaction in contemplating their helpless condition. He might have forgotten the scene by this time but for that ill-looking man by the fire. Now, while he capered about, boy-like, and threw himself with an antic into his bed, he inwardly hoped that the Wutzpullen would not haunt his dreams. It was a cold, cheerless room. A fire had been newly kindled in the burnished stove, and seemed to shiver even while it was trying to burn. The windows, with their funny little panes, were bare and shiny, and the cold waxed floor looked like a sheet of yellow ice. Three rush-bottomed chairs stood stiffly against the wall, alternating with three narrow wooden bedsteads that made the room look like the deserted ward of a hospital. At any other time the boys would have found it quite impossible to sleep in pairs, especially in such narrow quarters, but to-night they lost all fear of being crowded and longed only to lay their weary bodies upon the feather-beds that lay lightly upon each cot. Had the boys been in Germany instead of Holland, they might have been covered, also, by a bed of down or feathers, 
This peculiar form of luxury was at that time adopted only by wealthy or eccentric Hollanders. Ludwig, as we have seen, had not quite lost his friskiness, but the other boys, after one or two feeble attempts at pillow-fighting, composed themselves for the night with the greatest dignity. Nothing like fatigue for making boys behave themselves. "'Good night, boys,' said Peter's voice from under the covers. "'Good night,' called back everybody but Jacob, who already lay snoring beside the captain. "'I say!' shouted Carl after a moment. "'Don't sneeze, anybody. Ludwig's in a fright.' "'No such thing,' retorted Ludwig in a smothered voice. Then there was a little whispered dispute, which was ended by Carl saying, "'For my part, I don't know what fear is. But you really are a timid fellow, Ludwig.' Ludwig grunted sleepily, but made no further reply. It was the middle of the night. The fire had shivered itself to death, and in place of its gleams little squares of moonlight lay upon the floor, slowly, slowly shifting their way across the room. Something else was moving also, but the boys did not see it. Sleeping boys keep but a poor lookout. During the early hours of the night, Jacob Poot had been gradually but surely winding himself with all the bed-covers. He now lay like a monster chrysalis beside the half-frozen Peter, who, accordingly, was skating with all his might over the coldest, bleakest of dreamland icebergs. Something else, I say, besides the moonlight, was moving across the bare, polished floor, moving not quite so slowly, but quite as stealthily. "'Wake up, Ludwig! The Wutzbullen is growing real!' No, Ludwig does not waken, but he moans in his sleep. Does not Karl hear it? Karl the brave, the fearless? No, Karl is dreaming of the race. And Jacob? Van Monen? Ben? Not they. They too are dreaming of the race, and Katrinka is singing through their dreams, laughing, flitting past them, now and then a wave from the great organ surges through their midst. Still the thing moves, slowly, slowly. Peter, Captain Peter, there is danger! Peter heard no call, but in his dream he slid a few thousand feet from one iceberg to another, and the shock awoke him. Whew! How cold he was! He gave a hopeless, desperate tug at the chrysalis in vain. Sheet, blanket, and spread were firmly round around Jacob's inanimate form. Clear moonlight, he thought. We shall have pleasant weather to-morrow. Hallo! What's that? He saw the moving thing, or rather, something black crouching upon the floor, for it had halted as Peter stirred. He watched in silence. Soon it moved again, nearer and nearer. It was a man crawling upon hands and feet. The captain's first impulse was to call out, but he took an instant to consider matters. The creeper had a shining knife in one hand. This was ugly, but Peter was naturally self-possessed. When the head turned, Peter's eyes were closed, as if in sleep. But at other times... Nothing could be keener, sharper, than the captain's gaze. Closer, closer crept the robber. His back was very near Peter now. The knife was laid softly upon the floor. One careful arm reached forth stealthily to drag the clothes from the chair by the captain's bed. The robbery was commenced. Now was Peter's time. Holding his breath, he sprang up and leaped with all his strength upon the robber's back, stunning the rascal with the force of the blow. To seize the knife was but a second's work. The robber began to struggle, but Peter sat like a giant astride the prostrate form. "'If you stir,' said the brave boy, in as terrible a voice as he could command, "'stir but one inch, I will plunge this knife into your neck. Boys, boys, wake up!' he shouted, still pressing down the black head, 
and holding the knife at pricking distance. "'Give us a hand! I've got him!' The chrysalis rolled over, but made no other sign. "'Up, boys!' cried Peter, never budging. "'Ludwig! Lumbert! Dunder! Are you all dead?' "'Dead? Not they. Van Monen and Ben were on their feet in an instant. "'Hey! What now?' they shouted. "'I've got a robber here,' said Peter coolly. "'Lie still, you scoundrel, or I'll slice your head off. "'Now, boys, cut out your bed-cord. Plenty of time. He's a dead man if he stirs.' Peter felt that he weighed a thousand pounds. So he did, with that knife in his hand. The man growled and swore, but dared not move. Ludwig was up by this time. He had a great jack-knife, the pride of his heart, in his breeches pocket. It could do good service now. They bared the bedstead in a moment. It was laced backward and forward with a rope. "'I'll cut it!' cried Ludwig, sawing away at the knot. "'Hold him tight, Peter!' "'Never fear!' answered the captain, giving the robber a warning prick. The boys were soon pulling at the rope like good fellows. It was out at last, a long, stout piece. "'Now, boys,' commanded the captain, "'lift up his rascally arms. Cross his hands over his back. That's right. Excuse me for being in the way. Tie them tight.' "'Yes, and his feet, too, the villain!' cried the boys in great excitement tying knot after knot with Herculean jerks. The prisoner changed his tone. "'Oh! Oh!' he moaned. "'Spare a poor sick man! I was but walking in my sleep!' "'Ugh!' grunted Lumbert, still tugging away at the rope. "'Asleep, were you? Well, we'll wake you up!' The man muttered fierce oaths between his teeth, then cried in a piteous voice, "'Unbuy me, good young masters. I have five little children at home. By St. Bavon I swear to give you each a ten-gilder piece if you will but free me.' "'Ha, ha!' laughed Peter. "'Ha, ha!' laughed the other boys. Then came threats, threats that made Ludwig fairly shudder, though he continued to bind and tie with redoubled energy. "'Hold up, my near housebreaker!' said Van Monen, in a warning voice. "'That knife is very near your throat. If you make the captain nervous, there is no telling what may happen.' The robber took the hint, and fell into a sullen silence. Just at this moment the chrysalis upon the bed stirred and sat erect. "'What's the matter?' he asked, without opening his eyes. "'Matter?' echoed Ludwig, half trembling, half laughing. "'Get up, Jacob. Here's work for you.' Come sit on this fellow's back while we get into our clothes. We're half perished. What fellow? <gasps> Donder! Hurrah for Poot! cried all the boys as Jacob, sliding quickly to the floor, bedclothes and all, took in the state of affairs at a glance, and sat heavily beside Peter on the robber's back. Oh, didn't the fellow groan then? No use in holding him down any longer, boys, said Peter, rising but bending as he did so to draw a pistol from the man's belt. "'You see, I've been keeping a guard over this pretty little weapon for the last ten minutes. It's cocked, and the least wriggle might have set it off. No danger now. I must dress myself. You and I, Lumbert, will go for the police. I'd no idea it was so cold.' "'Where's Carl?' asked one of the boys. They looked at one another. Carl certainly was not among them. "'Oh!' cried Ludwig, frightened at last. "'Where is he? Perhaps he's had a fight with the robber and got killed.' "'Not a bit of it,' said Peter quietly, as he buttoned his stout jacket. "'Look under the beds.' They did so. Carl was not there. Just then they heard a commotion on the stairway. Ben hastened to open the door. The landlord almost tumbled in. He was armed with a big blunderbuss. Two or three lodgers followed, then the daughter, with an upraised frying-pan in one hand and a candle in the other, and behind her, looking pale and frightened, the gallant Carl. "'There's your man, mine host,' said Peter, nodding toward the prisoner. Mine host raised his blunderbuss, the girl screamed, and Jacob, more nimble than usual, 
rolled quickly from the robber's back. "'Don't fire!' cried Peter. "'He is tied hand and foot. Let's roll him over and see what he looks like.' Carl stepped briskly forward with a bluster. "'Yes, we'll turn him over in a way he won't like. Lucky we've caught him.' "'Ha, ha!' laughed Ludwig. "'Where were you, Master Carl?' "'Where was I?' retorted Carl angrily. "'Why, I went to give the alarm, to be sure.' All the boys exchanged glances, but they were too happy and elated to say anything ill-natured. Carl certainly was bold enough now. He took the lead while three others aided him in turning the helpless man. While the robber lay face up, scowling and muttering, Ludwig took the candlestick from the girl's hand. "'I must have a good look at the beauty,' he said, drawing closer, but the words were no sooner spoken than he turned pale and started so violently that he almost dropped the candle. "'The Wutzpullen!' he cried. "'Why, boys, it's the man who sat by the fire!' "'Of course it is,' answered Peter. "'We counted out money before him like simpletons. But what have we to do with Wutzpullen, brother Ludwig? A month in jail is punishment enough.' The landlord's daughter had left the room. She now ran in, holding up a pair of huge wooden shoes. "'See, father,' she cried, "'here are his great ugly boats. It's the man that we put in the next room after the young masters went to bed. Ah, it was wrong to send the poor young gentleman up here so far out of sight and sound.' "'The scoundrel!' hissed the landlord. "'He has disgraced my house. I go for the police at once.' In less than fifteen minutes two drowsy-looking officers were in the room. After telling Mynheer Cleef that he must appear early in the morning with the boys and make his complaint before a magistrate, they marched off with their prisoner. One would think the captain and his band could have slept no more that night, but the mooring has not yet been found that can prevent youth and an easy conscience from drifting down the river of dreams. The boys were much too fatigued to let so slight a thing as capturing a robber bind them to wakefulness. They were soon in bed again, floating away to strange scenes made of familiar things. Ludwig and Karl had spread their bedding upon the floor. One had already forgotten the Wutzpullen, the race, everything. But Karl was wide awake. He heard the carillons ringing out their solemn nightly music and the watchman's noisy clapper putting in discord at the quarter hours. He saw the moonshine glide away from the window, and the red morning light come pouring in, and all the while he kept thinking, Pooh! What a goose I've made of myself! Carl Schummel, alone, with none to look or to listen, was not quite so grand a fellow as Carl Schummel strutting about in his boots. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Three of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Three Before the Court. You may believe that the landlord's daughter bestirred herself to prepare a good meal for the boys next morning. Mynheer had a Chinese gong that could make more noise than a dozen breakfast bells. Its hideous reveille, clanging through the house, generally startled the drowsiest lodgers into activity, but the maiden would not allow it to be sounded this morning. "'Let the brave young gentlemen sleep,' she said to the greasy kitchen boy. "'They shall be warmly fed when they awaken.' It was ten o'clock when Captain Peter and his band came straggling down one by one. "'A pretty hour,' said mine host gruffly. "'It is high time we were before the court. Fine business, this, for a respectable inn. You will testify truly, young masters, that you found most excellent fare and lodging at the Red Lion?' "'Of course we will,' 
answered Carl saucily, and pleasant company, too, though they visit at rather unseasonable hours. A stare and a huh was all the answer Mynheer made to this, but the daughter was more communicative. Shaking her earrings at Carl, she said sharply, "'Not so very pleasant either, Master Traveller, if you could judge by the way you ran away from it.' "'Impertinent creature!' hissed Carl under his breath, as he began busily to examine his skate-straps. Meantime the kitchen-boy, listening outside at the crack of the door, doubled himself with silent laughter. After breakfast the boys went to the police court, accompanied by Hergens Cleef and his daughter. Mynheer's testimony was principally to the effect that such a thing as a robber at the Red Lion had been unheard of until last night, and as for the Red Lion, it was a most respectable inn, as respectable as any house in Leyden. Each boy, in turn, told all that he knew of the affair, and identified the prisoner in the box as the same man who entered their room in the dead of night. Ludwig was surprised to find that the prisoner in the box was a man of ordinary size, especially after he had described him, under oath, to the court as a tremendous fellow with great square shoulders and legs of prodigious weight. Jacob swore that he was awakened by the robber kicking and thrashing upon the floor, and immediately afterward, Peter and the rest, feeling sorry that they had not explained the matter to their sleepy comrade, testified that the man had not moved a muscle from the moment the point of the dagger touched his throat, until, bound from head to foot, he was rolled over for inspection. The landlord's daughter made one boy blush, and all the court smile, by declaring, "'If it hadn't been for that handsome young gentleman there,' pointing to Peter, "'they might have all been murdered in their beds, for the dreadful man had a great shining knife most as long as your honour's arm and she believed the handsome young gentleman had struggled hard enough to get it away from him but he was too modest bless him to say so finally after a little questioning and cross-questioning from the public prosecutor the witnesses were dismissed and the robber was handed over to the consideration of the criminal court the scoundrel said carl savagely when the boys reached the street he ought to be sent to jail at once if I had been in your place, Peter, I certainly should have killed him outright. He was fortunate then in falling into gentler hands, was Peter's quiet reply. It appears he has been arrested before under a charge of housebreaking. He did not succeed in robbing this time, but he broke the door fastenings, and that I believe constitutes a burglary in the eyes of the law. He was armed with a knife, too, and that makes it worse for him, poor fellow. "'Poor fellow!' mimicked Carl. "'One would think he was your brother.' "'So he is my brother, and yours too, Carl Schummel, for that matter,' answered Peter, looking into Carl's eye. "'We cannot say what we might have become under other circumstances. We have been bolstered up from evil, since the hour we were born. A happy home and good parents might have made that man a fine fellow instead of what he is.' God grant that the law may cure and not crush him. "'Amen to that,' said Lombard heartily, while Ludwig van Hope looked at his brother in such a bright, proud way that Jacob Poot, who was an only son, wished from his heart that the little form buried in the old church at home had lived to grow up beside him. "'Huh,' said Carl. "'It's all very well to be saintly and forgiving and all that sort of thing.' but I'm naturally hard. All these fine ideas seem to rattle off me like hailstones, and it's nobody's business either if they do." Peter recognized a touch of good feeling in this clumsy concession. Holding out his hand, he said in a frank, hearty tone, "'Come, lad, shake hands, and let us be good friends, even if we don't exactly agree on all questions.' "'We do agree better than you think.' salt Carl as he returned Peter's grasp. "'All right,' responded Peter briskly. "'Now, Van Monen, we await Benjamin's wishes. Where would he like to go?' "'To the Egyptian Museum,' answered Lombard after holding a brief consultation with Ben. 
That is on the Bredstraat. To the museum let it be. Come, boys. End of chapter. Chapter Twenty Four of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Four The Beleaguered Cities. "'This open square before us,' said Lombard, as he and Ben walked on together, "'is pretty in summer, with its shady trees. They call it the Ruin. Years ago it was covered with houses, and the Roppenburg Canal here ran through the street. Well, one day a barge loaded with forty thousand pounds of gunpowder, bound for Delft, was lying alongside, and the bargemen took a notion to cook their dinner on the deck.' and before any one knew it, sir, the whole thing blew up, killing lots of persons and scattering about three hundred houses to the winds. "'What!' exclaimed Ben. "'Did the explosion destroy three hundred houses?' "'Yes, sir, my father was in Leyden at the time. He says it was terrible. The explosion occurred just at noon, and it was like a volcano. All this part of the town was on fire in an instant.' buildings tumbling down, and men, women, and children groaning under the ruins. The king himself came to the city and acted nobly, father says, staying out in the streets all night, encouraging the survivors in their efforts to arrest the fire, and rescue as many as possible from under the heaps of stone and rubbish. Through his means a collection for the benefit of the sufferers was raised throughout the kingdom, besides a hundred thousand guilders paid out of the treasury father was only nineteen years old then. It was in 1807, I believe, but he remembers it perfectly. A friend of his, Professor Luzak, was among the killed. They have a tablet erected to his memory in St. Peter's Church, farther on. The queerest thing you ever saw, with an image of the professor carved upon it, representing him just as he looked when he was found after the explosion. What a strange idea! Isn't Borahava's monument in St. Peter's also? I cannot remember. Perhaps Peter knows. The captain delighted Ben by saying that the monument was there, and that he thought they might be able to see it during the day. Lumbert, continued Peter, ask Ben if he saw Van der Werf's portrait at the town hall last night. No, said Lumbart. I can answer for him. It was too late to go in. I say, boys, it is really wonderful how much Ben knows. Why, he has told me a volume of Dutch history already. I'll wager he has the siege of Leyden at his tongue's end. His tongue must burn, then, interposed Ludwig, for if Bilderdijk's account is true, it was a pretty hot affair. Ben was looking at them with an inquiring smile. We are speaking of the siege of Leyden, explained Lumbert. "'Oh, yes!' said Ben, eagerly. "'I had forgotten all about it. "'This was the very place. "'Let's give old Van der Werf three cheers. Her Van Monen uttered a hasty, "'Hush!' "'and explained that, patriotic as the Dutch were, "'the police would soon have something to say "'if a party of boys cheered in the streets at midday. "'What? Not cheer Van der Werf?' cried Ben indignantly. One of the greatest chaps in history? Only think, didn't he hold out against those murderous Spaniards for months and months? There was the town, surrounded on all sides by the enemy, great black forts sending fire and death into the very heart of the city, but no surrender. Every man a hero, women and children too, brave and fierce as lions, provisions giving out, the very grass from between the paving stones gone, till people were glad to eat horses and cats and dogs and rats. Then came the plague, hundreds dying in the streets, but no surrender. 
then when they could bear no more, when the people, brave as they were, crowded about van der Werf in the public square begging him to give up, what did the noble old burgomaster say? I have sworn to defend this city, and with God's help I mean to do it. If my body can satisfy your hunger, take it, and divide it among you, but expect no surrender so long as I am alive. Hurrah! Hur ben was getting uproarious. Lumber playfully clapped his hand over his friend's mouth. The result was one of those quick india-rubber scuffles, fearful to behold, but delightful to human nature in its polywog state. "'What was the matter, Pen?' asked Jacob, hurrying forward. "'Oh, nothing at all,' panted Ben, except that Van Monen was afraid of starting an English riot in this orderly town. He stopped my cheering for old Van der Ver— "'Ja, ja, it ish no good to cheer, to make the noise for dat. You will she old Van der Dos likeness mit the Stadthuls. See old Van der Dos. I thought it was Van der Werf's picture they had there. Ja, responded Jacob. Van der Werf. Well, what of it? Both is just as good. Yes, uh, Van der Dos was a noble old Dutchman, but he was not Van der Werf. I know he defended the city like a brick, and— now vat for you shay dat, Penchaman? He no defend a shitty mit breek. He fight like good soldier mit his guns. You like make de fun mit everything's touch. No, no, no. I said he defended the city like a brick. That is very high praise, I would have you understand. We English call even the Duke of Wellington a brick. Jacob looked puzzled, but his indignation was already on the ebb. Well, it ish no matter. I no tink before soldier mean brick, but it ish no matter. Ben laughed good-naturedly, and seeing that his cousin was tired of talking in English, he turned to his friend of the two languages. Van Monen, they say the very carrier pigeons that brought news of relief to the besieged city are somewhere here in Leyden. I really should like to see them. Just think of it. At the very height of the trouble, if the wind didn't turn and blow in the waters, and drown hundreds of Spaniards, and enable the Dutch boats to sail in right over the land with men and provisions, to the very gates of the city. The pigeons, you know, did great service in bearing letters to and fro. I have read somewhere that they were reverently cared for from that day, and when they died they were stuffed and placed for safekeeping in the town hall. We must be sure to have a look at them." Van Monen laughed. "'On that principle, Ben, I suppose when you go to Rome you'll expect to see the identical goose who saved the capital. But it will be easy enough to see the pigeons. They are in the same building with van der Werf's portrait. Which was the greater defence, Ben, the siege of Leyden or the siege of Haarlem?' "'Well,' replied Ben thoughtfully, "'Van der Werf is one of my heroes. We all have our historical pets, you know, but I really think the siege of Haarlem brought out a braver, more heroic resistance even than the Leyden one. Besides, they set the Leyden sufferers an example of courage and fortitude, for their turn came first. I don't know much about the Haarlem siege, said Lombard, except that it was in 1573. Who beat? The Spaniards, said Ben. The Dutch had stood out for months. Not a man would yield, nor a woman either, for that matter. They shouldered arms and fought gallantly beside their husbands and fathers. Three hundred of them did duty under Cana Hesselaar, a great woman, and brave as Joan of Arc. All this time the city was surrounded by the Spaniards under Frederick of Toledo, son of that beauty, the Duke of Alva. Cut off from all possible help from without, there seemed to be no hope for the inhabitants, but they shouted defiance over the city walls. They even threw bread into the enemy's camps to show that they were not afraid of starvation. Up to the last they held out bravely, waiting for the help that never could come, growing bolder and bolder until their provisions were exhausted. Then it was terrible. In time hundreds of famished creatures fell dead in the streets, and the living had scarcely strength to bury them. 
At last they made the desperate resolution that, rather than perish by lingering torture, the strongest would form a square, placing the weakest in the centre, and rush in a body to their death, with a faint chance of being able to fight their way through the enemy. The Spaniards received a hint of this, and believing that there was nothing the Dutch would not dare to do, they concluded to offer terms. High time, I should think. Yes, with falsehood and treachery they soon obtained an entrance into the city, promising protection and forgiveness to all, except those who the citizens themselves would acknowledge as deserving of death. You don't say so, said Lombard, quite interested. That ended the business, I suppose. Not a bit of it, returned Ben, for the Duke of Alva had already given his son orders to show mercy to none. Ah, that was where the great Harlem massacre came in. I remember now. You can't wonder that the Hollanders dislike Spain when you read of the way they were butchered by Alva and his hosts, though I admit that our side sometimes retaliated terribly. But as I have told you before, I have a very indistinct idea of historical matters. Everything is confusion, from the flood to the Battle of Waterloo. One thing is plain, however, the Duke of Alva was about the worst specimen of a man that ever lived. "'That gives only a faint idea of him,' said Ben. "'But I hate to think of such a wretch. What if he had brains, and military skill, and all that sort of thing? Give me such men as Van der Werf, and what now?' "'Why,' said Van Monen, who was looking up and down the street in a bewildered way, "'We've walked right past the museum, and I don't see the boys. Let us go back.'" End of chapter Chapter 25 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or the Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 25. Leyden. The boys met at the museum, and were soon engaged in examining its extensive collection of curiosities, receiving a new insight into Egyptian life, ancient and modern. Ben and Lombard had often visited the British Museum, but that did not prevent them from being surprised at the richness of the laden collection. There were household utensils, wearing apparel, weapons, musical instruments, sarcophagi, and mummies of men, women, and cats, ibexes, and other creatures. They saw a massive gold armlet that had been worn by an Egyptian king at a time when some of these same mummies, perhaps, were nimbly treading the streets of Thebes, and jewels and trinkets such as Pharaoh's daughter wore, and the children of Israel borrowed when they departed out of Egypt. There were other interesting relics, from Rome and Greece, and some curious Roman pottery which had been discovered in digging near the Hague relics of the days when the countrymen of Julius Caesar had settled there. Where have they not settled? I, for one, would hardly be astonished if relics of the ancient Romans should some day be found deep under the grass growing around the Bunker Hill Monument. When the boys left this museum, they went to another, and saw a wonderful collection of fossil animals, skeletons, birds, minerals, precious stones, and other natural specimens but as they were not learned men, they could only walk about and stare, enjoy the little knowledge of natural history they possessed, and wish with all their hearts they had acquired more. Even the skeleton of the mouse puzzled Jacob. What wonder? He was not used to seeing the cat-fearing little creatures running about in their bones, and how could he ever have imagined their necks to be so queer? Besides the Museum of Natural History, there was St. Peter's Church to be visited, containing Professor Luzak's memorial, and Borahava's monument of white and black marble, with its urn and carved symbols of the four ages of life, and its medallion of Borahava, adorned with his favorite motto, Simplex Sigillum Veri. 
They also obtained admittance to a tea garden, which in summer was a favorite resort of the citizens, and, passing naked oaks and fruit trees, ascended to a high mound which stood in the center. This was the site of a round tower now in ruins, said by some to have been built by Hengist, the Anglo-Saxon king, and by others to have been the castle of one of the ancient counts of Holland. As the boys walked about on the top of its stone wall, they could get but a poor view of the surrounding city. The tower stood higher when, more than two centuries ago, the inhabitants of beleaguered Leyden shouted to the watcher on its top their wild, despairing cries, "'Is there any help? Are the waters rising? What do you see?' And for months he could only answer, "'No help. I see around us nothing but the enemy.' Ben pushed these thoughts away, and, resolutely looking down into the bare tea-garden, filled it in imagination with gay summer groups. He tried to forget old battle-clouds, and picture only curling wreaths of tobacco-smoke rising from among men, women, and children enjoying their tea and coffee in the open air. But a tragedy came in spite of him. Poot was bending over the edge of the high wall. It would be just like him to grow dizzy and tumble off. Ben turned impatiently away. If the fellow with his weak head knew no better than to be venturesome, why, let him tumble. Horror! What mean that heavy crashing sound? Ben could not stir. He could only gasp. Jacob! Jacob! cried another startled voice, and another. Ready to faint, Ben managed to turn his head. He saw a crowd of boys on the edge of the wall opposite, but Jacob was not there. "'Good heavens!' he cried, springing forward. "'Where is my cousin?' The crowd parted. It was only four boys, after all. There sat Jacob in their midst, holding his sides and laughing heartily. "'Did I frighten you all?' he said in his native Dutch. "'Well, I will tell you how it was. There was a big stone lying on the wall, and I put my—' my foot out just to push it a little you see and the first thing i knew down went the stone all the way to the bottom and left me sitting here on top with both my feet in the air if i had not thrown myself back at that moment i certainly should have rolled over after the stone well it is no matter help me up boys you're hurt said Ben, seeing a shade of seriousness pass over his cousin's face as they lifted him to his feet. Jacob tried to laugh again. Oh, no, I feels a little hurt when I stand up, but it ish no matter. The monument to Van der Verf in the Hooglandish Kirk was not accessible that day, but the boy spent a few pleasant moments in the Stadhuis or town hall a long, irregular structure somewhat in the Gothic style, uncouth in architecture, but picturesque from age. Its little steeple, tuneful with bells, seemed to have been borrowed from some other building, and hastily clapped on as a finishing touch. Ascending the grand staircase, the boys soon found themselves in a rather gloomy apartment, containing the masterpiece of Lucas van Leyden, or Hugens, a Dutch artist born three hundred and seventy years ago, who painted well when he was ten years of age, and became distinguished in art when only fifteen. This picture, called The Last Judgment, considering the remote age in which it was painted, is truly a remarkable production. The boys, however, were less interested in tracing out the merits of the work than they were in the fact of its being a triptych, that is, painted on three divisions, the two outer ones swung on hinges so as to close, when required, over the main portion. The historical pictures of Harald de Moor and other famous Dutch artists interested them for a while, and Ben had to be almost pulled away from the dingy old portrait of van der Werf. The town hall, as well as the Egyptian museum, is on the Bridgestraat, the longest and finest street in Leiden. It has no canal running through it, and the houses, painted in every variety of color, have a picturesque effect as they stand with their gable ends to the street. Some are very tall, with half their height and their step-like roofs. Others crouch before the public edifices and churches. 
being clean, spacious, well shaded, and adorned with many elegant mansions, it compares favourably with the finest portions of Amsterdam. It is kept scrupulously neat. Many of the gutters are covered with boards that open like trapdoors, and it is supplied with pumps surmounted with shining brass ornaments kept scoured and bright at the public cost. The city is intersected by numerous water roads formed by the river Rhine, there grown sluggish, fatigued by its long travel, but more than one hundred and fifty stone bridges reunite the dissevered streets. The same world-renowned river, degraded from the beautiful free-flowing Rhine, serves as a moat from the rampart that surrounds Leiden, and is crossed by drawbridges at the imposing gateways that give access to the city. Fine broad promenades, shaded by noble trees, border the canals and add to the retired appearance of the houses behind, heightening the effect of scholastic seclusion that seems to pervade the place. Ben, as he scanned the buildings on the Rappenburg Canal, was somewhat disappointed in the appearance of the great University of Leyden. But when he recalled its history, how, attended with all the pomp of a grand civic display, it had been founded by the Prince of Orange as a tribute to the citizens for the bravery displayed during the siege. When he remembered the great men in religion, learning, and science who had once studied there, and thought of the hundreds of students now sharing the benefits of its classes and its valuable scientific museums, he was quite willing to forgo architectural beauty, though he could not help feeling that no amount of it could have been misplaced on such an institution. Peter and Jacob regarded the building with an even deeper, more practical interest, for they were to enter it as students in the course of a few months. Poor Don Quixote would have run a helpless tilt in this part of the world, said Ben, after Lombard had been pointing out some of the oddities and beauties of the suburbs. It is all windmills. You remember his terrific contest with one, I suppose. No, said Lombard bluntly. Well, I don't either, that is, not definitely, but there was something of that kind in his adventures, and if there wasn't, there should have been. Look at them! how frantically they whirl their great arms. Just the thing to excite the crazy knight to mortal combat. It bewilders one to look at them. Help me to count all those we can see, von Monen. I want a big item for my notebook. And after a careful reckoning, superintended by all the party, Master Ben wrote in pencil, saw, December, ninety-eight windmills within full view of Leyden. He would have been glad to visit the old brick mill in which the painter Rembrandt was born, but he abandoned the project upon learning that it would take them out of their way. Few boys as hungry as Ben was by this time would hesitate long between Rembrandt's home a mile off and Tiffin close by. Ben chose the latter. After Tiffin they rested a while, and then took another, which for form's sake they called dinner. After dinner the boys sat warming themselves at the inn, all but Peter, who occupied the time in another fruitless search for Dr. Bookman. This over, the party once more prepared for skating. They were thirteen miles from The Hague, and not as fresh as when they had left Brook early the previous day, but they were in good spirits, and the ice was excellent. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Six of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or the Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Six The Palace in the Wood. As the boys skated onward, they saw a number of fine country seats, all decorated and surrounded according to the duchest of Dutch taste, but impressive to look upon, with their great formal houses, elaborate gardens, 
square hedges, and wide ditches, some crossed by a bridge, having a gate in the middle to be carefully locked at night. These ditches, everywhere traversing the landscape, had long ago lost their summer film and now shone under the sunlight like trailing ribbons of glass. The boys travelled bravely, all the while performing the surprising feat of producing gingerbread from their pockets and causing it to vanish instantly. Twelve miles were passed. A few more long strokes would take them to the Hague, when von Monen proposed that they should vary their course by walking into the city through the Bosch. Agreed! cried one and all, and their skates were off in a twinkling. The Bosch is a grand park or wood, nearly two miles long, containing the celebrated house in the wood, Huls in Bosch, sometimes used as a royal residence. The building, though plain outside for a palace, is elegantly furnished within and finely frescoed, that is, the walls and ceiling are covered with groups and designs painted directly upon them while the plaster was fresh. Some of the rooms are tapestried with Chinese silks, beautifully embroidered. One contains a number of family portraits, among them a group of royal children who in time were orphaned by a certain axe, which figures very frequently in European history. These children were painted many times by the Dutch artist Van Dyck, who was court painter to their father, Charles I of England beautiful children they were. What a deal of trouble the English nation would have been spared had they been as perfect in heart and soul as they were in form. The park surrounding the palace is charming, especially in summer, for flowers and birds make it bright as fairyland. Long rows of magnificent oaks rear their proud heads, conscious that no profaning hand will ever bring them low. In fact, the wood has for ages been held as an almost sacred spot. Children are never allowed to meddle with its smallest twig. The axe of the woodman has never resounded there. Even war and riot have passed it reverently, pausing for a moment in their devastating way. Philip of Spain, while he ordered Dutchmen to be mowed down by hundreds, issued a mandate that not a bough of the beautiful wood should be touched and once, when in a time of great necessity the state was about to sacrifice it to assist in filling a nearly exhausted treasury, the people rushed to the rescue, and nobly contributed the required amount, rather than that the Bosch should fall. What wonder, then, that the oaks have a grand, fearless air? Birds from all Holland have told them how, elsewhere, trees are cropped and bobbed into shape, but they are untouched." Year after year they expand in unclipped luxuriance and beauty. Their wide-spreading foliage, alive with song, casts a cool shade over lawn and pathway, or bows to its image in the sunny ponds. Meanwhile, as if to reward the citizens for allowing her to have her way for once, nature departs from the invariable level, wearing gracefully the ornaments that have been reverently bestowed upon her. So the lawn slopes in a velvety green, the paths wind in and out, flower beds glow and send forth perfume, and ponds and sky look at each other in mutual admiration. Even on that winter day the Bosch was beautiful. Its trees were bare, but beneath them still lay the ponds, every ripple smoothed into glass. The blue sky was bright overhead, and as it looked down through the thicket of boughs, it saw another blue sky, not nearly so bright, looking up from the dim thicket under the ice. Never had the sunset appeared more beautiful to Peter than when he saw it exchanging farewell glances with the windows and shining roofs of the city before him. Never had the Hague itself seemed more inviting. He was no longer Peter van Hope, going to visit a great city, nor a fine young gentleman bent on sightseeing. He was a knight, an adventurer, travel-soiled and weary, a hop of my thumb grown large, a fortunatus approaching the enchanted castle where luxury and ease awaited him, for his own sister's house was not half a mile away. "'At last, boys!' he cried in high glee. "'We may hope for a royal resting-place. 
good beds, warm rooms, and something fit to eat. I never realized before what a luxury such things are. Our lodgings at the Red Lion have made us appreciate our own homes. End of chapter Chapter 27 of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 27 The Merchant Prince and the Sister Princess. Well might Peter feel that his sister's house was like an enchanted castle. Large and elegant as it was, a spell of quiet hung over it. The very lion crouching at its gate seemed to have been turned into stone through magic. Within it was guarded by genii, in the shape of red-faced servants, who sprang silently forth at the summons of bell or knocker. There was a cat also, who appeared as knowing as any puss in boots, and a brass gnome in the hall whose business it was to stand with outstretched arms ready to receive sticks and umbrellas. Safe within the walls bloomed a garden of delight, where the flowers firmly believed it was summer, and a sparkling fountain was laughing merrily to itself because Jack Frost could not find it. There was a sleeping beauty, too, just at the time of the boy's arrival, but when Peter, like a true prince, flew lightly up the stairs and kissed her eyelids, the enchantment was broken. The princess became his own good sister, and the fairy castle just one of the finest, most comfortable houses of The Hague. As may well be believed, the boys received the heartiest of welcomes. After they had conversed a while with their lively hostess, one of the genii summoned them to a grand repast in a red-curtained room where floor and ceiling shone like polished ivory, and the mirrors suddenly blossomed into rosy-cheeked boys as far as the eye could reach. They had caviar now, and salmagundi, and sausage and cheese, besides salad and fruit, and biscuit and cake. How the boys could partake of such a medley was a mystery to Ben, for the salad was sour, and the cake was sweet. The fruit was dainty, and the salmagundi heavy with onions and fish. But while he was wondering, he made a hearty meal, and was soon absorbed in deciding whether he really preferred the coffee or the anisette cordial. It was delightful, too, this taking one's food from dishes of frosted silver and liqueur glasses from which Titania herself might have sipped. The young gentleman afterward wrote to his mother that, pretty and choice as things were at home, he had never known what cut glass, china, and silver services were until he visited the Hague. Of course, Peter's sister soon heard all of the boys' adventures, how they had skated over forty miles and seen rare sights on the way, how they had lost their purse and found it again, how one of the party had fallen and given them an excuse for a grand sail in an ice-boat, how, above all, they had caught a robber and so, for a second time, saved their slippery purse. "'And now, Peter,' said the lady when the story was finished, "'you must write at once to tell the good people of Brook that your adventures have reached their height, that you and your fellow-travellers have all been taken prisoners.' The boys looked startled. <laughs> "'Indeed, I shall do no such thing,' laughed Peter. "'We must leave to-morrow at noon.' But the sister had already decided differently, and a Holland lady is not to be easily turned from her purpose. In short, she held forth such strong temptations, and was so bright and cheerful, and said so many coaxing and unanswerable things, both in English and Dutch, that the boys were all delighted when it was settled that they should remain at the Hague for at least two days. Next the grand skating race was talked over. Mevrouw van Gend gladly promised to be present on the occasion. "'I shall witness your triumph, Peter,' she said, "'for you are the fastest skater I ever knew.' Peter blushed, and gave a slight cough as Carl answered for him. "'Ah, Mevrouw, he is swift, but all the brook boys are fine skaters. 
even the rag-pickers. And he thought bitterly of poor Hans. The lady laughed. "'That will make the race all the more exciting,' she said. "'But I shall wish each of you to be the winner.' At this moment her husband, my dear Van Gend, came in, and the enchantment falling upon the boys was complete. The invisible fairies of the household at once clustered about them, whispering that Jasper van Gent had a heart as young and fresh as their own, and if he loved anything in this world more than industry, it was sunshine and frolic. They hinted also something about his having a heart full of love and a head full of wisdom, and finally gave the boys to understand that when Mynheer said a thing, he meant it. Therefore his frank, "'Well, now, this is pleasant,' as he shook hands with them all, made the boys feel quite at home and as happy as squirrels. There were fine paintings in the drawing-room, an exquisite statuary, and portfolios filled with rare Dutch engravings, besides many beautiful and curious things from China and Japan. The boys felt that it would require a month to examine all the treasures of the apartment. Ben noticed with pleasure English books lying upon the table. He saw also, over the carved upright piano, life-size portraits of William of Orange and his English queen, a sight that, for a time, brought England and Holland side by side in his heart. William and Mary have left a halo around the English throne to this day, he the truest patriot that ever served an adopted country, she the noblest wife that ever sat upon a British throne, up to the time of Victoria and Albert the Good. As Ben looked at the pictures, he remembered accounts he had read of King William's visit to The Hague in the winter of 1691. He who sang the Battle of Ivry had not yet told the glowing story of that day, but Ben knew enough of it to fancy that he could almost hear the shouts of the delighted populace as he looked from the portraits to the street, which at this moment was aglow with a bonfire kindled in a neighboring square. That royal visit was one never to be forgotten. For two years William of Orange had been monarch of a foreign land, his head working faithfully for England, but his whole heart yearning for Holland. Now, when he sought its shores once more, the entire nation bade him welcome. Multitudes flocked to the Hague to meet him. Many thousands came sliding or skating along the frozen canals from Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Leyden, Haarlem, Delft, from Macaulay's History of England. All day long the festivities of the capital were kept up, the streets were gorgeous with banners, evergreen arches, trophies, and mottoes of welcome and emblems of industry. William saw the deeds of his ancestors and scenes of his own past life depicted on banners and tapestries along the streets. At night superb fireworks were displayed upon the ice. Its glassy surface was like a mirror. Sparkling fountains of light sprang up from below to meet the glittering cascades leaping upon it. Then a feathery fire of crimson and green shook millions of rubies and emeralds into the ruddy depths of the ice, and all this time the people were shouting, "'God bless William of Orange! Long live the King!' They were half mad with joy and enthusiasm. William, their own prince, their stadtholder, had become the ruler of three kingdoms, he had been victorious in council and in war, and now, in his hour of greatest triumph, had come as a simple guest to visit them. The king heard their shouts with a beating heart. It is a great thing to be beloved by one's country. His English courtiers complimented him upon his reception. Yes, said he, but the shouting is nothing to what it would have been if Mary had been with me. While Ben was looking at the portraits, Mynheer van Gent was giving the boys an account of a recent visit to Antwerp, as it was the birthplace of Quentin Matzis, the blacksmith who for love of an artist's daughter studied until he became a great painter. The boys asked their host if he had seen any of Matzis's works. "'Yes, indeed,' he replied, "'and excellent they are. His famous triptych in a chapel of the Antwerp Cathedral with the descent from the cross on the center paddle, is especially fine, but I confess I was more interested in his well. "'What well, mynheer?' asked Ludwig. 
one in the heart of the city, near the same cathedral, whose lofty steeple is of such delicate workmanship that the French emperor said it reminded him of Mechlin lace. The well is covered with a Gothic canopy, surmounted by the figure of a knight in full armor. It is all of metal, and proves that Matsys was an artist at the forge as well as at the easel. Indeed, his great fame is mainly derived from his miraculous skill as an artificer in iron. Next, Mynheer showed the boy some exquisite Berlin castings, which he had purchased in Antwerp. They were iron jewelry, and very delicate, beautiful medallions designed from rare paintings, bordered with fine tracery and openwork, worthy, he said, of being worn by the fairest lady of the land. Consequently, the necklace was handed with a bow and a smile to the blushing Mevro von Ghent. Something in the lady's aspect, as she bent her bright young face over the gift, caused Mynheer to say earnestly, "'I can read your thoughts, sweetheart.' She looked up in playful defiance. "'Ah, now I am sure of them. You were thinking of those noble-hearted women, but for whom Prussia might have fallen. I know it by that proud light in your eye.' The proud light in my eye placed me false, then," she answered. I had no such grand matter in my mind. To confess the simple truth, I was only thinking how lovely this necklace would be with my blue brocade. So, so, exclaimed the rather crestfallen spouse. But I can think of the other, Jasper, and it will add a deeper value to your gift. You remember the incident, do you not, Peter? how when the French were invading Prussia, and for lack of means the country was unable to defend itself against the enemy, the women turned the scale by pouring their plate and jewels into the public treasury. Aha! thought Mynheer, as he met his vrouw's kindling glance. The proud light is there now, in earnest. Peter remarked maliciously that the women had still proved true to their vanity on that occasion, for jewelry they would have. If gold or silver were wanted by the kingdom, they would relinquish it, and use iron, but they could not do without their ornaments. "'What of that?' said the Frau, kindling again. "'It is no sin to love beautiful things if you adapt your material to circumstances. All I have to say is, the women saved their country, and indirectly introduced a very important branch of manufacture. Is that not so, Jasper?' "'Of course it is, sweetheart,' said Mynheer. But Peter needs no word of mine to convince him that all the world over women have never been found wanting in their country's hour of trial, though, bowing to Mevrouw, his own countrywomen stand foremost in the records of female patriotism and devotion. Then, turning to Ben, the host talked with him in English of the fine old Belgian city. Among other things he told the origin of its name. Ben had been taught that Antwerp was derived from Antwerf, meaning on the wharf, but Mynheer van Ghent gave him a far more interesting derivation. It appears that about three thousand years ago a great giant, named Antigonus, lived on the river Scheldt, on the site of the present city of Antwerp. This giant claimed half the merchandise of all navigators who passed his castle. Of course, some were inclined to oppose this simple regulation. In such cases, Antigonus, by way of teaching them to practice better banners next time, cut off and threw into the river the right hands of the merchants. Thus Handwerpen, or hand-throwing, changed to Antwerp, came to be the name of the place. The escutcheon, or arms of the city, has two hands upon it. What better proof than this could one have of the truth of the story, especially when one wishes to believe it? When Mynheer van Ghent had related in two languages the story of Antwerp, he was tempted to tell other legends, some in English, some in Dutch, and so the moments, borne upon the swift shoulders of gnomes and giants, glided rapidly away toward bedtime. It was hard to break up so pleasant a party, but the van Ghent household moved with the regularity of clockwork. There was no lingering at the threshold when the cordial good night was spoken. Even while our boys were mounting the stairs, the invisible household fairies again clustered around them, whispering that system and regularity had been chief builders of the master's prosperity. Beautiful chambers with three beds in them were not to be found in this mansion. 
Some of the rooms contained two, but each visitor slept alone. Before morning the motto of the party evidently was, Every boy his own chrysalis, and Peter, at least, was not sorry to have it so. Tired as he was, Ben, after noting a curious bell-rope in the corner, began to examine his bedclothes. Each article filled him with astonishment. The exquisitely fine pillow-spread trimmed with costly lace, and embroidered with a gorgeous crest and initial. The deck-bed cover, a great silk bag large as the bed stuffed with swan's down and the pink satin quilts, embroidered with garlands of flowers. He could scarcely sleep for thinking what a queer little bed it was, so comfortable and pretty, too, with all its queerness. In the morning he examined the top coverlet with care, for he wished to send home a description of it in his next letter. It was a beautiful Japanese spread, marvellous in texture, as well as in its variety of brilliant colouring, and worth, as Ben afterward learned, not less than three hundred dollars. The floor was of polished wooden mosaic, nearly covered with a rich carpet bordered with thick black fringe. Another room displayed a margin of satin wood around the carpet. Hung with tapestry, its walls of crimson silk were topped with a gilded cornice which shot down gleams of light far into the polished floor. Over the doorway of the room in which Jacob and Ben slept was a bronze stork, that, with outstretched neck, held a lamp to light the guests into the apartment. Between the two narrow beds of carved white wood and ebony stood the household treasure of the Van Gents, a massive oaken chair upon which the Prince of Orange had once sat during a council meeting. Opposite stood a quaintly carved clothes-press, waxed and polished to the utmost, and filled with precious stores of linen. Beside it a table holding a large Bible whose great golden clasps looked poor compared with its solid, ribbed binding made to outlast six generations. There was a ship model on the mantel-shelf, and over it hung an old portrait of Peter the Great, who, you know, once gave the dockyard cats of Holland a fine chance to look at a king, which is one of the special prerogatives of cats. Peter, though Tsar of Russia, was not too proud to work as a common shipwright in the dockyards of Sardam and Amsterdam, that he might be able to introduce among his countrymen Dutch improvements in shipbuilding. It was this willingness to be thorough even in the smallest beginnings that earned for him the title of Peter the Great. Peter the Little, comparatively speaking, was up first the next morning. Knowing the punctual habits of his brother-in-law, he took good care that none of the boys should oversleep themselves. A hard task he found it to wake Jacob Poot, but after pulling that young gentleman out of bed, and, with Ben's help, dragging him about the room for a while, he succeeded in arousing him. While Jacob was dressing, and moaning within him because the felt slippers, provided him as a guest, were too tight for his swollen feet, Peter wrote to inform their friends at Brook of the safe arrival of his party at The Hague. He also begged his mother to send word to Hans Brinker that Dr. Bookman had not yet reached Leyden, but that a letter containing Hans's message had been left at the hotel where the doctor always lodged during his visits to the city. "'Tell him also,' wrote Peter, "'that I shall call there again as I pass through Leyden. The poor boy seemed to feel sure that the maester would hasten to save his father, but we, who know the gruff old gentleman better, may be confident he will do no such thing. It would be a kindness to send a visiting physician from Amsterdam to the cottage at once, if you frau. In Holland women of the lower grades of society do not take the title of Mrs. or Mevrouw when they marry, as with us. They assume their husbands' names but are still called Miss or Juffrouw. If Euphrau Brinker will consent to receive any but the great king of the maesters, as Dr. Bookman certainly is. You know, mother, added Peter, that I have always considered Sister Van Gent's house as rather quiet and lonely, but I assure you it is not so now. He says we make him wish that he had a house full of boys of his own. He has promised to let us ride on his noble black horses. They are gentle as kittens, he says, if one have but a firm touch at the rein. Ben, according to Jacob's account, is a glorious rider, and your son Peter is not a very bad hand at the business. 
so we two are to go out together this morning mounted like knights of old. After we return, Brother Van Ghent says he will lend Jacob his English pony, and obtain three extra horses, and all of the party are to trot about the city in a grand cavalcade led on by him. He will ride the black horse which father sent him from Friesland. My sister's pretty roan with a long white tail is lame, and she will ride none other, else she would accompany us. I could scarcely close my eyes last night after sister told me of the plan. Only the thought of poor Hans Brinker and his sick father checked me. But for that I could have sung for joy. Ludwig has given us a name already, the Brook Cavalry. We flatter ourselves that we shall make an imposing appearance, especially in single file. The Brook Cavalry were not disappointed. Mynheer van Ghent readily procured good horses, and all the boys could ride, though none was as perfect horsemen, or horse-boys, as Peter and Ben. They saw the hag to their heart's content, and the hag saw them, expressing its approbation loudly, through the mouths of small boys and cart-dogs, silently, through bright eyes that, not looking very deeply into things, shone as they looked at the handsome Carl, and twinkled with fun as a certainly portly youth with shaking cheeks rode past bumpity bumpity bump on their return the boys pronounced the great porcelain stove in the family sitting-room a decidedly useful piece of furniture for they could gather around it and get warm without burning their noses or bringing on chilblains it was so very large that although hot elsewhere it seemed to send out warmth by the houseful its pure white sides and polished brass rings made it a pretty object to look upon, notwithstanding the fact that our ungrateful Ben, while growing thoroughly warm and comfortable beside it, concocted a satirical sentence for his next letter, to the effect that a stove in Holland must, of course, resemble a great tower of snow, or it wouldn't be in keeping with the oddity of the country. To describe all the boys saw and did on that day and the next, would render this little book a formidable volume indeed. They visited the brass cannon foundry, saw the liquid fire poured into moulds, and watched the smiths who, half naked, stood in the shadow like demons playing with flame. They admired the grand public buildings and massive private houses, the elegant streets and noble Bosch, pride of all beauty-loving Hollanders. The palace with its brilliant mosaic floors, its frescoed ceilings and gorgeous ornaments filled Ben with delight. He was surprised that some of the churches were so very plain, elaborate sometimes in external architecture, but bare and bleak within with their blank whitewashed walls. If there were no printed record, the churches of Holland would almost tell her story. I will not enter into the subject here, except to say that Ben, who had read of her struggles and wrongs and of the terrible retribution she had from time to time dealt forth, could scarcely tread a Holland town without mentally leaping horror-stricken over the bloody stepping-stones of its history. He could not forget Philip of Spain, nor the Duke of Alva, even while rejoicing in the prosperity that followed the liberation. He looked into the meekest of Dutch eyes for something of the fire that once lit the haggard faces of those desperate, lawless men who, wearing with pride the title of beggars, which their oppressors had mockingly cast upon them, became the terror of land and sea. In Haarlem he had wondered that the air did not still resound with the cries of Alva's three thousand victims. In Leyden his heart had swelled in sympathy as he thought of the long procession of scarred and famished creatures who, after the siege, with Adrian van der Werf at their head, tottered to the great church to sing a glorious anthem because Leyden was free. He remembered that this was even before they had tasted the bread brought by the Dutch ships. They would praise God first, then eat. Thousands of trembling voices were raised in glad thanksgiving. For a moment it swelled higher and higher, then suddenly changed to sobbing. Not one of all the multitude could sing another note. But who shall say that anthem, even to its very end, was not heard in heaven? Here, in The Hague, other thoughts came to Ben, of how Holland in later years unwillingly put her head under the French yoke, and how, galled and lashed past endurance, 
she had resolutely jerked it out again. He liked her for that. What nation of any spirit, thought he, could be expected to stand such work, paying all her wealth into a foreign treasury, and yielding up the flower of her youth under foreign conscription? It was not so very long ago, either, since English guns had been heard booming close by in the German Ocean. Well, all the fighting was over at last. Holland was a snug little monarchy now in her own right, and Ben, for one, was glad of it. Arrived at this charitable conclusion, he was prepared to enjoy to the utmost all the wonders of her capital. He quite delighted Mynheer van Ghent with his hearty and intelligent interest. So, in fact, did all the boys, for a merrier, more observant party never went sightseeing. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Eight of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Eight Through the Hague. The picture gallery in the Mauritshuls, a building erected by Prince Maurice of Nassau, one of the finest in the world, seemed to have only flashed by the boys during a two-hour visit, so much was there to admire and examine. As for the royal cabinet of curiosities in the same building, they felt that they had but glanced at it, though they were there nearly half a day. It seemed to them that Japan had poured all her treasures within its walls. For a long period Holland, always foremost in commerce, was the only nation allowed to have any intercourse with Japan. One can well forego a journey to that country if he can but visit the museum at The Hague. Room after room is filled with collections from the Hermit Empire, costumes peculiar to various ranks and pursuits, articles of ornament, household utensils, weapons, armor, and surgical instruments. There is also an ingenious Japanese model of the island of Desina, the Dutch factory in Japan. It appears almost as the island itself would if seen through a reversed opera glass, and makes one feel like a gulliver coming unexpectedly upon a Japanese lilliput. There you see hundreds of people in native costumes, standing, kneeling, stooping, reaching, all at work, or pretending to be and their dwellings, even their very furniture, spread out before you plain as day. In another room a huge tortoise-shell dollhouse, fitted up in Dutch style, and inhabited by dignified Dutch dolls, stands ready to tell you at a glance how people live in Holland. Gretel, Hilda, Katrinka, even the proud Richie Korbs would have been delighted with this, but Peter and his gallant band passed it by without a glance. The war implements had the honor of detaining them for an hour. Such clubs, such murderous crits, or daggers, such firearms, and above all, such wonderful Japanese swords, quite capable of performing the accredited Japanese feat of cutting a man in two at a single stroke. There were Chinese and other Oriental curiosities in the collection. Native historical relics, too, upon which our young Dutchmen gazed very soberly though they were secretly proud to show them to Ben. There was a model of the cabin at Saradam, in which Peter the Great lived during his short career as shipbuilder. Also, wallets and bowls, once carried by the beggar confederates, who, uniting under the Prince of Orange, had freed Holland from the tyranny of Spain. The sword of Admiral von Speyk, who about ten years before had perished in voluntarily blowing up his own ship and von Tromp's armor with the marks of bullets upon it. Jacob looked around, hoping to see the broom which the plucky admiral fastened to his masthead, but it was not there. The waistcoat which William III of England wore during the last days of his life possessed great interest for Ben, and one and all gazed with a mixture of reverence and horror-worship at the identical clothing worn by William the Silent when he was murdered at Delft by Balthazar Kiratz. 
William, Prince of Orange, who became King of England, was a great-grandson of William the Silent, Prince of Orange, who was murdered by Kirarts, or Gerard, July 10, 1584. A tawny leather doublet and plain surcoat of grey cloth, a soft felt hat, and a high neck ruff from which hung one of the beggar's medals, these were not in themselves very princely objects, though the doublet had a tragic interest from its dark stains and bullet holes. Ben could readily believe, as he looked upon the garments, that the silent prince, true to his greatness of character, had been exceedingly simple in his attire. His aristocratic prejudices were, however, decidedly shocked when Lambert told him of the way in which William's bride first entered the Hague. The beautiful Louisa de Coligny, whose father and former husband both had fallen at the massacre of St. Bartholomew, was coming to be fourth wife to the prince, and of course, said Lambert, we Hollanders were too gallant to allow the lady to enter the town on foot. No, sir, we sent, or rather my ancestors did, a clean open post-wagon to meet her, with a plank across it for her to sit upon. <laughs> Very gallant indeed, exclaimed Ben, with almost a sneer in his polite laugh. And she the daughter of an admiral of France. Was she? Upon my word, I had nearly forgotten that. But, you see, Holland had very plain ways in the good old time. In fact, we are a very simple, frugal people to this day. The Van Ghent establishment is a decided exception, you know. A very agreeable exception, I think, said Ben. Certainly, certainly. But between you and me, my dear Van Ghent, though he has wrought his own fortunes, can afford to be magnificent and yet be frugal. Exactly so, said Ben profoundly, at the same time stroking his upper lip and chin, which latterly he believed had been showing delightful and unmistakable signs of coming dignities. While tramping on foot through the city, Ben often longed for a good English sidewalk. Here, as in the other towns, there was no curb, no raised pavement for foot travellers, but the streets were clean and even, and all vehicles were kept scrupulously within a certain tract. Strange to say, there were nearly as many sleds as wagons to be seen, though there was not a particle of snow. The sleds went scraping over the bricks or cobblestones, some provided with an apparatus in front for sprinkling water, to diminish the friction, and some rendered less musical by means of a dripping oil-rag, which the driver occasionally applied to the runners. Ben was surprised at the noiseless way in which Dutch laborers do their work. Even around the warehouses and docks there was no bustle, no shouting from one to another. A certain twitch of the pipe, or turn of the head, or, at most, a raising of the hand, seemed to be all the signal necessary. Entire loads of cheeses or herrings are pitched from cart or canal boat into the warehouses without a word, but the passer-by must take his chance of being pelted, for a Dutchman seldom looks before or behind him while engaged at work. Poor Jacob Poot, who seemed destined to bear all the mishaps of the journey, was knocked nearly breathless by a great cheese which a fat Dutchman was throwing to a fellow labourer, but he recovered himself and passed on without evincing the least indignation. Ben professed great sympathy upon the occasion, but Jacob insisted that it was naughting. Then why did you screw your face so when it hit you? What for screw mine face? repeated Jacob soberly. Vy, it vash de, de... That what? insisted Ben maliciously. Vy... De, 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 what you call this, what you taste mit de nose? Ben laughed. Oh, you mean the smell. Yes, that is it, said Jacob eagerly. It vash de smell. I draw mine face for dat. Ha, 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 roared Ben. That's a good one. A Dutch boy smell a cheese. You can never make me believe that. Vell, it is no matter replied Jacob, trudging on beside Ben in perfect good humour. Wait till you hit mit cheese, dat ish all. Soon he added pathetically, Penchiman, I no likes to be called touch. Dat ish no goot. I be a Hollander. 
Just as Ben was apologizing, Lumbert hailed him. "'Hold up! Ben, here is the fish market. There is not much to be seen at this season, but we can take a look at the storks, if you wish.' Ben knew that storks were held in peculiar reverence in Holland, and that the bird figured upon the arms of the capital. He had noticed cartwheels placed upon the roofs of Dutch cottages to entice storks to settle upon them. He had seen their huge nests, too, on many a thatched gable roof from Brook to The Hague. But it was winter now. The nests were empty. No greedy birdlings opened their mouths, or rather their heads, at the approach of a great white-winged thing, with outstretched neck and legs, bearing a dangling something for their breakfast. The long bills were far away, picking up food on African shores, and before they would return in the spring Ben's visit to the land of dykes would be over. Therefore he pressed eagerly forward, as von Monen led the way through the fish market, anxious to see if storks in Holland were anything like the melancholy specimens he had seen in the zoological gardens of London. It was the same old story. A tamed bird is a sad bird, say what you will. These storks lived in a sort of kennel, chained by the feet like felons, though supposed to be honoured by being kept at the public expense. In summer they were allowed to walk about the market, where the fish stalls were like so many free dining saloons to them. Untasted delicacies in the form of raw fish and butcher's offal lay about their kennels now, but the city guests preferred to stand upon one leg curving back their long necks and leaning their heads sideways in a blinking reverie. How gladly they would have changed their petted state for the busy life of some hard-working stork mother or father bringing up a troublesome family on the roof of a rickety old building where flapping windmills frightened them half to death every time they ventured forth on a frolic. Ben soon made up his mind, and rightly, too, that the Hague, with its fine streets and public parks shaded with elms, was a magnificent city. The prevailing costume was like that of London or Paris, and its British ears were many a time cheered by the music of British words. The shops were different in many respects from those on Oxford Street and the Strand, but they often were illumined by a printed announcement that English was spoken within. Others proclaimed themselves to have London stout for sale, and one actually promised to regale its customers with English roast beef. Over every possible shop door was the never-failing placard, Tabac de Coupe, Tobacco to be Sold. Instead of colored glass globes in the windows, or high jars of leeches, the drug stores held a gaping Turk's head at the entrance or, if the establishment was particularly fine, a wooden mandarin entire, indulging in a full yawn. Some of these queer faces amused Ben exceedingly. They seemed to have just swallowed a dose of physic, but Van Monen declared he could not see anything funny about them. A druggist showed his sense by putting a gaper before his door, so that his place would be known at once as an apotheque, and that was all there was to it. Another thing attracted Ben, the milkmen's carts. These were small affairs, filled with shiny brass kettles, or stone jars, and drawn by dogs. The milkman walked meekly beside his cart, keeping his dog in order, and delivering the milk to customers. Certain fish dealers had dog carts also, and when a herring dog chanced to meet a milk dog, he invariably put on airs and growled as he passed him. Sometimes a milk dog would recognize an acquaintance before another milk cart across the street, and then how the kettles would rattle, especially if they were empty. Each dog would give a bound, and, never caring for his master's whistle, insist upon meeting the other halfway. Sometimes they contented themselves with an inquisitive sniff, but generally the smaller dog made an affectionate snap-snap at the larger one's ear or a friendly tussle was engaged in by way of exercise. Then woe to the milk kettles, and woe to the dogs. The whipping over, each dog, expressing his feelings as best as he could, would trot demurely back to his work. If some of these animals were eccentric in their ways, others were remarkably well behaved. In fact, there was a school for dogs in the city, established expressly for training them. 
Ben probably saw some of its graduates. Many a time he noticed a span of barkers trotting along the street with all the dignity of horses, obeying the slightest hint of the man walking briskly beside them. Sometimes, when their load was delivered, the dealer would jump in the cart and have a fine drive to his home beyond the gates of the city. And sometimes, I regret to say, a patient fro would trudge beside the cart with a fish-basket upon her head and a child in her arms, while her lord enjoyed his drive, carrying no heavier burden than a stumpy clay pipe, the smoke of which mounted lovingly into her face. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Nine of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Nine A Day of Rest. The sightseeing came to an end at last, and so did our boys' visit to The Hague. They had spent three happy days and nights with the Van Gens, and, strange to say, had not once, in all that time, put on skates. The third day had indeed been one of rest. The noise and bustle of the city was hushed. Sweet Sunday bells sent blessed, tranquil thoughts into their hearts. Ben felt, as he listened to their familiar music, that the Christian world is one after all, however divided by sects and differences it may be. As the clock speaks every one's native language in whatever land it may strike the hour, so church bells are never foreign if our hearts but listen. Led on by these clear voices, our party, with Mefro van Ghent and her husband, trod the quiet but crowded streets until they came to a fine old church in the southern part of the city. The interior was large, and, notwithstanding its great stained windows, seemed dimly lighted, though the walls were white and dashes of red and purple sunshine lay brightly upon pillar and pew. Ben saw a few old women moving softly through the aisles, each bearing a high pile of foot-stoves which she distributed among the congregation, by skilfully slipping out the under one, until none were left. It puzzled him that Mynheer should settle himself with the boys in a comfortable side-pew, after seating his fro in the body of the church, which was filled with chairs exclusively appropriated to the women. But Ben was learning only a common custom of the country. The pews of the nobility and the dignitaries of the city were circular in form, each surrounding a column. Elaborately carved, they formed a massive base to their great pillars, standing out in bold relief against the blank white walls beyond. These columns, lofty and well proportioned, were nicked and defaced from violence done to them long ago, yet it seemed quite fitting that, before they were lost in the deep arches overhead, their softened outlines should leaf out as they did into richness and beauty. Soon Ben lowered his gaze to the marble floor. It was a pavement of gravestones. Nearly all the large slabs, of which it was composed, marked the resting places of the dead. An armorial design engraved upon each stone, with inscription and date, told whose form was sleeping beneath, and sometimes three of a family were lying one above the other in the same sepulchre. He could not help but think of the solemn funeral procession winding by torchlight through those lofty aisles, and bearing its silent burden toward a dark opening whence the slab had been lifted, in readiness for its coming. It was something to think that his sister Mabel, who died in her flower, was lying in a sunny churchyard where a brook rippled and sparkled in the daylight, and waving trees whispered together all night long, where flowers might nestle close to the headstone, and moon and stars shed their peace upon it and morning birds sing sweetly overhead. Then he looked up from the pavement and rested his eyes upon the carved oaken pulpit, exquisitely beautiful in design and workmanship. He could not see the minister, 
though not long before he had watched him slowly ascending its winding stair, a mild-faced man wearing a ruff about his neck and a short cloak reaching nearly to the knee. Meantime the great church had been silently filling. Its pews were somber with men, and its center radiant with women in their fresh Sunday attire. Suddenly a soft rustling spread through the pulpit. All eyes were turned toward the minister, now appearing above the pulpit. Although the sermon was spoken slowly, Ben could understand little of what was said. But when the hymn came, he joined in it with all his heart. A thousand voices lifted in love and praise offered a grander language than he could readily comprehend. Once he was startled, during a pause in the surface, by seeing a little bag suddenly shaken before him. It had a tinkling bell at its side, and was attached to a long stick carried by one of the deacons of the church. Not relying solely upon the mute appeal of the poor boxes, fastened to the columns near the entrance, this more direct method was resorted to, of awakening the sympathies of the charitable. Fortunately Ben had provided himself with a few stifers, or the musical bag must have tinkled before him in vain. More than once a dark look rose on our English boy's face that morning. He longed to stand up and harangue the people concerning a peculiarity that filled him with pain. Some of the men wore their hats during the surface, or took them off whenever the humour prompted, and many put theirs on in the church as soon as they arose to leave. No wonder Ben's sense of propriety was wounded, and yet a higher sense would have been exercised had he tried to feel willing that Hollanders should follow the customs of their country. But his English heart said over and over again, it is outrageous, it is sinful. There is an angel called Charity, who would often save our hearts a great deal of trouble if we would but let her in. End of chapter. Chapter 30. Homeward Bound. On Monday morning, bright and early, our boys bade farewell to their kind entertainers and started on their homeward journey. Peter lingered a while at the lion-guarded door, for he and his sister had many parting words to say. As Ben saw them bidding each other good-bye, he could not but help feeling that kisses, as well as clocks, were wonderfully alike everywhere. The English kiss that his sister Jenny had given him when he left home had said the same thing to him that the Frau van Gens' Dutch kiss said to Peter. Ludwig had taken his share of the farewell in the most matter-of-fact manner possible, and, though he loved his sister well, had winced a little at her making such a child of him as to put an extra kiss for mother upon his forehead. He was already upon the canal with Carl and Jacob. Were they thinking about sisters or kisses? Not a bit of it. They were so happy to be on skates once more, so impatient to dart at once into the very heart of Brook, that they spun and wheeled about like crazy fellows relieving themselves, meantime, by muttering something about Peter and Dunder, not worth translating. Even Lumbert and Ben, who had been waiting at the street corner, began to grow impatient. The captain joined them at last, and they were soon on the canal with the rest. "'Hurry up, Peter,' growled Ludwig. "'We're freezing by inches. There, I knew you'd be the last, after all, to get on your skates.' <laughs> "'Did you?' said his brother, looking up with an air of deep interest. Clever boy! Ludwig laughed, but tried to look cross, as he said, I'm in earnest. We must get home some time this year. Now, boys, cried Peter, springing up as he fastened the last buckle, there's a clear way before us. We will imagine it's the grand race. Ready? One, two, three, start! I assure you that very little was said for the first half-hour. There were six mercuries skimming the ice. In plain English, they were lightning. No, that is imaginary, too. The fact is, one cannot decide what to say when half a dozen boys are whizzing past at such a rate. I can only tell you that each did his best, flying, with bent body and eager eyes, in and out, among the placid skates on the canal until the very guard shouted to them to hold up. This only served to send them onward with a two-boy power that startled all beholders. But the laws of inertia are stronger even than canal guards. After a while Jacob slackened his speed, then Ludwig, 
then Lambert, then Carl. They soon halted to take a long breath, and finally found themselves standing in a group gazing after Peter and Ben, who were still racing in the distance, as if their lives were at stake. "'It is very evident,' said Lambert, as he and his three companions started up again, "'that neither of them will give up until he can't help it.' "'What foolishness!' growled Carl, to tire themselves at the beginning of the journey. But they're racing in earnest, that's certain. Halloo! Peter's flagging. Not so, cried Ludwig. Catch him being beaten. Ha ha! sneered Carl. I tell you, boy, Benjamin is ahead. Now, if Ludwig disliked anything in this world, it was to be called a boy. Probably because he was nothing else. He grew indignant at once. Huff! What are you, I wonder? There, sir! Now look and see if Peter isn't ahead. I think he is, interposed Lumbert, but I can't quite tell at this distance. I think he isn't, retorted Carl. Jacob was growing anxious. He always abhorred an argument, so he said in a coaxing tone, Don't quarrel! Don't quarrel! Don't quarrel! mocked Carl looking back at Jacob as he skated. "'Who's quarrelling? Poot, you're a goose!' "'I can't help that,' was Jacob's meek reply. "'See, they are nearing the turn of the canal.' "'Now we can see!' cried Ludwig in great excitement. "'Peter will make it first, I know.' "'He can't, for Ben is ahead,' insisted Carl. "'Gunst! That ice-boat will run over him. No, he is clear. they are a couple of geese, anyhow.' Hurrah! They're at the turn. Who's ahead? Peter! cried Ludwig joyfully. Good for the captain! shouted Lumbert and Jacob. And Carl condescended to mutter, It is Peter, after all. I thought all the time that head fellow was Ben. This turn in the canal had evidently been their goal, for the two racers came to a sudden halt after passing it. Carl said something about being glad that they had sense enough to stop and rest and the four boys skated on in silence to overtake their companions. All the while Carl was secretly wishing that he had kept on with Peter and Ben, as he felt sure he could easily have come out winner. He was a very rapid, though by no means a graceful, skater. Ben was looking at Peter with mingled vexation, admiration, and surprise as the boys drew near. They heard him saying in English, "'You're a perfect bird on the ice, Peter van Holp." The first fellow that ever beat me in a fair race, I can tell you." Peter, who understood the language better than he could speak it, returned a laughing bow at Ben's compliment, but made no further reply. Possibly he was scant of breath at the time. "'Now, Pencherman, what you do with yourself? Get so hot as a fire-brick, dat ish no goot," was Jacob's plaintive comment. "'Nonsense,' answered Ben. This frosty air will cool me soon enough. I'm not tired." "'You are beaten, though, my boy,' said Lumbert in English, and fairly, too. How will it be, I wonder, on the day of the grand race?" Ben flushed and gave a proud, defiant laugh, as if to say, "'This was mere pastime. I'm determined to beat then, come what will.'" End of chapter Chapter thirty one of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or the Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter thirty one Boys and Girls. By the time the boys reached the village of Forhout, which stands near the Grand Canal about halfway between the Hague and Haarlem, they were forced to hold a council. The wind, though moderate at first, had grown stronger and stronger, until at last they could hardly skate against it. The weather vanes throughout the country had evidently entered into a conspiracy. "'No use trying to face such a blow as this,' said Ludwig. 
It cuts its way down a man's throat like a knife. Keep your mouth shut, then, grunted the affable Carl, who was as strong-chested as a young ox. I'm for keeping on. In this case, interposed Peter, we must consult the weakest of the party rather than the strongest. The captain's principle was all right, but its application was not flattering to Master Ludwig. Shrugging his shoulders, he retorted, "'Who's weak? Not I, for one, but the wind's stronger than any of us. I hope you'll condescend to admit that.' "'Ha, ha!' laughed von Monen, who could barely keep his feet. "'So it is!' Just then the weather vanes telegraphed to each other by a peculiar twitch, and in an instant the gust came. It nearly threw the strong-chested Karl. It almost strangled Jacob, and quite upset Ludwig. "'This settles the question,' shouted Peter. "'Off with your skates. We'll go into Forhout.' At Forhout they found a little inn with a big yard. The yard was well stocked, and better than all was provided with a complete set of skittles, so our boys soon turned the detention into a frolic. The wind was troublesome again even in that sheltered quarter, but they were on good standing ground and did not mind it. First a hearty dinner, then the game. With pins as long as their arms and balls as big as their heads, plenty of strength left for rolling, and a clean sweep of sixty yards for the strokes, no wonder they were happy. That night Captain Peter and his men slept soundly. No prowling robber came to disturb them and as they were distributed in separate rooms they did not even have a bolster battle in the morning. Such a breakfast as they ate! The landlord looked frightened. When he had asked them where they belonged, he made up his mind that the brook people starved their children. It was a shame. Such fine young gentlemen, too! Fortunately the wind had tired itself out, and fallen asleep in the great sea-cradle beyond the dunes. There were signs of snow otherwise the weather was fine. It was mere child's play for the well-rested boys to skate to Leyden. Here they halted a while, for Peter had an errand at the Golden Eagle. He left the city with a lightened heart. Dr. Bookman had been at the hotel, read the note containing Hans's message, and departed for Brook. "'I cannot say that it was your letter that sent him off so soon,' explained the landlord. "'Some rich lady in Brook was taken bad very sudden.' and he was sent for in haste. Peter turned pale. "'What was the name?' he asked. "'Indeed, it went in one ear and out of the other, for all I hindered it. Plague on people who can't see a traveller in comfortable lodgings, but they must whisk him off before one can breathe.' "'A lady in Brook, did you say?' "'Yes,' very gruffly. "'Any other business, young master?' "'No, mine host, except that I and my comrades here would like a bite of something and a drink of hot coffee.' "'Ah!' said the landlord sweetly. "'A bite you shall have, and coffee too, the finest in Leyden. Walk up to the stove, my masters. Now I think again. That was a widow lady from Rotterdam, I think they said, visiting at one von Stoepel's, if I mistake not. "'Ah!' said Peter, greatly relieved. They live in the White House by the Schlossen Mill. Now, my near, the coffee, please. What a goose I was, thought he, as the party left the Golden Eagle, to feel so sure that it was my mother. But she may be somebody's mother, poor woman, for all that. Who can she be, I wonder? There were not many upon the canal that day between Leyden and Harlem. However, as the boys neared Amsterdam, they found themselves once more in the midst of a moving throng. The big icebreaker, an icebreaker, a heavy machine armed with iron spikes for breaking the ice as it is dragged along. Some of the small ones are worked by men, but the large ones are drawn by horses, sixty or seventy of which are sometimes attached to one icebreaker. The big icebreaker had been at work for the first time that season but there was any amount of skating ground left yet. Three cheers for a home!' cried Van Monen as they came in sight of the great western dock. Vastelik dok! "'Hurrah! Hurrah!' shouted Juan and all. "'Hurrah! Hurrah!' This trick of cheering was an importation among our party. Lombert Van Monen had brought it from England. 
as they always gave it in English, it was considered quite an exploit, and when circumstances permitted, always enthusiastically performed, to the sore dismay of their quiet-loving countrymen. Therefore their arrival at Amsterdam created a great sensation, especially among the small boys on the wharf. The eye was crossed. They were on the Brook Canal. Lambert's home was reached first. "'Good-bye, boys!' he cried as he left them. "'We've had the greatest frolic ever known in Holland!' "'So we have. Good-bye, Van Monen,' answered the boys. "'Good-bye!' Peter hailed him. "'I say, Van Monen, the classes begin to-morrow.' "'I know it. Our holiday is over. Good-bye again. Good-bye.' Brook came in sight. Such meetings! Katrinka was upon the canal. Carl was delighted. Hilda was there. Peter felt rested in an instant. Ritchie was there. Ludwig and Jacob nearly knocked each other over in their eagerness to shake hands with her. Dutch girls are modest and generally quiet, but they have very glad eyes. For a few moments it was hard to decide whether Hilda, Ritchie, or Katrinka felt the most happy. Annie Bowman was also on the canal, looking even prettier than the other maidens in her graceful peasant's costume. But she did not mingle with Ritchie's party, neither did she look unusually happy. The one she liked most to see was not among the newcomers. Indeed he was not upon the canal at all. She had not been near Brook before, since the eve of St. Nicholas, for she was staying with her sick grandmother in Amsterdam, and had been granted a brief resting spell as the grandmother called it, because she had been such a faithful little nurse night and day. Annie had devoted her resting spell to skating with all her might toward Brook and back again, in the hope of meeting her mother on the canal, or, it might be, Gretel Brinker. Not one of them had she seen, and she must hurry back even without catching a glimpse of her mother's cottage, for the poor helpless grandmother, she knew, was by this time moaning for some one to turn her upon her cot. "'Where can Gretel be?' thought Annie as she flew over the ice. "'She can almost always steal a few moments from her work at this time of day. Poor Gretel! What a dreadful thing it must be to have a dull father! I should be woefully afraid of him, I know, so strong, and yet so strange!' Annie had not heard of his illness. Dame Brinker and her affairs received but little notice from the people of the place. If Gretel had not been known as a goose-girl, she might have had more friends among the peasantry of the neighborhood. As it was, Annie Bowman was the only one who did not feel ashamed to avow herself, by word and deed, the companion of Gretel and Hans. When the neighbor's children laughed at her for keeping such poor company, she would simply flush when Hans was ridiculed or laugh in a careless, disdainful way, but to hear little Gretel abused always awakened her wrath. "'Goose girl, indeed,' she would say. "'I can tell you that any of you are fitter for the work than she. My father often said last summer that it troubled him to see such a bright-eyed, patient little maiden tending geese. <laughs> she would not harm them as you would, John Soom Kolp, and she would not tread upon them as you might, Kate Vooters.' This would be pretty sure to start a laugh at the clumsy, ill-natured Kate's expense, and Annie would walk loftily away from the group of young gossips. Perhaps some memory of Gretel's assailants crossed her mind as she skated rapidly toward Amsterdam, for her eyes sparkled ominously, and she more than once gave her pretty head a defiant toss. When that mood passed, such a bright, rosy, affectionate look illuminated her face that more than one weary working man turned to gaze after her, and to wish that he had a glad, contented lass like that for a daughter. There were five joyous households in Brook that night. The boys were back safe and sound, and they found all well at home. Even the sick lady at neighbor Van Stupel's was out of danger. But the next morning, ah, how stupidly school bells will ding-dong, ding-dong, when one is tired. Ludwig was sure that he had never listened to anything so odious. Even Peter felt pathetic on the occasion. Carl said it was a shameful thing for a fellow to have to turn out when his bones were splitting. And Jacob soberly bade Ben, "'Coot-pie!' and walked off with his satchel, 
as if it weighed a hundred pounds. End of chapter Chapter Thirty Two of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Thirty Two The Crisis. While the boys are nursing their fatigue, we will take a peep into the Brinker cottage. Can it be that Gretel and her mother have not stirred since we saw them last? That the sick man upon the bed is not even turned over? It was four days ago, and there is the sad group just as it was before. No, not precisely the same, for Raff Brinker is paler. His fever is gone, though he knows nothing of what is passing then they were alone in the bare clean room. Now there is another group in an opposite corner. Dr. Bookman is there, talking in a low tone with a stout young man who listens intently. The stout young man is his student and assistant. Hans is there also. He stands near the window, respectfully waiting until he shall be accosted. "'You see, Vollenhoven,' said Dr. Bookman, "'it is a clear case of and here the doctor went off into a queer jumble of Latin and Dutch that I cannot conveniently translate. After a while, as Vollenhoven looked at him rather blankly, the learned man condescended to speak to him in simpler phrase. "'It is probably like Rip Donderdunk's case,' he exclaimed in a low, mumbling tone. "'He fell from the top of Vopelplutz Vinville. After the accident the man was stupid and finally became idiotic.' In time he lay helpless like yon fellow on the bed, moaned, too, like him, and kept constantly lifting his hand to his head. My learned friend von Chopin performed an operation upon this Donderdunk, and discovered under the skull a small, dark sack which pressed upon the brain. This had been the cause of the trouble. My friend von Chopin removed it, a splendid operation. You see, according to Celsius— and here the doctor again went off into Latin. "'Did the man live?' asked the assistant respectfully. Dr. Bookman scowled. "'That is of no consequence. I believe he died. But why not fix your mind on the grand features of the case? Consider a moment how—' And he plunged into Latin mysteries more deeply than ever. "'But, mynheer,' gently persisted the student, who knew that the doctor would not rise to the surface for hours unless pulled at once from his favorite depths. Mynheer, you have other engagements today, three legs in Amsterdam, you remember, and an eye in Brook, and that tumor up the canal. Hmm, the tumor can wait, said the doctor reflectively. That is another beautiful case, a beautiful case. The woman has not lifted her head from her shoulder for two months, "'Magnificent tumor, sir!' The doctor by this time was speaking aloud. He had quite forgotten where he was. Follenhoven made another attempt. "'This poor fellow on the bed, mynheer, do you think you can save him?' "'Ah, indeed, certainly,' stammered the doctor, suddenly perceiving that he had been talking rather off the point. "'Certainly, that is, I hope so.' "'If any one in Holland can, mynheer,' murmured the assistant with honest bluntness, "'it is yourself.' The doctor looked displeased, growled out a tender request for the student to talk less, and beckoned Hans to draw near. This strange man had a great horror of speaking to women, especially on surgical matters. "'One can never tell,' he said, "'what moment the creatures will scream or faint.' Therefore he explained Raff Brinker's case to Hans, and told him what he believed should be done to save the patient. Hans listened attentively, growing red and pale by turns, 
and throwing quick, anxious glances toward the bed. "'It may kill the father, did you say, mynheer?' he exclaimed at last in a trembling whisper. "'It may, my boy, but I have a strong belief that it will cure and not kill. Ah, if boys were not such dunces I could lay the whole matter before you, but it would be of no use.' Hans looked blank at this compliment. "'It would be of no use,' repeated Dr. Bookman indignantly. "'A great operation is proposed, but one might as well do it with a hatchet. The only question asked is, will it kill?' "'The question is everything to us, mynheer,' said Hans with tearful dignity. Dr. Bookman looked at him in sudden dismay. "'Ah, exactly so. You are right, boy.' I am a fool. Good boy. One does not wish one's father killed. Of course I am a fool. Will he die, mynheer, if this sickness goes on? Huh. This is no new illness. The same thing growing worse every instant. Pressure on the brain. will take him off soon like that, said the doctor, snapping his fingers. And the operation may save him pursued Hans. How soon, mynheer, can we know? Dr. Bookman grew impatient. In a day, perhaps an hour. Talk with your mother, boy, and let her decide. My time is short. Hans approached his mother. At first, when she looked up at him, he could not utter a syllable. Then, turning his eyes away, he said in a firm voice, I must speak with the mother alone. Quick little Gretel, who could not quite understand what was passing, threw rather an indignant look at Hans and walked away. Come back, Gretel, and sit down, said Hans sorrowfully. She obeyed. Dame Brinker and her boy stood by the window, while the doctor and his assistant, bending over the bedside, conversed together in a low tone. There was no danger of disturbing the patient. He appeared like one blind and deaf. Only his faint, piteous moans showed him to be a living man. Hans was talking earnestly, and in a low voice, for he did not wish his sister to hear. With dry, parted lips, Dame Brinker leaned toward him, searching his face, as if suspecting a meaning beyond his words. Once she gave a quick, frightened sob that made Gretel start, but— after that she listened calmly. When Hans ceased to speak, his mother turned, gave one long, agonized look at her husband, lying there so pale and unconscious, and threw herself on her knees beside the bed. Poor little Gretel! What did all this mean? She looked with questioning eyes at Hans. He was standing, but his head was bent as if in prayer, at the doctor. He was gently feeling her father's head, and looked like one examining some curious stone at the assistant. The man coughed and turned away, at her mother. Ah, little Gretel, that was the best you could do, to kneel beside her and twine your warm young arms about her neck, to weep and implore God to listen. When the mother arose, Dr. Bookman, with a show of trouble in his eyes, asked gruffly, "'Well, Jufrau, shall it be done?' "'Will it pain him, mynheer?' she asked in a trembling voice. "'I cannot say. Probably not. Shall it be done?' "'It may cure him,' you said. "'And, mynheer, did you tell my boy that perhaps—perhaps—' perhaps, "'She could not finish.' Yes, Jufrau, I said the patient might sink under the operation, but we hope it may prove otherwise. He looked at his watch. The assistant moved impatiently toward the window. Come, Jufrau, time presses, yes or no. Hans wound his arm about his mother. It was not his usual way. He even leaned his head against her shoulder. The maester awaits an answer, he whispered. Dame Brinker had long been head of her house in every sense. Many a time she had been very stern with Hans, ruling him with a strong hand and rejoicing in her motherly discipline. 
Now she felt so weak, so helpless. It was something to feel that firm embrace. There was strength even in the touch of that yellow hair. She turned to her boy imploringly. Oh, Hans, what shall I say? Say what God tells thee, mother, answered Hans, bowing his head. One quick questioning prayer to heaven rose from the mother's heart. The answer came. She turned toward Dr. Bookman. It is right, my dear. I consent. Huh, <laughs> grunted the doctor, as if to say, You've been long enough about it. Then he conferred a moment with his assistant, who listened with great outward deference, but was inwardly rejoicing at the grand joke he would have to tell his fellow students. He had actually seen a tear in old Bookman's eye. Meanwhile Gretel looked on in trembling silence, but when she saw the doctor open a leather case and take out one sharp, gleaming instrument after another, she sprang forward. "'Oh, mother! The poor father meant no wrong! Are they going to murder him?' "'I do not know, child!' screamed Dame Brinker, looking fiercely at Gretel. "'I do not know!' "'This will not do, Jufrau,' said Dr. Bookman sternly, and at the same time he cast a quick, penetrating look at Hans. "'You and the girl must leave the room. The boy may stay.' Dame Brinker drew herself up in an instant. Her eyes flashed. Her whole countenance was changed. She looked like one who had never wept, never felt a moment's weakness. Her voice was low, but decided. I stay with my husband, my dear. Dr. Bookman looked astonished. His orders were seldom disregarded in this style. For an instant his eyes met hers. You may remain, Jufrau, he said in an altered voice. Gretel had already disappeared. In one corner of the cottage was a small closet where her rough, box-like bed was fastened against the wall. None would think of the trembling little creature crouching there in the dark. Dr. Bookman took off his heavy coat, filled an earthen basin with water, and placed it near the bed. Then turning to Hans he asked, "'Can I depend upon you, boy?' "'You can, mynheer.' "'I believe you. Stand at the head, here. Your mother may sit at your right. So.' And he placed a chair near the cot. "'Remember, Euphrau. There must be no cries, no fainting." Dame Brinker answered him with a look. He was satisfied. "'Now, Vollenhoven!' Oh, that case with the terrible instruments! The assistant lifted them. Gretel, who had been peering with brimming eyes through the crack of the closet door, could remain silent no longer. She rushed frantically across the apartment, seized her hood, and ran from the cottage. End of chapter. Chapter thirty three of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 33. Gretel and Hilda. It was recess hour. At the first stroke of the schoolhouse bell, the canal seemed to give a tremendous shout and grow suddenly alive with boys and girls. Dozens of gaily clad children were skating in and out among each other, and all their pent-up merriment of the morning was relieving itself in song and shout and laughter. There was nothing to check the flow of frolic. Not a thought of schoolbooks came out with them into the sunshine. Latin, arithmetic, grammar, all were locked up for an hour in the dingy schoolroom. The teacher might be a noun if he wished, and a proper one at that but they meant to enjoy themselves. As long as the skating was as perfect as this, it made no difference whether Holland was on the North Pole or the Equator, and as for philosophy, 
how could they bother themselves with inertia and gravitation and such things when it was as much as they could do to keep from getting knocked over in the commotion in the height of the fun one of the children called out what is that what where cried a dozen voices why don't you see that dark thing over there by the idiot's cottage i don't see anything said one i do shouted another it's a dog where's any dog put in a squeaky voice that we have heard before it's no such thing it's a heap of rags pooh voost retorted another gruffly that's about as near the fact as you ever get it's the goose girl gretel looking for rats well what of it squeaked voost isn't she a bundle of rags i'd like to know ha 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 pretty good for you voost you'll get a medal for wit yet if you keep on you get something else if brother hans were here i'll warrant you would said a muffled up little fellow with a cold in his head as hans was not there voost could afford to scout the insinuation who cares for him little sneezer i'd fight a dozen like him any day and you in the bargain you would would you i'd like to catch you all at it and by the way of proving his words the sneezer skated off at the top of his speed just then a general chase after three of the biggest boys of the school was proposed, and friend and foe, frolicsome as ever, were soon united in a common cause. Only one of all that happy throng remembered the dark little form by the idiot's cottage. Poor, frightened little Gretel! She was not thinking of them, though their merry laughter floated lightly toward her, making her feel like one in a dream. How low the moans were behind the darkened window! What if those strange men were really killing her father? The thought made her spring to her feet with a cry of horror. Ah, no! She sobbed, sinking upon the frozen mound of earth where she had been sitting. Mother is there, and Hans. They will care for him. But how pale they were! And even Hans was crying. Why did the cross old maester keep him and send me away? She thought. I could have clung to the mother and kissed her. That always makes her stroke my hair and speak gently, even after she has scolded me. How quiet it is now! Oh, if the father should die, and Hans and the mother, what would I do? And Gretel, shivering with cold, buried her face in her arms and cried as if her heart would break. The poor child had been tasked beyond her strength during the past four days. Through all she had been her mother's willing little handmaiden, soothing, helping, and cheering the half-widowed woman by day, and watching and praying beside her all the long night. She knew that something terrible and mysterious was taking place at this moment, something that had been too terrible and mysterious for even kind, good Hans to tell. Then new thoughts came. Why had not Hans told her? It was a shame. It was her father as well as his. She was no baby. She had once taken a sharp knife from the father's hand. She had even drawn him away from the mother on that awful night when Hans, as big as he was, could not help her. Why, then, must she be treated like one who could do nothing? Oh, how very still it was! How bitter, bitter cold! If any bowman had only stayed home instead of going to Amsterdam, it wouldn't be so lonely. How cold her feet were growing! Was it the moaning that made her feel as if she were floating in the air? This would not do. The mother might need her help at any moment. Rousing herself with an effort, Gretel sat upright, rubbing her eyes and wondering, wondering that the sky was so bright and blue, wondering at the stillness in the cottage. More than all, at the laughter rising and falling in the distance. Soon she sank down again, the strange medley of thought growing more and more confused in her bewildered brain. What a strange lip the maester had! How the stork's nest upon the roof seemed to rustle and whisper down to her! How bright those knives were in the leather case, 
brighter perhaps than the silver skates. If she had but worn her new jacket, she would not shiver so. The new jacket was pretty, the only pretty thing she had ever worn. God had taken care of her father so long. He would do it still, if those two men would but go away. Ah! Now the maesters were on the roof. They were clambering to the top. No, it was her mother and Hans. Or the storks. It was so dark, who could tell? And the mound rocking, swinging in that strange way. How sweetly the birds were singing. They must be winter birds, for the air was thick with icicles. Not one bird, but twenty. Oh, hear them, mother! Wake me, mother, for the race. I am so tired with crying and crying. A firm hand was laid upon her shoulder. Get up, little girl, cried a kind voice. This will not do for you to lie here and freeze. Gretel slowly raised her head. She was so sleepy that it seemed nothing strange to her that Hilda von Gleck should be leaning over her, looking with kind, beautiful eyes into her face. She had often dreamed it before. But she had never dreamed that Hilda was shaking her roughly, almost dragging her by main force, never dreamed that she heard her saying, "'Gretel! Gretel Brinker! You must wake!' This was real. Gretel looked up. Still the lovely, delicate young lady was shaking, rubbing, fairly pounding her. It must be a dream. No, there was the cottage, and the stork's nest and the maester's coach by the canal. She could see them now quite plainly. Her hands were tingling, her feet throbbing. Hilda was forcing her to walk. At last Gretel began to feel like herself again. "'I have been asleep.' she faltered, rubbing her eyes with both hands and looking very much ashamed. "'Yes, indeed, entirely too much asleep,' laughed Hilda, whose lips were very pale. "'But you are well enough now. Lean upon me, Gretel. There, keep moving. You will soon be warm enough to go by the fire. Now let me take you into the cottage.' "'Oh, no, no, no! You frown, not in there!' The maester is there. He sent me away. Hilda was puzzled, but she wisely forbore to ask at present for an explanation. Very well, Gretel, try to walk faster. I saw you upon the mound some time ago, but I thought you were playing. That is right. Keep moving. All this time the kind-hearted girl had been forcing Gretel to walk up and down, supporting her with one arm, and, with the other, striving as well as she could to take off her own warm jacket. Suddenly Gretel suspected her intention. "'Oh, Euphro, Euphro!' she cried imploringly. "'Please never think of such a thing as that. Oh, please, keep it on. I am burning all over, Euphro. I really am burning. Not burning exactly, but pins and needles pricking all over me. Oh, Euphro, don't!' the poor child's dismay was so genuine that Hilda hastened to reassure her. "'Very well, Gretel. Move your arms, then. So. Why, your cheeks are as pink as roses already. I think the maester would let you in now. He certainly would. Is your father so very ill?' "'Ah, you fro cried Gretel, weeping afresh. "'He is dying, I think.' There are two maesters in with him at this moment, and the mother has scarcely spoken to-day. Can you hear him moan, Euphro? She added with sudden terror. The air buzzes so I cannot hear. He may be dead. Oh, I do wish I could hear him. Hilda listened. The cottage was very near, but not a sound could be heard. Something told her that Gretel was right. She ran to the window. "'You cannot see there, my lady,' sobbed Gretel eagerly. "'The mother has oiled paper hanging inside, but at the other one, in the south end of the cottage, you can look in where the paper is torn.' Hilda, in her anxiety, ran around, past the corner where the low roof was fringed with its loosened thatch. A sudden thought checked her. "'It is not right for me to peep into another's house in this way,' she said to herself. 
Then, softly calling to Gretel, she added in a whisper, "'You may look. Perhaps he is only sleeping.' Gretel tried to walk briskly toward the spot, but her limbs were trembling. Hilda hastened to her support. "'You are sick yourself, I fear,' she said kindly. "'No, not sick, Euphro, but my heart cries all the time now, even when my eyes are as dry as yours. Why, Euphro, your eyes are not dry. Are you crying for us? Oh, Euphro, if God sees you! Oh, I know father will get better now!' And the little creature, even while reaching to look through the tiny window, kissed Hilda's hand again and again. The sash was sadly patched and broken. A torn piece of paper hung halfway down across it. Gretel's face was pressed to the window. "'Can you see anything?' whispered Hilda at last. "'Yes. The father lies very still. His head is bandaged, and all their eyes are fastened upon him. "'Oh, Euphro!' almost screamed Gretel as she started back and by a quick dexterous movement shook off her heavy wooden shoes. "'I must go in to my mother. Will you come with me?' "'Not now. The bell is ringing. I shall come again soon. Good-bye.' Gretel scarcely heard the words. She remembered for many a day afterward the bright, pitying smile on Hilda's face as she turned away. End of chapter Chapter Thirty Four of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Thirty Four The Awakening. An angel could not have entered the cottage more noiselessly. Gretel, not daring to look at any one, slid softly to her mother's side. The room was very still. She could hear the old doctor breathe. She could almost hear the sparks as they fell into the ashes on the hearth. The mother's hand was very cold, but a burning spot glowed on her cheek, and her eyes were like a deer's, so bright so sad, so eager. At last there was a movement upon the bed, very slight, but enough to cause them all to start. Dr. Bookman leaned eagerly forward. Another movement. The large hands, so white and soft for a poor man's hand, twitched, then raised itself steadily toward the forehead. It felt the bandage, not in a restless, crazy way, but with a questioning movement that caused even Dr. Bookman to hold his breath. "'Steady, steady,' said a voice that sounded very strange to Gretel. "'Shift that mat higher, boys. Now throw on the clay. The waters are rising fast. No time to—' Dame Brinker sprang forward like a young panther. She seized his hands, and leaning over him cried, Raff, Raff, boy, speak to me. Is it you, Major? He asked faintly. I have been asleep, hurt, I think. Where is little Hans? Here I am, father, shouted Hans, half mad with joy, but the doctor held him back. He knows us, screamed Dame Brinker. Great God, he knows us. Gretel, Gretel, come see your father. In vain Dr. Bookman commanded silence, and tried to force them from the bedside. He could not keep them off. Hans and the mother laughed and cried together as they hung over the newly awakened man. Gretel made no sound, but gazed at them all with glad, startled eyes. Her father was speaking in a faint voice. "'Is the baby asleep, Major?' "'The baby!' echoed Dame Brinker. Oh, Gretel, that is you! 
and he calls Hans little Hans. Ten years asleep. Oh, mynheer, you have saved us all. He has known nothing for ten years. Children, why don't you thank the meister? The good woman was beside herself with joy. Dr. Bookman said nothing, but as his eye met hers, he pointed upward. She understood. So did Hans and Gretel. With one accord they knelt by the cot, side by side. Dame Brinker felt for her husband's hand even while she was praying. Dr. Bookman's head was bowed. The assistant stood by the hearth with his back toward them. "'Why do you pray?' murmured the father, looking feebly from the bed as they rose. "'Is it God's day?' It was not Sunday, but as Vrouw bowed her head, she could not speak. "'Then we should have a chapter.' said Raff Brinker, speaking slowly and with difficulty. I do not know how it is. I am very, very weak. Mayhap the minister will read it to us. Gretel lifted the big Dutch Bible from its carved shelf. Dr. Bookman, rather dismayed at being called a minister, coughed and handed the volume to his assistant. Read, he murmured. These people must be kept quiet, or the man will die yet. When the chapter was finished, Dame Brinker motioned mysteriously to the rest by way of telling them that her husband was asleep. Now, Jufro, said the doctor in a subdued tone as he drew on his thick woolen mittens, there must be perfect quiet. You understand. This is truly a most remarkable case. I shall come again to-morrow. Give the patient no food to-day. And, bowing hastily, he left the cottage, followed by his assistant. His grand coach was not far away. The driver had kept the horses moving slowly up and down by the canal, nearly all the time the doctor had been in the cottage. Hans went out also. "'May God bless you, mynheer,' he said, blushing and trembling. "'I can never repay you but if—' "'Yes, you can.' interrupted the doctor crossly. You can use your wits when the patient wakes again. This clacking and sniveling is enough to kill a well-man, let alone one lying on the edge of his grave. If you want your father to get well, keep him quiet." So saying, Dr. Bookman, without another word, stalked off to meet his coach, leaving Hans standing there with eyes and mouth wide open. Hilda was reprimanded severely that day for returning late to school after recess, and for imperfect recitations. She had remained near the cottage until she heard Dame Brinker laugh, until she had heard Hans say, "'Here I am, father!' And then she had gone back to her lessons. What wonder that she missed them! How could she get a long string of Latin verbs by heart when her heart did not care a fig for them, but would keep saying to itself, Oh, I am so glad, I am so glad. End of chapter. Chapter thirty five of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 35. Bones and Tongues Bones are strange things. One would suppose that they knew nothing at all about school affairs, but they do. Even Jacob Poot's bones, buried as they were in flesh, were sharp in the matter of study hours. Early on the morning of his return they ached through and through, giving Jacob a twinge at every stroke of the school bell, as if to say, Stop that clapper! There's trouble in it! After school, on the contrary, they were quiet and comfortable, in fact, seen to be taking a nap among their cushions. The other boys' bones behaved in a similar manner, but that is not so remarkable. 
being nearer the daylight than Jacob's, they might be expected to be more learned in the ways of the world. Master Ludwig's, especially, were like beauty, only skin-deep. They were the most knowing bones you ever heard of. Just put before him ever so quietly a grammar book with a long lesson marked in it, and immediately the sly bone over his eyes would set up such an aching. Request him to go to the garret for your foot-stove. Instantly the bones would remind him that he was too tired. Ask him to go to the confectioner's, a mile away, and presto! Not a bone would remember now that it had ever been used before. Bearing all this in mind, you will not wonder when I tell you that our five boys were among the happiest of the happy throng pouring forth from the schoolhouse that day. Peter was in excellent spirits. He had heard through Hilda of Dame Brinker's laugh and of Hans's joyous words, and he needed no further proof that Raff Brinker was a cured man. In fact, the news had gone forth in every direction, for miles around. Persons who had never before cared for the Brinkers, or even mentioned them, except with a contemptuous sneer or a shrug of pretended pity, now became singularly familiar with every point of their history. There was no end to the number of ridiculous stories that were flying about. Hilda, in the excitement of the moment, had stopped to exchange a word with the doctor's coachman as he stood by the horses, pommeling his chest and clapping his hands. Her kind heart was overflowing. She could not help pausing to tell the cold, tired-looking man that she thought the doctor would be out soon. She even hinted to him that she suspected, only suspected, that a wonderful cure had been performed, an idiot brought to his senses. Nay, she was sure of it, for she had heard his widow laugh. No, not his widow, of course, but his wife, for the man was as much alive as anybody, and, for all she knew, sitting up and talking like a lawyer. All this was very indiscreet. Hilda, in an impenitent sort of way, felt it to be so. But it is always so delightful to impart pleasant or surprising news. She went tripping along by the canal, quite resolved to repeat the sin ad infinitum, and tell nearly every girl and boy in the school. Meantime Yansun Kolp came skating by. Of course in two seconds he was striking slippery attitudes and shouting saucy things to the coachman, who stared at him in indolent disdain. This to Yansun was equivalent to an invitation to draw nearer. The coachman was now upon his box, gathering up the reins and grumbling at his horses. Yan soon accosted him. "'I say, what's going on at the idiot's cottage? Is your boss in there?' Coachman nodded mysteriously. "'Whew!' whistled Yan soon, drawing closer. "'Old Brinker dead?' The driver grew big with importance and silent in proportion. "'See here, old pincushion. I'd run home yonder and get you a chunk of gingerbread if I thought you could open your mouth. Old Pincushion was human. Long hours of waiting had made him ravenously hungry. At Yansun's hint, his countenance showed signs of a collapse. "'That's right, old fellow,' pursued his tempter. "'Hurry up! What news? Old Brinker dead?' "'No! Cured! Got his wits!' said the coachman, shooting forth his words one at a time like so many bullets. Like bullets, figuratively speaking, they hit Yansun Kolp. He jumped as if he had been shot. Gerda Gunst! You don't say so! The man pressed his lips together and looked significantly toward Master Kolp's shabby residence. Just then Yansun saw a group of boys in the distance, hailing them in a rowdy style, common to boys of his stamp all over the world, whether in Africa, Japan, Amsterdam, or Paris, he scampered toward them, forgetting coachman, gingerbread, everything but the wonderful news. Therefore, by sundown, it was well known throughout the neighboring country that Dr. Brookman, chancing to stop at the cottage, had given the idiot Brinker a tremendous dose of medicine, as brown as gingerbread. It had taken six men to hold him while it was poured down. The idiot had immediately sprung to his feet, in full possession of all his faculties, knocked over the doctor, or thrashed him, 
there was admitted to be a slight uncertainty as to which of these penalties was inflicted, then sat down and addressed him for all the world like a lawyer. After that he had turned and spoken beautifully to his wife and children. Dame Brinker had laughed herself into violent hysterics. Hans had said, "'Here I am, father, your own dear son!' and Gretel had said, "'Here I am, father, your own dear Gretel!' and the doctor had afterward been seen leaning back in his carriage, looking just as white as a corpse. End of chapter Chapter 36 of Hans Brinker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker, or The Silver Skates, by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter 36 A New Alarm When Dr. Bookman called the next day at the Brinker cottage, he could not help noticing the cheerful, comfortable aspect of the place. An atmosphere of happiness breathed upon him as he opened the door. Dame Brinker sat complacently knitting beside the bed. Her husband was enjoying a tranquil slumber, and Gretel was noiselessly kneading rye bread on the table in the corner. The doctor did not remain long. He asked a few simple questions, appeared satisfied with the answers, and after feeling his patient's pulse said, "'Ah, very weak yet, Jufrau. Very weak indeed. He must have nourishment. You may begin to feed the patient. Ahem. <clears throat> Not too much, but what you do give him, let it be strong and of the best.' "'Black bread we have, mynheer, and porridge,' replied Dame Brinker cheerily. "'They have always agreed with him well.' "'Tut, tut,' said the doctor, frowning. Nothing of the kind. He must have the juice of fresh meat, white bread, dried and toasted, good Malaga wine, and, ahem, the man looks cold. Give him more covering, something light and warm. Where is the boy? Hans, mynheer, has gone into Brook to look for work. He will be back soon. Will the maester please be seated? Whether the hard-polished stool offered by Dame Brinker did not look particularly tempting, or whether the dame herself frightened him, partly because she was a woman, and partly because an anxious, distressed look had suddenly appeared in her face, I cannot say. Certain it is that our eccentric doctor looked hurriedly about him, muttered something about an extraordinary case, bowed, and disappeared before Dame Brinker had time to say another word. Strange that the visit of their good benefactor should have left a cloud, yet so it was. Gretel frowned, an anxious childish frown, and kneaded the bread dough violently without looking up. Dame Brinker hurried to her husband's bedside, leaned over him, and fell into silent but passionate weeping. In a moment Hans entered. "'Why, mother!' he whispered in alarm. "'What ails thee? Is the father worse?' She turned her quivering face toward him, making no attempt to conceal her distress. "'Yes, he is starving, perishing. A maester said it.' Hans turned pale. "'What does this mean, mother? We must feed him at once. Here, Gretel, give me the porridge.' "'Nay!' cried his mother, distractedly, yet without raising her voice. "'It may kill him. Our poor fare is too heavy for him.' Oh, Hans, he will die. The father will die if we use him this way. He must have meat and sweet wine and a deck-bed. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? She sobbed, wringing her hands. There is not a stiver in the house. Gretel pouted. It was the only way she could express sympathy just then. Her tears fell one by one into the dough. "'Did the maester say he must have these things, mother?' asked Hans. "'Yes, he did.' "'Well, mother, don't cry. He shall have them. I shall bring meat and wine before night. Take the cover from my bed. I can sleep in the straw.' 
"'Yes, Hans, but it is heavy, scant as it is. The maester said he should have something light and warm. He will perish. Our peat is giving out, Hans. The father has wasted it sorely, throwing it on when I was not looking, dear man.' "'Never mind, mother,' whispered Hans cheerfully. "'We can cut down the willow tree and burn it, if need be, but I'll bring home something to-night. There must be work in Amsterdam, though there's none in Brook. Never fear, mother, the worst trouble of all is past. We can brave anything now that the father is himself again.' "'Aye,' sobbed Dame Brinker, hastily drying her eyes, "'that is true indeed.' "'Of course it is. Look at him, mother, how softly he sleeps. Do you think God would let him starve, just after giving him back to us? Why, mother, I'm as sure of getting all the father needs as if my pocket were bursting with gold. There now, don't fret.' And, hurriedly kissing her, Hans caught up his skates and slipped from the cottage. Poor Hans, disappointed in his morning's errand, half sickened with this new trouble, he wore a brave look and tried to whistle as he tramped resolutely off with the firm intention of mending matters. Want had never before pressed so sorely upon the Brinker family. Their stock of peat was nearly exhausted, and all the flour in the cottage was in Gretel's dough. They had scarcely cared to eat during the past few days, scarcely realized their condition. Dame Brinker had felt so sure that she and the children could earn money before the worst came that she had given herself up to the joy of her husband's recovery. She had not even told Hans that the few pieces of silver in the old mitten were quite gone. Hans reproached himself now that he had not hailed the doctor when he saw him enter his coach and drive rapidly away in the direction of Amsterdam. Perhaps there is some mistake, he thought. The maester surely would have known that meat and sweet wine were not at our command, and yet the father looks very weak. He certainly does. I must get work. If my near van Holp were back from Rotterdam, I could get plenty to do. But Master Peter told me to let him know if he could do aught to serve us. I shall go to him at once. Oh, if it were but summer! All this time Hans was hastening toward the canal. Soon his skates were on, and he was skimming rapidly toward the residence of my near van Holp. The father must have meat and wine at once, he muttered. But how can I earn the money in time to buy them to-day? There is no other way but to go, as I promised, to Master Peter. What would a gift of meat and wine be to him? When the father is once fed, I can rush down to Amsterdam and earn the morrow's supply. Then came other thoughts, thoughts that made his heart thump heavily, and his cheeks burn with a new shame. It is begging, to say the least. Not one of the Brinkers has ever been a beggar. Shall I be the first? Shall my poor father, just coming back into life, learn that his family has asked for charity? He, always so wise and thrifty? No! cried Hans aloud. Better a thousand times to part with a watch. I can at least borrow money on it, in Amsterdam, he thought, turning around. That will be no disgrace. I can find work at once and get it back again. Nay, perhaps I can even speak to the father about it. This last thought made the lad dance for joy. Why not indeed speak to the father? He was a rational being now. He may wake, thought Hans, quite bright and rested, may tell us the watch is of no consequence, to sell it, of course. And Hans almost flew over the ice. A few moments more and the skates were again swinging from his arm. He was running toward the cottage. His mother met him at the door. "'Oh, Hans!' she cried, her face radiant with joy. "'The young lady has been here with her maid. She brought everything—meat, jelly, wine, and bread—a whole basketful. Then the maester sent a man from town with more wine and a fine bed and blankets for the father. Oh, he will get well now. God bless them. God bless them, echoed Hans, and for the first time that day his eyes filled with tears. End of chapter
Chapter Thirty Seven of Hans Prinker. This is a LibriVox recording. 